Section Zero of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barry Eads. Forward Embodying a Few Remarks on the Gentle Art of Laugh Making by Marshall P. Wilder. Happiness and laughter are two of the most beautiful things in the world, for they are of the few that are purely unselfish. Laughter is not for yourself, but for others. When people are happy they present a cheerful spirit, which finds its reflection in every one they meet, for happiness is as contagious as a yawn. Of all the emotions, laughter is the most versatile, for it plays equally well the role of either parent or child to happiness. Then can we say too much in praise of the men who make us laugh? God never gave a man a greater gift than the power to make others laugh, unless it is the privilege of laughing himself. We honor, revere, admire our great soldiers, statesmen, and men of letters, but we love the man who makes us laugh. No other man today enjoys to such an extent the close personal affection, individual yet national, that is given to Mr. Samuel L. Clemens. He is ours. He is one of us. We have a personal pride in him. Dear Mark Twain, the beloved child of the American nation, and it was through our laughter that he won our love. He is the exponent of the typically American style of fun-making, the humorous story. I asked Mr. Clemens one day if he could remember the first money he ever earned. With his inimitable drawl, he said, Yes, Marsh, it was at school. All boys had the habit of going to school in those days, and they hadn't any more respect for the desk then than they had for the teachers. There was a rule in our school that any boy marring his desk, either with pencil or knife, would be chastised publicly before the whole school, or pay a fine of five dollars. Besides the rule, there was a ruler. I knew it because I had felt it. It was a darn hard one, too. One day I had to tell my father that I had broken the rule and had to pay a fine or take a public whipping, and he said, Sam, it would be too bad to have the name of Clemens disgraced before the whole school, so I'll pay the fine, but I don't want you to lose anything, so come upstairs. I went upstairs with father, and he was forgiving me. I came downstairs with the feeling in one hand and the five dollars in the other, and decided that as I'd been punished once and got used to it, I wouldn't mind taking the other licking at school. So I did, and I kept the five dollars. That was the first money I ever earned. The humorous story, as expounded by Mark Twain, Artemis Ward, and Robert J. Burdett, is purely American. Artemis Ward could get laughs out of nothing, by mixing the absurd and the unexpected, and then backing the combination with a solemn face and earnest manner. For instance, he was fond of such incongruous statements as, I once knew a man in New Zealand who hadn't a tooth in his head. Here he would pause for some time, look reminiscent, and continue, and yet he could beat a bass drum better than any man I ever knew. Robert J. Burdett, who wrote columns of capital humor for the Burlington Hawkeye and told stories superbly, on his first visit to New York was spirited to a notable club where he told stories leisurely until half the hearers ached with laughter and the other half were threatened with apoplexy. Everyone present declared it the red-letter night of the club, and members who had missed it came around and demanded the stories at second hand. Some efforts were made to oblige them, but without avail, for the tellers had twisted their recollections of the stories into jokes, and they didn't sound right, so a committee hunted the town for Burdette to help them out of their difficulty. Humor is the kindliest method of laugh-making. Wit and satire are ancient, but humor, it has been claimed, belongs to modern times. A certain type of story, having a sudden and terse conclusion to a direct statement, has been labeled purely American. For instance, Willie Jones loaded and fired a cannon yesterday. The funeral will be tomorrow. But the truth is, it is older than America. It is very venerable. If you will turn to the twelfth verse of the sixteenth chapter of Second Chronicles, you will read, And Asa in the thirty-ninth year of his reign was diseased in his feet, until his disease was exceeding great. 
Yet in his disease he sought not the Lord, but turned to the physicians, and Asa slept with his fathers. Bill Nye was a sturdy and persistent humorist of so good a sort that he never could help being humorous, yet there was never a sting in his jokes. Gentle rivalry was the severest thing he ever attempted, and even this he did with so genial a smile and so merry an eye that a word of his friendly chafing was worth more than any amount of formal praise. Few of the great world's great dispatches contained so much wisdom in so few words as Nye's historic wire from Washington. Quote, My friends and money gave out at 3 a.m. Eugene Field, the lover of little children and the self-confessed bibliomaniac, gives us still another sort of laugh, the tender, indulgent sort. Nothing could be finer than the gentle reminiscence of long ago, a picture of the lost kingdom of boyhood, which for all its lightness holds a pathos that clutches one in the throat. And yet this writer of delicate and subtle humor, this master of tender verse, had a keen and nimble wit. An ambitious poet once sent him a poem to read entitled, Why Do I Live? And Field immediately wrote back, Because you sent your poem by mail. Laughter is one of the best medicines in the world, and though some people would make you force it down with a spoon, there is no doubt that it is a splendid tonic and awakens the appetite for happiness. Colonel Ingersoll wrote on his photograph, which adorns my home, to the man who knows that mirth is medicine and laughter lengthens life. Abraham Lincoln, that divinely tender man, believed that fun was an intellectual impetus, for he read Artemis Ward to his cabinet before reading his famous Emancipation Proclamation, and laying down his book, marked the place to resume. Joel Chandler Harris, whose delightful stories of Negro life hold such a high place in American literature, told me a story of an old Negro who claimed that a sense of humor was necessary to happiness in married life. He said, I met a poor old darky one day, pushing a wheelbarrow loaded with cooking utensils and household effects. Seeing me looking curiously at him, he shook his head and said, I can't stand her no longer, boss. I just naturally can't stand her no longer. What's the matter, uncle? I inquired. Well, you see, sir, she ain't got no idea of fun. She won't take a joke no how. The other night I went home, and I'd been taking a little just to warm my heart. That's all, just to warm my heart. And I got to the fence and tried to climb it. I got on the top, and there I stays. I couldn't get one way or to other. Then a gentleman comes along, and I says, would you mind giving me a push? He says, which way do you want to go? I says, either way. Don't make no difference, just so I get off the fence. For it's powerful uncomfortable up here. So he give me a push, and sent me over toward my side, and I went home. Then I want something to eat, and my old woman, she wouldn't get it for me. And so, just for a joke, that's all just a joke, I hit her on the head. But would you believe it, she couldn't take a joke. She turned round, and, sir, she sailed into me something scandalous. I didn't do nothing, cause I feelin' kind of weak just then, and so I made up my mind I wasn't gonna stay with her. This morning she gone out washin', and I just move right out. It's no use trying to live with a woman who can't take a joke. From the poems of Thomas Bailey Aldrich to George Ade's fables in slang is a far cry, but one is as typical a style of humor as the other. Aids is the more distinctly original, for he not only created the style, but another language. For aptness of its turns, and the marvelous way in which he hit the bull's-eye of human foibles and weaknesses, lifted him into instantaneous popularity. A famous bon mot of George Aids, which has been quoted threadbare, but which serves excellently to illustrate his native wit, is his remark about a suit of clothes which the tailor assured him he could never wear out. He said when he put them on, he didn't dare to. From the laughter-makers pure and simple, we come to those who, while acknowledging the cloud, yet see the silver lining, the exponents of the smile through tears. The best of these, Frank L. Stanton, has beautifully said, This world that we're a-livin' in is mighty hard to beat. With every rose you get a thorn, but ain't the roses sweet? He does not deny the thorns, but calls attention to the sweetness of the roses, a gospel of compensation that speaks to the heart of all, 
kind words of cheer to the weary traveller. Such a philosopher was the kind-hearted and sympathetic Irish boy who, walking along with the parish priest, met a weary organ-grinder, who asked how far it was to the next town. The boy answered, four miles. The priest remonstrated, "'Why, Mike, how could you deceive him so? You know it is eight. "'Well, your reverence,' said the good-natured fellow, "'I saw how tired he was, and I wanted to cape his courage up. "'If I'd told him the truth, he'd have been downhearted entirely. "'This is really a jolly old world, "'and people are very apt to find just what they are looking for. "'If they are looking for happiness, "'the best way to find it is to try to give it to others.' If a man goes around with a face as long as a wet day, perfectly certain that he is going to be kicked, he is seldom disappointed. A typical exponent of the tenderly human, the tearfully humorous, is James Whitcomb Riley, a name to conjure with. Only mention it to anyone, and note the spark of interest, the smiling sigh, and the air of gentle retrospection into which he will fall. There is a poem for each and every one, that commends itself for some special reason, and holds such power of memory or sentiment as sends it straight into the heart, to remain there treasured and unforgotten. In these volumes are selections from the pen of all whom I have mentioned, as well as many more, including a number by the clever woman humorist, of whom America is justly proud. It is with pride and pleasure that I acknowledge the honor done me in being asked to introduce this company of fun-makers, such a goodly number that space permits the mention of but a few. But we cannot have too much or even enough of anything so good or so necessary as the literature that makes us laugh. In that regard we are like a little friend of Mr. Riley's. The Hoosier poet, as everyone knows, is the devoted friend, companion, and singer of children. He has a habit of taking them on wild orgies where they are turned loose in a candy store and told to do their worst. This particular young lady had been allowed to choose all the sorts of candy she liked until her mouth, both arms, and her pockets were full. Just as they got to the door to go out, she hung back, and when Mr. Riley stooped over, asking her what was the matter, she whispered, "'Don't you think it smells like ice cream?' Poems, stories, humorous articles, fables, and fairy tales are offered for your choice, with subjects as diverse as the styles— but however the laugh is gained, in whatever fashion the jest is delivered, the laugh-maker is a public benefactor, for laughter is the salt of life, and keeps the whole dish sweet. Merrily yours, Marshall P. Wilder, Atlantic City, 1908 End of Forward Section 1 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barry Eads. Melons by Brent Hart. As I do not suppose the most gentle of readers will believe that anybody's sponsors in baptism ever willfully assume the responsibility of such a name, I may as well state that I have reason to infer that Melons was simply the nickname of a small boy I once knew. If I had any other, I never knew it. Various theories were often projected by me to account for this strange cognomen. His head, which was covered with a transparent down, like that which clothes very small chickens, plainly permitting the scalp to show through, to an imaginative mind, might have suggested that succulent vegetable that his parents, recognizing some poetical significance in the fruits of the season, might have given this name to an august child, was an oriental explanation. That from his infancy he was fond of indulging in melons seemed on the whole the most likely, particularly as fancy was not bred in McGinnis's court. He dawned upon me as melons. His proximity was indicated by shrill, youthful voices as, Ah, melons! or playfully, hi, melons, and, or authoritatively, you, melons. McGinnis's court was a democratic expression of some obstinate and radical property holder. Occupying a limited space between two fashionable thoroughfares, it refused to conform to circumstances, 
but sturdily paraded its unkempt glories, and frequently asserted itself in ungrammatical language. My window, a rear room on the ground floor, in this way derived blended light and shadow from the court. So low was the window sill, that, had I been the least disposed to somnambulism, it would have broken out under such favourable auspices, and I should have haunted McGinnis's court. My speculations as to the origin of the court were not altogether gratuitous, for by means of this window I once saw the past, as through a glass darkly. It was a Celtic shadow that early one morning obstructed my ancient lights. It seemed to belong to an individual with a peacoat, a stubby pipe, and a bristling beard. He was gazing intently at the court, resting on a heavy cane, somewhat in the way that heroes dramatically visit the scenes of their boyhood. As there was an architectural beauty in the court, I came to the conclusion that it was McGinnis looking after his property. The fact that he carefully kicked a broken bottle out of the road somewhat strengthened me in the opinion, but he presently walked away, and the court knew him no more. He probably collected his rents by proxy, if he collected them at all. Beyond melons, of which all this is purely introductory, there was little to interest the most sanguine and hopeful nature. In common with all such localities, a great deal of washing was done, in comparison with the visible results. There was always something whisking on the line, and always something whisking through the court, that looked as if it ought to be there. A fish geranium, of all plants kept for the recreation of mankind, certainly the greatest illusion, straggled under the window. Through its dusty leaves I caught the first glance of melons. He was about seven. He looked older from the venerable whiteness of his head, and it was impossible to conjecture his size, as he always wore clothes apparently belonging to some shapely youth of nineteen. A pair of pantaloons that, when sustained by a single suspender, completely equipped him, formed his everyday suit. How, with this lavish superfluity of clothing, he managed to perform the surprising gymnastic feats it has been my privilege to witness, I have never been able to tell. His turning the crab and other minor dislocations were always attended with success. It was not an unusual sight at any hour of the day to find Mellon suspended on a line, or to see his venerable head appearing above the roofs of the outhouses. Melons knew the exact height of every fence in the vicinity, its facilities for scaling, and the possibility of seizure on the other side. His more peaceful and quieter amusements consisted in dragging a disused boiler by a large string, with hideous outcries, to imaginary fires. Melons was not gregarious in his habits. A few youth of his own age sometimes called upon him, but they eventually became abusive, and their visits were more strictly predatory incursions for old bottles and junk which formed the staple of McGinnis's court. Overcome by loneliness one day, Mellons inveigled a blind harper into the court. For two hours did that wretched man prosecute his unhallowed calling, unrecompensed, and going round and round the court, apparently under the impression that it was some other place, while Mellon surveyed him from an adjoining fence with calm satisfaction. It was this absence of conscientious motives that brought Mellon's into disrepute with his aristocratic neighbors. Orders were issued that no child of wealthy and pious parentage should play with him. This mandate, as a matter of course, invested Mellon's with a fascinating interest to them. Admiring glances were cast at Mellon's from nursery windows. Baby fingers beckoned to him. Invitations to tea, on wood and pewter, were lisped to him from aristocratic backyards. It was evident he was looked upon as a pure and noble being, untrammeled by the conventionalities of parentage, and physically as well as mentally exalted above them. One afternoon an unusual commotion prevailed in the vicinity of McGinnis's court. Looking from my window, I saw Mellons perched on the roof of a stable, pulling up a rope by which one Tommy, an infant scion of an adjacent and wealthy house, was suspended in mid-air. In vain, the female relatives of Tommy, congregated in the back yard, expostulated with Mellons. In vain, the unhappy father shook his fist at him. Secure in his position, Mellons redoubled his exertions, and at last Tommy landed on the roof. Then it was that the humiliating fact was disclosed that Tommy had been acting in collusion with Mellons. He grinned delightedly back at his parents, 
as if by merit raised to that bad eminence. Long before the latter arrived that was to succor him, he became the sworn ally of Melons, and, I regret to say, incited by the same audacious boy, chafed his own flesh and blood below him. He was eventually taken, though, of course, Melons escaped. But Tommy was restricted to the window after that, and the companionship was limited to, Hi, Melons, and You, Tommy, and Melons, to all practical purposes, lost him forever. I looked afterward to see some signs of sorrow on Melons's part, but in vain. He buried his grief, if he had any, somewhere in his one voluminous garment. At about this time my opportunities of knowing Melons became more extended. I was engaged in filling a void in the literature of the Pacific Coast. As this void was a pretty large one, and as I was informed that the Pacific Coast languished under it, I set apart two hours each day to this work of filling in. It was necessary that I should adopt a methodical system. So I retired from the world, and locked myself in my room at a certain hour each day, after coming from my office. I then carefully drew out my portfolio, and read what I had written the day before. This would suggest some alterations, and I would carefully rewrite it. During this operation, I would turn to consult a book of reference, which invariably proved extremely interesting and attractive. It would generally suggest another and better method of filling in. Turning this method over reflectively in my mind, I would finally commence the new method, which I eventually abandoned, for the original plan. At this time I would become convinced that my exhausted faculties demanded a cigar. The operation of lighting a cigar usually suggested that a little quiet reflection and meditation would be of service to me, and I always allowed myself to be guided by prudential instincts. Eventually, seated by my window, as before stated, Melons asserted himself. Though our conversation rarely went farther than, Hello, mister, and, Ah, Melons, a vagabond instinct we felt in common implied a communion deeper than words. In this spiritual co-mingling the time passed, often beguiled by gymnastics on the fence or line, always with an eye to my window, until dinner was announced and I found a more practical void required my attention. An unlooked-for incident drew us in closer relation. A seafaring friend just from a tropical voyage had presented me with a bunch of bananas. They were not quite ripe, and I hung them before my window to mature in the sun of McGinnis's court, whose forcing qualities were remarkable. In the mysterious mingled odors of ship and shore which they diffused throughout my room, there was lingering reminiscence of low latitudes. But even that joy was fleeting and evanescent. They never reached maturity. Coming home one day, as I turned the corner of that fashionable thoroughfare before alluded to, I met a small boy eating a banana. There was nothing remarkable in that, but as I neared McGinnis's court, I presently met another small boy, also eating a banana. A third small boy, engaged in a like occupation, obtruded a painful coincidence upon my mind. I leave the psychological reader to determine the exact correlation between the circumstance and the sickening sense of loss that overcame me on witnessing it. I reached my room. The bananas were gone. There was but one that knew of their existence, but one who frequented my window, but one capable of gymnastic effort to procure them, and that was, I blush to say it, Melons. Melons, the debridator. Melons, despoiled by larger boys of his ill-gotten booty, or reckless and indiscreetly liberal. Melons, now a fugitive on some neighborhood housetop. I lit a cigar, and drawing my chair to the window, sought surcease of sorrow in the contemplation of the fish geranium. In a few moments something white passed my window at about the level of the edge. There was no mistaking that hoary head, which now represented to me only aged iniquity. It was Melons, that venerable, juvenile hypocrite. He affected not to observe me, and would have withdrawn quietly, but that horrible fascination which causes the murderer to revisit the scene of his crime impelled him toward my window. I smoked calmly and gazed at him without speaking. He walked several times up and down the court, with a half-rigid, half-belligerent expression of eye and shoulder, intended to represent the carelessness of innocence. Once or twice he stopped, and putting his arms their whole length into his capacious trousers, gazed with some interest at the additional width they thus acquired. 
Then he whistled. The singular conflicting conditions of John Brown's body and soul were at that time beginning to attract the attention of youth, and Mellins's performance of that melody was always remarkable. But today he whistled falsely and shrilly between his teeth. At last he met my eye. He winced slightly, but recovered himself, and going to the fence stood for a few moments on his hands, with his bare feet quivering in the air. Then he turned toward me and threw out a conversational preliminary. "'They is a circus,' said Mellons gravely, hanging with his back to the fence and his arms twisted around the palings. "'A circus over yonder,' indicating the locality with his foot, "'with hosses and hossback riders. There's a man what rides six hosses at once. Six hosses at once, and nary saddle.' And he paused in expectation." Even this equestrian novelty did not affect me. I still kept a fixed gaze on Mellons's eye, and he began to tremble and visibly shrink in his capacious garment. Some other desperate means, conversation with Mellons was always a desperate means, must be resorted to. He recommenced more artfully. Do you know carrots? I had a faint remembrance of a boy of that euphonious name, with scarlet hair, who was a playmate and persecutor of Mellon's, but I said nothing. Carrots is a bad boy. Killed a policeman once. Where's a dirk knife in his boots? Saw him today looking in your windy. I felt that this must end here. I rose sternly and addressed Mellon's. Mellon's, this is all irrelevant and impertinent to the case. You took those bananas. Your proposition regarding carrots, even if I were inclined to accept it as credible information, does not alter the material issue. You took those bananas. The offense under the statutes of California is felony. How far carrots may have been accessory to the fact, either before or after, is not my intention at present to discuss. The act is complete. Your present conduct shows the animal ferundi to have been equally clear. By the time I had finished this exordium, Mellons had disappeared, as I fully expected. He never reappeared. The remorse that I have experienced for the part I had taken in what I fear may have resulted in his utter and complete extermination, alas, he may not know, except through these pages. For I have never seen him since. Whether he ran away and went to sea to reappear at some future day, as the most ancient of mariners, or whether he buried himself completely in his trousers, I never shall know. I have read the papers anxiously for accounts of him. I have gone to the police office in the vain attempt of identifying him as a lost child. But I never saw him or heard of him since. Strange fears have sometimes crossed my mind that his venerable appearance may have been actually the result of senility, and that he may have been gathered peacefully to his fathers in a green old age. I have even had doubts of his existence, and have sometimes thought that he was providentially and mysteriously offered to fill the void I have before alluded to. In that hope I have written these pages. End of Melons Section 2 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain, for more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robin The Deacon's Masterpiece Or The Wonderful Wan Ho She A Logical Story By Oliver Wendell Holmes Have you ever heard of the wonderful Wan Ho She that was built in such a logical way it ran a hundred years to a day, and then all of a sudden it... Oh, but stay. I'll tell you what happened without delay. Scaring the parson into fits, frightening people out of their wits. Have you ever heard of that, I say? 1755. Georgius Secundus was then alive, snuffy old drone from the German hive. That was the year when Lisbon town saw the earth open and gulp her down, and Braddock's army was done so round left without a scalp to its crown. It was on the terrible earthquake day that the deacon finished the Wan Ha Shea. 
In building of chases, I tell you what, there is always somewhere a weakest spot. In hub, tire, fellow, in spring or thill, in panel or crossbar or floor or sill, in screw, bolt, thorough brace, lurking still, find it somewhere you must and will, above or below, or within or without, and that's the reason beyond a doubt that a chase breaks down but doesn't wear out. But the deacons swore, as deacons do with an I do vum and an I tell you, he would build a one shay to beat the town, in the county, in all the country round. It should be so built that it couldn't break down. First, said the deacon, tis mighty plain that the weakest spot must stand the strain, and the way to fix it, as I maintain, is only just to make that place as strong as the rest. So the deacon inquired of the village folk where he could find the strongest oak that couldn't be split nor bent nor broke. That was for spokes and floor and sills. He sent for lance wood to make the thills. The crossbars were ash from the straightest trees. The panels of white wood that cuts like cheese, but lasts like iron for things like these. The hubs of logs from the settler's elm, last of its timber, they couldn't sell them. Never an axe had seen their chips, and the wedges flew from between their lips, their blunt ends frizzled like celery tips. Step and prop iron, bolt and screw, spring, tire, axle, and linchpin too, steel of the finest, bright and blue. Thoroughbrace bison skin, thick and wide, boot, top, dasher, from tough old hide, found in the pit when the tanner died. That was the way he put her through. There, said the deacon, now she'll do. Do? I tell you, I rather guess she was a wonder and nothing less. Colts grew horses, beards turned gray, deacon and deaconess dropped away. Children and grandchildren, where were they? But there stood the stout old one horse shay, as fresh as on Lisbon earthquake day. Eighteen hundred, it came and found the deacon's masterpiece strong and sound. Eighteen hundred increased by ten, handsome carriage, they called it then. Eighteen hundred and twenty came, running as usual, much the same. Thirty and forty at last arrive, and then come fifty and fifty-five. Little of all we value here wakes in the morn of its hundredth year, without both feeling and looking queer. In fact, there's nothing that keeps its youth so far as I know, but a tree and truth. This is a moral that runs at large. Take it, you're welcome. No extra charge. First of November, the earthquake day. There are traces of age in the one horse shay, a general flavor of mild decay, but nothing local, as one may say. There couldn't be, for the deacon's art had made it so lack in every part that there wasn't a chance for one to start. For the wheels were just as strong as the thills, and the floor was just as strong as the sills. The panels were just as strong as the floor, and the whipple tree neither less nor more, and the back cross bar as strong as the fore, and the spring and axle and hub encore. And yet, as a whole, it is past a doubt, in another hour it will be worn out. First November, fifty-five. This morning the possum takes a drive. Now, small boys, get out of the way. Here comes the wonderful one hall shay, drawn by a rat-tailed eunuch bay. Hut up, said the possum. Off they went. The possum was working his Sunday's text, had got to fifthly, and stopped perplexed. And what the Moses was coming next? All at once the horse stood still, close by the meeting house on the hill, first a shiver, and then a thrill, then something decidedly like a spill, and the parson was sitting upon a rock at half past nine by the meeting house clock, just the hour of the earthquake shock. What do you think the parson found when he got up and stared around? The poor old chase in a heap or mound as if it had been to the mill and ground. You see, of course, if you're not a dunce, how it went to pieces all at once. All at once and nothing first, just as bubbles do when they burst. End of the wonderful one horse shay. Logic is logic. That's all I say. End of the Deacon's Masterpiece. Recording by Robin in Norman, Oklahoma.
Section 3 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Therese. The Purple Cow by Gallet Burgess. Reflections on a Mythic Beast, Who's Quite Remarkable, at Least. I never saw a purple cow. I never hope to see one, but I can tell you, anyhow, I'd rather see than be one. Cinq ans opres. Confession, and a portrait, too, upon a background that I rue. Ah, yes, I wrote the purple cow. I'm sorry, now, I wrote it, but I can tell you, anyhow, I'll kill you if you quote it. End of The Purple Cow Recording by Maria Therese Section 4 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joe Mabry The Curse of the Competent by Henry J. Finn My spirit hath been seared, as though the lightning's scathe had rent, in the swiftness of its wrath, through the midnight firmament, the darkly deepening clouds and the shadows dim and murky of destiny are on me, for my dinner's not but turkey. The chords upon my silent lute no soft vibrations know, save where the meanings of despair, outbreathings of my woe, Tell of the cold and selfish world. In melancholy mood, the soul of genius chills with only fourteen cords of wood. The dreams of the deserted float around my curtained hours, and young imaginings are as the thorns bereft of flowers. A wretched outcast from mankind, my strength of heart has sank beneath the evils of ten thousand dollars in the bank. This life to me a desert is, and kindness as the stream that singly drops upon the waste where burning breezes teem. A banished, blasted plant I droop to which no freshness lends its healing balm, for heaven knows I've but a dozen friends. And sorrow round my brow has wreathed its coronal of thorns, no dewy pearl of pleasure my sad sunken eyes adorns, Calamity has clothed my thoughts, I feel a bliss no more. Alas, my wardrobe now would only stock a clothing store. The joyousness of memory for me for I hath fled, it dwells within the dreary habitation of the dead. I breathe my midnight melodies in languor, and by stealth, for fate inflicts upon my frame the luxury of health. Envy, neglect, and scorn have been my hard inheritance, and a baneful curse clings to me like the stain on innocence. My moments are as faded leaves or roses in their blight. I'm asked but once a day to dine, to parties every night. Would that I were a silver ray upon the moonlight air, or but one gleam that's glorified by each Peruvian's prayer. My tortured spirit turns from earth to ease its bitter loathing, my hatred is on all things here because I want for nothing. End of the Curse of the Competent Recording by Joe Mabry at www.ievoice.com Section 5 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Grammatical Boy by Bill Nye Sometimes a sad, homesick feeling comes over me when I compare the prevailing style of anecdote and school literature with the old McGuffey brand so well known thirty years ago. Today our juvenile literature, it seems to me, is so transparent, so easy to understand, that I am not surprised to learn that the rising generation shows signs of lawlessness. 
boys to-day do not use the respectful language and large luxuriant words that they did when mr mcguffey used to stand around and report their conversations for his justly celebrated school reader it is disagreeable to think of but it is none the less true and for one i think we should face the facts i ask the careful student of school literature to compare the following selection which i have written myself with great care and arranged with special reference to the matter of choice and difficult words with the flippant and commonplace terms used in the average school book of to-day one day as george pilgarlick was going to his tasks and while passing through the wood he spied a tall man approaching in an opposite direction along the highway ah thought george in a low mellow tone of voice whom have we here good morning my fine fellow exclaimed the stranger pleasantly do you reside in this locality indeed i do retorted george cheerily doffing his cap in yonder cottage near the glen my widowed mother and her thirteen children dwell with me and is your father dead exclaimed the man with a rising inflection extremely so murmured the lad and oh sir that is why my poor mother is a widow and how did your papa die asked the man as he thoughtfully stood on the other foot a while alas sir said george as a large hot tear stole down his pale cheek and fell with a loud report on the warty surface of his bare foot he was lost at sea in a bitter gale the good ship foundered two years ago last christmas tide and father was foundered at the same time no one knew of the loss of the ship and that the crew was drowned until the next spring and it was then too late and what is your age my fine fellow quoth the stranger if i live till next october said the boy in a declamatory tone of voice suitable for a second reader i will be seven years of age and who provides for your mother and her large family of children queried the man indeed i do sir replied george in a shrill tone i toil oh so hard sir for we are very very poor and since my elder sister anne was married and brought her husband home to live with us i have to toil more assiduously than heretofore and by what means do you obtain a livelihood exclaimed the man in slowly measured and grammatical words by digging wells kind sir replied george picking up a tired ant as he spoke and stroking it on the back i have a good education and so i am able to dig wells as well as a man i do this daytimes and take in washing at night in this way i am enabled barely to maintain our family in a precarious manner but oh sir should my other sisters marry i fear that some of my brothers-in-law would have to suffer and do you not fear the deadly fire damp asked the stranger in an earnest tone not by a damp sight answered george with a low gurgling laugh for he was a great wag you are indeed a brave lad exclaimed the stranger as he repressed a smile and do you not at times become very weary and wish for other ways of passing your time indeed i do sir said the lad i would fain run and romp and be gay like other boys but i must engage in constant manual exercise or we will have no bread to eat and i have not seen a pie since papa perished in the moist and moaning sea and what if i were to tell you that your papa did not perish at sea but was saved from a humid grave asked the stranger in pleasing tones ah sir exclaimed george in a genteel manner again doffing his cap i am too polite to tell you what i would say and besides sir you are much larger than i am but my brave lad said the man in low musical tones do you not know me georgie oh george i must say replied george that you have the advantage of me whilst i may have met you before i cannot at this moment place you sir my son oh my son murmured the man at the same time taking a large strawberry mark out of his valise and showing it to the lad 
Do you not recognize your parent on your father's side? When our good ship went to the bottom, all perished save me. I swam several miles through the billows, and at last, utterly exhausted, gave up all hope of life. Suddenly I stepped on something hard. It was the United States. And now, my brave boy, exclaimed the man with great glee, see what I have brought for you. It was but the work of a moment to unclasp from a shawl strap which he held in his hand and present to George's astonished gaze a large forty-cent watermelon, which until now had been concealed by the shawl strap. End of The Grammatical Boy Recording by Tricia G. Section 6 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Simple English by Ray Clark Rose. Oft times when I put on my gloves, I wonder if I'm sane. For when I put the right one on, the right seems to remain to be put on, that is, tis left. Yet if the left I don, the other one is left, and then I have the right one on. But still I have the left on right, the right one though is left, to go right on the left right hand all right if I am deft. End of Simple English Recording by Tricia G. Section 7 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times. Partingtonian Patchwork by B. P. Schalaber. Number 7. Are you in favor of the prohibitive law or the license law? asked her opposite neighbor of the relict of P. P., corporal of the bloody eleventh. She carefully weighed the question as though she were selling snuff, and answered, Sometimes I think I am, and then again I think I am not. Her neighbor was perplexed, and repeated the question, varying it a little. Have you seen the Mrs. Partington twilight soap? she asked. Yes, was the reply. Everybody has seen that, but why? Because, said the dame, it has two sides to it, and it is hard to choose between them. Now here are my two neighbors, contagious to me on both sides. One goes for probation, t'other for licentiousness, and I think the best thing for me is to keep nuisance. She meant neutral, of course. The neighbor admired and smiled, while Ike lay on the floor, with his legs in the air, trying to balance Mrs. Partington's fancy waiter on his toe. Number 9. Christmas, Ike was made the happy possessor of a fiddle, which he found in the morning near his stocking. "'Has he got a musical bent?' Banfield asked, of whom Mrs. Partington was buying the instrument. "'Bent, indeed!' said she. No, he's as straight as an error. He explained by repeating the question regarding his musical inclination. Yes, she replied, he's dreadfully inclined to music, since he had a drum, and I want the fiddle to see if I can't make another pickaninny or an old bull of him. Jew's harps is simple, though I can't see how King David played on one of em, and sung his psalms at the same time, but the fiddle is best, because genius can show itself plainer on it without much noise. Some prefers a violin, but I don't know. The fiddle was well improved, till the horsehair all pulled out of the bow, and it was then twisted up into a fish line. Number 16 How limpid you walk! said a voice behind us, as we were making a hundred and fifty horsepower effort to reach a table whereon reposed a volume of bacon. What is the cause of your lameness? 
It was Mrs. Partington's voice that spoke, and Mrs. Partington's eyes that met the glance we returned over our left shoulder. Gout, said we, briefly, almost surlily. Dear me, said she, you are highly flavored. It was only rich people and epicacs in living that had the gout in olden times. Ah, we growled, partly in response, and partly with an infernal twinge. Poor soul, she continued, with commiseration, like an anodyne, in the tones of her voice. The best remedy I know for it is an embarkation of Roman wormwood and lobelia for the part infected, though some say a cranberry poultice is best. But I believe the cranberries is for erysipelas, and whether either of them is a rostrum for the gout or not, I really don't know. If it was a fraction of the arm, I could just know what to subscribe. We looked into her eye with a determination to say something severely bitter, because we felt allopathic just then. But the kind and sympathizing look that met our own disarmed severity, and sinking into a seat with our coveted bacon, we thanked her. It was very evident, all the while, that she, or they, stayed, that Ike was seeing how near he could come to our lame member, and not touch it. He did touch it sometimes, but those didn't count. Number 20. I've always noticed said Mrs. Partington on New Year's Day, dropping her voice to the key that people adopt when they are disposed to be philosophical or moral. I've always noticed that every year added to a man's life is apt to make him older, just as a man who goes a journey finds, as he jogs on, that every mile he goes brings him nearer where he is going, and farther from where he started. I am not so young as I was once, and I don't believe I shall ever be, if I live to the age of Samson, which, heaven knows as well as I do, I don't want to, for I wouldn't be a centurion or an octagon, and survive my factories, and become idiomatic by any means. But then there is no knowing how a thing will turn out till it takes place, and we shall come to an end some day, though we may never live to see it. There was a smart tap on the looking-glass that hung upon the wall, followed instantly by another. "'Gracious!' said she. "'What's that? I hope the glass isn't fractioned, for it is a sure sign of calamity, and mercy knows they come along full fast enough without helping em by breaking looking-glasses.' There was another tap, and she caught sight of a white bean that fell on the floor, and there, reflected in the glass, was the face of Ike, who was blowing beans at the mirror through a crack in the door. Number 21. As for the Chinese question, said Mrs. Partington, reflectively, holding her spoon at present, while the vapor of her cup of tea curled about her face, which shone through it like the moon through a mist. It is a great pity that somebody don't answer it, though who under the canister of heaven can do it, with such letters as they have on their tea chests, is more than I can tell. It is really too bad, though, that some lingister doesn't try it, and not have this provoking question asked all the time, as if we were ignoramuses, and did not know too long from no strong, and there never was such a thing as the seventh commandment, which, heaven knows, suits this case to a tea and I hope the breakers of it may escape, but I don't see how they can. The question must be answered. Unless it is like a cannon drum to be given up, which nobody of any spirit should do. She brought the spoon down into the cup, and looked out through the windows of her soul into celestial fields, peopled with pigtails, that were all in her eye, while Ike took a double charge of sugar for his tea, and gave an extra allowance of milk to the kitten. End of Section 7
Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Patrick Reinhardt. The Menagerie by William Vaughn Moody. Thank God my brain is not inclined to cut such capers every day. I'm just about mellow, but then there goes the tent flap shut. Rain's in the wind. I thought so. Every snout was twitching when the keeper turned me out. That screaming parrot makes my blood run cold. Gabriel's trump. The big bull elephant squeals rain to the parched herd. The monkeys scold and jabber that it's rainwater they want. It makes me sick to see a monkey pant. I'll foot it home to try and make believe I'm sober. After this I stick to beer and drop the circus when the sane folks leave. A man's a fool to look at things too near. They look back and begin to cut up queer. Beasts do, at any rate, especially wild devils caged. They have the coolest way of being something else than what you see. You pass a sleek young zebra nosing hay, a nilgal looking bored and distingue, and think you've seen a donkey and a bird. Not on your life, just glance back if you dare. The zebra chews, the nilgal hasn't stirred, but something's happened, heaven knows what or where, to freeze your scalp and pompadour your hair. I'm not precisely an aeolian lute hung in the wandering winds of sentiment, but drown me if the ugliest, meanest brute grunting and fretting in that sultry tent didn't just floor me with embarrassment. Twas like a thunderclap from out the clear, one minute. They were circus beasts, some grand, some ugly, some amusing, and some queer, rival attractions to the hobo band, the flying jenny, and the peanut stand. Next minute they were old hearthmates of mine, lost people eyeing me with such a stare, patient, satiric, devilish, divine, a gaze of hopeless envy, squalid care, hatred, and thwarted love, and dim despair. Within my blood my ancient kindred spoke, grotesque and monstrous voices heard afar, down ocean caves when behemoth awoke, or through fern forests roared the plesiosaur, locked with a giant bat in ghastly war. And suddenly, as in a flash of light, I saw great nature working out her plan, through all her shapes from mastodon to might, forever groping, testing, passing on, to find at last the shape and soul of man till in the fullness of accomplished time comes brother Forepaw, upon business bent, tracks her through frozen and through torrid clime, and shows us, neatly labeled in a tent, the stages of her huge experiment, babbling aloud her shy and reticent hours, dragging to light her blinking slothful moods, publishing fretful seasons when her powers worked wild and sullen in her solitudes, or when her mordant laughter shook the woods. Here, round about me, were her vagrant births, sick dreams she had, fierce projects she essayed, her qualms, her fiery prides, her craze mirths, the troublings of her spirit as she strayed, cringed, gloated, mocked, was lordly, was afraid. On that long road she went to seek mankind, here were the darkling coverts that she beat to find the hider that she was sent to find. Here the distracted footprints of her feet, whereby her soul's desire she came to greet. But why should they, her botchwork, turn about and stare disdain at me, her finished job? Why was the place one vast suspended shout of laughter? Why did all the daylight throb with soundless guffaw and dumb-stricken sob? Helpless I stood among those awful cages. The beasts were walking loose, and I was bagged. I, I, last product of the toiling ages, goal of heroic feet that never lagged, a little man in trousers, slightly jagged. Deliver me from such another jury. The judgment day will be a picnic to it. 
their satire was more dreadful than their fury and worst of all was just a kind of brute disgust and giving up and sinking mute survival of the fittest adaptation and all their other evolution terms seem to omit one small consideration to wit that tumblebugs and angleworms have souls there's soul in everything that squirms and souls are restless plagued impatient things all dream and unaccountable desire crawling but pestered with the thought of wings spreading through every inch of earth's old mire mystical hanker after something higher wishes are horses as i understand i guess a wistful polyp that his strokes of feeling faint to gallivant on land will come to be a scandal to his folk legs he will sprout in spite of threats and jokes and at the core of every life that crawls or runs or flies or swims or vegetates churning the mammoth's heart blood in the galls of shark and tiger planting gorgeous hates lighting the love of eagles for their mates yes in the dim brain of the jellied fish that is and is not living moved and stirred from the beginning a mysterious wish a vision a command a fatal word the name of man was uttered and they heard upward along the eons of old war they sought him wing and shank bone claw and bill were fashioned and rejected wide and far they roamed the twilight jungles of their will but still they sought him and desired him still man they desired but mind you perfect man the radiant and the living yet to be i hardly wonder when they come to scan the upshot of their strenuosity they gazed with mixed emotions upon me well my advice to you is face the creatures or spot them sideways with your weather eye just to keep tab on their expansive features it isn't pleasant when you're stepping high to catch a giraffe smiling on the sly if nature made you graceful don't get gay back to before the hippopotamus if meek and godly find some place to play besides right where three mad hyenas fuss you may hear language that we won't discuss if you're a sweet thing in a flower-bed hat or her best fellow with your tie tucked in don't squander love's bright springtime girding at an old chimpanzee with an irish chin there may be hidden meaning in his grin end of the menagerie by william vaughn moody section nine of the wit and humor of america volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Leeson Down Around the River by James Whitcomb Riley Noontime and June time, down around the river. Half the first with Lizy Ann, but Lazy I forgive her. Drives me off the place, and says at all that she's a-wishin, land of gracious, time will come I'll get enough of fishin'. Little Dave, a choppin' wood, never peers to notice, don't know where she's hid his hat or keerin where his coat is speculatin more'n like he ain't a-goin to mind me and guessin where say twelve o'clock a feller'd likely find me noontime and june time down around the river clean out of sight o home and skulkin under kiver of the sycamores jack oaks and swamp ash and ellum ideas all so jumbled up you can hardly tell em tired you know but lovin it and smilin just to think at any sweeter tiredness you'd fairly want to drink it tired of fishin tired of fun line out slack and slacker all you want in all the world's a little more tobacker hungry but a hidin it or jes a not a keerin kingfisher gettin up and scootin out a hearin snipes on t'other side where the county ditch is wadin up and down the age like they'd rolled their britches old turkle on the root kind of sort of drappin into the water like he don't know how it happened water shade and all so mixed don't know where you'd order say the water in the shatter shatter in the water 
somebody hollerin way around the bend in upper fork where your eye can just catch the endin of the shiny wedge awake some muskrats a makin with that perky nose of his then a sniff of bacon cornbread and dock greens and little dave a shinnin cross the rocks and mussel shells a limpin and a grinnin with your dinner fer ye and a blessin from the giver noontime and june time down around the river End of Down Around the River Section 10 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenevere. A Medieval Discoverer by Bill Nye Galilei, commonly called Galileo, was born at Pisa on the fourteenth day of February, 1564. He was the man who discovered some of the fundamental principles governing the movements, habits, and personal peculiarities of the earth. He discovered things with marvelous fluency. Born as he was at a time when the rotary motion of the earth was still in its infancy, and astronomy was taught only in a crude way, Galileo started in to make a few discoveries and advance some theories which he loved. He was the son of a musician and learned to play several instruments himself, but not in such a way as to arouse the jealousy of the great musicians of his day. They came and heard him play a few selections, and then they went home contented with their own music. Galileo played for several years in a band at Pisa and people who heard him said that his manner of gazing out over the Pisan hills with a far-away look in his eye after playing a selection, while he gently upended his alto horn and worked the mud valve, as he poured out about a pint of moist melody that had accumulated in the flues of his instrument, was simply grand. At the age of twenty Galileo began to discover. His first discoveries were, of course, clumsy and poorly made, but very soon he commenced to turn out neat and durable discoveries that would stand for years. It was at this time that he noticed the swinging of a lamp in a church, and, observing that the oscillations were of equal duration, he inferred that this principle might be utilized in the exact measurement of time. From this little accident, years after, came the clock, one of the most useful of man's dumb friends and yet there are people who will read this little incident and still hesitate about going to church. Galileo also invented the thermometer, the microscope, and the proportional compass. He seemed to invent things not for the money to be obtained in that way, but solely for the joy of being first on the ground. He was a man of infinite genius and perseverance. He was also very fair in his treatment of other inventors. Though he did not personally invent the rotary motion of the earth, he heartily endorsed it and said it was a good thing. He also came out in a card in which he said that he believed it to be a good thing and that he hoped some day to see it applied to other planets. He was also the inventor of a telescope that had a magnifying power of thirty times. He presented this to the Venetian Senate and it was used in making appropriations for river and harbor improvements. By telescopic investigation, Galileo discovered the presence of microbes in the moon, but was unable to do anything for it. I have spoken of Mr. Galileo informally, calling him by his first name, all the way through this article, for I feel so thoroughly acquainted with him, though there was such a striking difference in our ages, that I think I am justified in using his given name while talking of him. Galileo also sat up nights and visited with Venus through a long telescope which he had made himself from an old bamboo fishing rod. But astronomy is a very enervating branch of science. Galileo frequently came down to breakfast with red, heavy eyes, eyes that were swollen full of unshed tears. Still he persevered. Day after day he worked and toiled. Year after year he went on with his task till he had worked out in his own mind the satellites of Jupiter, 
and placed a small tin tag on each one so that he would know it readily when he saw it again. Then he began to look up Saturn's rings and investigate the freckles on the sun. He did not stop at trifles, but went bravely on till everybody came from miles to look at him and get him to write something funny in their autograph albums. It was not an unusual thing for Galileo to get up in the morning, after a wearisome night with a fretful newborn star, to find his front yard full of albums. Some of them were little red albums with floral decorations on them, while others were the large plush and alligator albums of the affluent. Some were new and had the price mark still on them, while others were old, foundered albums with a droop in the back and little flecks of egg and gravy on the title page. All came with a request for Galileo to write a little witty characteristic sentiment in them. Galileo was the author of the Hydrostatic Paradox and other sketches. He was a great reader and a fluent penman. One time he was absent from home lecturing in Venice for the benefit of the United Aggregation of Mutual Admirers, and did not return for two weeks, so that when he got back he found the front room full of autograph albums. It is said that he then demonstrated his great fluency and readiness as a thinker and writer. He waded through the entire lot in two days with only two men from West Pisa to assist him. Galileo came out of it fresh and youthful, and all of the following night he was closeted with another inventor, a wicker-covered microscope, and a bologna sausage. The investigations were carried on for two weeks, after which Galileo went out to the inebriate asylum and discovered some new styles of reptiles. Galileo was the author of a little work called I Discari e Dismas Tarzioni Matimacie in Toros a Due Mueve Cienze. It was a neat little book of about medium height and sold well on the trains, for the Pisan newsboys on the cars were very affable as they are now, and when they came and leaned an armful of these books on a passenger's leg and poured into his ear a long tale about the wonderful beauty of the work, and then pulled in the name of the book from the rear of the last car, where it had been hanging on behind, the passenger would most always buy it, and enough of the name to wrap it up in. He also discovered the isochronism of the pendulum. He saw that the pendulum at certain seasons of the year looked yellow under the eyes, and that it drooped and did not enter into its work with the old zest. He began to study the case with the aid of his new bamboo telescope and a wicker-covered microscope. As a result, in ten days he had the pendulum on its feet again. Galileo was inclined to be liberal in his religious views, more especially in the matter of the scriptures, claiming that there were passages in the Bible which did not literally mean what the translator said they did. This was where Galileo missed it. So long as he discovered stars and isochronisms and such things as that, he succeeded. But when he began to fool with other people's religious beliefs, he got into trouble. He was forced to fly from Pisa, we are told by the historian, and we are assured at the same time that Galileo, who had always been far, far ahead of his competitors in other things, was equally successful as a fleer. Galileo received but sixty scudi per year as a salary while in Pisa, and a part of that he took in town orders worth only sixty cents on the scudi. End of A Medieval Discoverer Section 11 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. Wanted a Cook by Alan Dale. There was a ring at the front door bell. Letitia, wrought up, nervously clutched my arm. For a moment a sort of paralysis seized me, then, alertly as a young calf, I bounded toward the door, hope aroused, and expectation keen. It was rather dark in the outside hall, and I could not quite perceive the nature of our visitor, but I soon gladly realized that it was something feminine, 
and as i held the door open a thin small soiled wisp of a woman glided in and smiled at me talani svensk she asked but i had no idea what she meant she may have been impertinent or even rude or perhaps improper but she looked as though she might be a domestic and i led her gently reverently to letitia in the drawing-room i smiled back at her in a wild endeavour to be sympathetic i would have anointed her or bathed her feet or plied her with figs and dates or have done anything that any nationality craves as a welcome as the front door closed i heaved a sigh of relief here was probably the quintessence of five advertisements out of the mountain crept a mouse and quite a little mouse too talani svensk proved to be nothing more outrageous than do you speak swedish my astute little wife discovered this intuitively i left them together my mental excuse being that women understand each other and that a man is unnecessary under the circumstances i had some misgivings on the subject of letitia and svensk but the universal language of femininity is not without its uses i devoutly hoped that letitia would be able to come to terms as the mere idea of a cook who couldn't excoriate us in english was at that moment delightful at the end of a quarter of an hour i strolled back to the drawing-room letitia was smiling and the handmaiden sat grim and uninspired i've engaged her archie said letitia she knows nothing as she has told me in the few words of english that she has picked up but you remember what aunt julia said about the clean slate i gazed at the maiden and reflected that while the term slate might be perfectly correct the adjective seemed a bit over enthusiastic she was decidedly soiled this quintessence of a quinet of advertisements i said nothing anxious not to dampen letitia's elation she has no references continued my wife as she has never been out before she's just a simple little stockholm girl i like her face immensely archie immensely she's willing to begin at once which shows that she's eager and consequently likely to suit us wait for me archie while i take her to the kitchen come Yada. exactly why letitia couldn't say come Yada seemed strange she probably thought that com must be swedish and that it sounded well she certainly invented com on the spur of the scandinavian moment and i learnt afterward that it was correct my inspired letitia still in spite of all my opinion is that come Yada would have done just as well isn't it delightful cried letitia when she joined me later i am really enthusiastic at the idea of a swedish girl i adore scandinavia archie it always makes me think of ibsen perhaps Gerda lyberg that's her name will be as interesting as hedda gabler and mrs alving and nora and all those lovely complex ibsen creatures they were norwegians dear i said gently anxious not to shatter illusions the ibsen place deals with christiania not with stockholm but they are so near declared letitia amiable and seraphic once more somehow or other i invariably mix up norway and sweden and denmark i know i shall always look upon gerda as an ibsen girl who has come here to live her life or work out her inheritance perhaps dear she has some interesting internal disease or a maggoty brain don't you think archie that the ibsen inheritances are always most fascinating a bit morbid but surely fascinating i prefer a healthy cook letitia i said meditatively somebody willing to interest herself in our inheritance rather than in her own i don't mind what you say now she pouted i'm not to be put down by clamour we really have a cook at last and i feel more lenient toward you archie of course i was only joking when i suggested the ibsen diseases gerda lieber may have inherited from her ancestors something quite nice and attractive then you mustn't look upon her as ibsen letitia i protested 
the ibsen people never inherit nice things their ancestors always bequeath nasty ones that is where their consistency comes in they are receptacles for horrors personally if you'll excuse my flippancy i prefer norwegian anchovies to norwegian heroines it's a mere matter of opinion i'm ashamed of you retorted litzia defiantly you talk like some of the wretchedly frivolous criticisms so called that men like acton davis and alan dale inflict upon the long-suffering public they never amuse me ibsen may make his heroines the recipients of ugly legacies but he has never yet cursed them with the odious incubus known as a sense of humour the people with a sense of humour have something in their brains worse than maggots we'll drop the subject archie i'm going to learn swedish before gerda lieber has been with us a month i intend to be able to talk fluently it will be most useful next time we go to europe we'll take in sweden and i'll do the piloting i'm going to buy some swedish books and study won't it be jolly and just think how melancholy we were this morning you and i looking out of that window and trying to materialize cooks wasn't it funny archie what amusing experiences we shall be able to chronicle later on letitia babbled on like half a dozen brooks and thinking up a gentle parody in the shape of cooks may come and men may go i decided to leave my household goods for the bread earning contest downtown i could not feel quite as sanguine as letitia who seemed to have forgotten the dismal results of the advertisement just one little puny swedish result i should have preferred to make a choice letitia was as pleased with gerda lyberg as though she had been a selection instead of a that or nothing if somebody had dramatized gerda lyberg's initial dinner it would probably have been considered exceedingly droll as a serious episode however its humor to my mind lacked spontaneity letitia had asked her to cook us a little swedish meal so that we could get some idea of stockholm life in which for some reason or other we were supposed to be deeply interested unfortunately i was extremely hungry and had carefully avoided luncheon in order to give my appetite a chance we sat down to a huge bowl of cold greasy soap in which enormous lumps of meat swam as though for their life awaiting rescue at the prongs of a fork in addition to this epicurean dish was a teeming plate of water-soaked potatoes delicately boiled that was all letitia said that it was swedish and the most annoying part of the entertainment was that i was alone in my critical disapprobation letitia was so engrossed with the little swedish conversation book that she brought to table that she forgot the mere material question of food forgot everything but the horrible jargon she was studying and the soiled wisp-like maiden who looked more unlike a clean slate than ever what shall i say to her archie asked letitia turning over the pages of her book as i tried to rescue a block of meat from the cold fat in which it lurked here is a chapter on dinner i am very hungry jag är mycket hungrig rather pretty isn't it hark at this kypare give me matsedeln och vinlistan that means waiter give me the bill of fare and the list of wines don't i cried don't this woman doesn't know what dining means look out a chapter on feeding letitia was perfectly unruffled she paid no attention to me whatsoever she was fascinated with the slovenly girl who stood around and gaped at her swedish Jada said letitia with her eyes on the book yif me even seen up och nogra potater and then as miss lyberg died for the drowned potatoes letitia exclaimed in an ecstasy of joy she understands archie she understands i feel i'm going to be a great success jag tackar gerda that means i thank you jag tackar see if you can say it archie just try dear to oblige me jag tackar now that's a good boy jag tackar i won't i declared spitfully no jag tackar ing for a parody like this letitia you don't seem to realize that i'm hungry 
honestly i prefer a delicatessen dinner to this pray give me a piece of venison read letitia absolutely disregarding my mood var god och gif mig ett stycke vilt it's almost intelligible isn't it dear ni äter icke you do not eat i can't i asserted mournfully anxious to gain letitia's sympathy it was not forthcoming letitia's eyes were fastened on gerda and i could not help noting on the woman's face an expression of scorn i felt certain of it she appeared to regard my wife as a sort of irresponsible freak and i was vexed to think that letitia should make such an exhibition of herself and countenance the alleged meal that was set before us i have really dined very well she continued joyously jag har verkligen ätit mycket bra if you are quite sure that she doesn't understand english letitia i said viciously i'll say to you that this is a kind of joke i don't appreciate i won't keep such a woman in the house let us put on our things and go out and have dinner better late than never letitia was turning over the pages of her book quite lost to her surroundings as i concluded my remarks she looked up and exclaimed how very funny archie just as you said better late than never i came across that very phrase in the list of swedish proverbs it must be telepathy dear better late than never bettre sent and aldrig what were you saying on the subject dear will you repeat it and do try it in swedish say bettre sent and aldrig letitia i shot forth in a fury i'm not in the humor for this sort of thing i think this dinner and this woman are rotten see if you can find the word rotten in swedish i am surprised at you letitia declared glacially roused from her book by my heroic though unparliamentary language your expressions are neither english nor swedish please don't use such gutter words before a servant to say nothing of your own wife but she doesn't understand i protested glancing at miss lyberg i could have sworn that i detected a gleam in the woman's eyes and that the swings-like attitude of dull incomprehensibility suggested a strenuous effort she doesn't understand anything she doesn't want to understand in a week from now said letitia she will understand everything perfectly for i shall be able to talk with her oh archie do be agreeable can't you see that i'm having great fun don't be such a greedy boy if you could only enter into the spirit of the thing you wouldn't be so oppressed by the food question oh dear how important it does seem to be to men jada hur gammal är ni the maiden sullenly left the room and i felt convinced that letitia had swedishly asked her to do so i was wrong hur gammal är ni letitia explained simply meant how old are you she evidently didn't want to tell me was my wife's comment as we went to the drawing-room i imagine dear that she doesn't quite like the idea of my ferreting out swedish so persistently but i intend to persevere the worst of conversation books is that one acquires a language in such a parody way now in my book the only answer to the question how old are you is i was born on the tenth of august eighteen fifty two for the life of me i couldn't vary that and it would be most embarrassing it would make me fifty-two if any one asked me in swedish how old i was i should have to be fifty-two when i think of my five advertisements i said lugubriously as i threw myself into an armchair fatigued at my efforts to discover dinner when i remember our expectation and the pleasant anticipations of to-day i feel very bitter letitia just to think that from it all nothing has resulted but that beastly mummy that atrocious ossified thing archie archie said my wife warningly please be calm perhaps i was too engrossed with my studies to note the deficiencies of dinner but do remember that i pleaded with her for a swedish meal the poor thing did what i asked her to do our dinner was evidently swedish it was not her fault that i asked for it to-morrow dear it shall be different 
we had better stick to the american regime it is more satisfactory to you at any rate we have somebody in the house and if our five advertisements had brought forth five hundred applicants we should only have kept one so don't torture yourself archie try and imagine that we had five hundred applicants and that we selected jada liberi i can't letitia i said sulkily and i heaved a heavy sigh come she said soothingly come and study swedish with me it will be most useful for your lives of great men you can read up the swedes in the original i'll entertain you with this book and you'll forget all about mrs potts i mean jada liberi by the by archie she doesn't remind me so much of hedda gabler i don't fancy that she is very subtile you letitia i retorted remind me of mrs nickleby you ramble on so letitia looked offended she always declared that dickens got on her nerves she was one of the new-fashioned readers who have learned to despise dickens personally i regretted only his nauseating sense of humour letitia placed a cushion behind my head smoothed my forehead kissed me made her peace and settled down by my side lack of nourishment made me drowsy and letitia's babblings sounded vague and muffled it is a most inclusive little book she said and if i can succeed in memorizing it all i shall be quite at home with the language in fact dear i think i shall always keep swedish cooks hark at this if the wind be favorable we shall be at gothenburg in forty hours om vinden är god so är vi på fyrtio timmar i göteborg i think it's sweetly pretty you are seasick steward bring me a glass of brandy and water we are now entering the harbor we are now anchoring your passports gentlemen a comfortable lethargy was stealing over me letitia took a pencil and paper and made notes as she plied the book a chapter on seeing a town is most interesting archie of course it must be a swedish town do you know the two private galleries of mr smith the merchant and mr muller the chancellor to-morrow morning i wish to see all the public buildings and statues statyerna is swedish for statues archie are you listening dear we will visit the church of the holy ghost at two then we will make an excursion on lake mälarn and see the fortress of vaxholm it is a charming little book don't you think that it is a great improvement on the old ollendorf system i don't find nonsensical sentences like the hat of my aunt's sister is blue but the nose of my brother-in-law's sister-in-law is red i rose and stretched myself letitia was still plunged in the irritating guide to sweden where i vowed i would never go nothing on earth should ever induce me to visit sweden if it came to a choice between hoboken and stockholm i mentally determined to select the former as i paced the room i heard a curious splashing noise in the kitchen letitia's studies must have dulled her ears she was evidently too deeply engrossed i strolled nonchalantly into the hall and proceeded deliberately toward the kitchen the thick carpet deadened my footsteps the splashing noise grew louder the kitchen door was closed i gently opened it as i did so a wild scream rent the air there stood jada liber in in my pen declines to write it a simple unsophisticated birthday dress taking an ingenious reluctant bath in the stationary tubs with the plates and dishes and dinner things grouped artistically around her the instant she saw me she modestly seized a dish towel and shouted at the top of her voice the kitchen was filled with the steam from the hot water venus arising looked nebulous and mystic i beat a hasty retreat aghast at the revelation and almost fell against letitia who dropping her conversation book came to see what had happened she is bathing i gasped in the kitchen among the plates near the soup never cried letitia then melodramatically let me pass stand aside archie i'll go and see perhaps perhaps you had better come with me 
Letitia, I gurgled, I'm shocked. She has nothing on but a dish towel. Letitia paused irresolutely for a second, and going into the kitchen, shut the door. The splashing noise ceased. I heard the sound of voices, or rather of a voice, Letitia's. Evidently she had forgotten Swedish, and such remarks as, if the wind be favorable, we shall be at Gothenburg in forty hours. I listened attentively, and could not even hear her say, We will visit the Church of the Holy Ghost at two. It is strange how the stress of circumstances alters the complexion of a conversation book. All the evening she had studied Swedish, and yet suddenly confronted by a Swedish lady bathing in our kitchen, dish-toweled but unashamed, all she could find to say was, How disgusting! And how disgraceful! in English. You see, said Letitia when she emerged, She's just a simple peasant girl, and only need to be told. It is very horrid, of course. And unappetizing, I chimed in. Of course, certainly unappetizing. I couldn't think of anything Swedish to say, but I said several things in English. She was dreadfully sorry that you had seen her, and never contemplated such a possibility. After all, Archie, bathing is not a crime and we were hunting for a clean slate i suggested satirically do you think letitia that she also takes a cold bath in the morning among the bacon and eggs and things that is enough said letitia sternly the episode need not serve as an excuse for indelicacy it was with the advent of gerda lyberg that we became absolutely certain beyond the peradventure of any doubt that there was such a thing as the servant question the knowledge had been gradually wafted in upon us, but it was not until the lady from Stockholm had definitively planted herself in our midst that we admitted to ourselves openly, unblushingly, that the problem existed. Gerda blazoned forth the enigma in all its force and defiance. The remarkable thing about our latest acquisition was the singularly blank slate of her gastronomic mind. There was nothing that she knew most women and a great many men intuitively recognize the physical fact that water at a certain temperature boils miss lyberg apparently seeking to earn her living in the kitchen had no certain views as to when the boiling point was reached rumors seed vaguely to have reached her that things called eggs dropped into water would in the course of time any time and generally less than a week become eatable letitia bought a little egg boiler for her one of those antique arrangements in which the sands of time play to the soft-boiled egg the maiden promptly boiled it with the eggs and undoubtedly thought that the hen in a moment of perturbation or aberration had laid it i say thought because it's the only term i can use it is perhaps inappropriate in connection with gerda potatoes subjected to the action of hot water grow soft she was certain of that whether she tested them with a poker or with her hands or feet we never knew i inclined to the last suggestion the situation was quite marvellous here was an alleged worker in a particular field asking the wages of skilled labour and densely ignorant of every detail connected with her task it seemed unique carpenters plumbers bricklayers seamstresses dressmakers laundresses all the sowers and reapers in the little garden of our daily needs were forced by the inexorable law of competition to possess some inkling of the significance of their undertakings with a cook it was different she could step jubilantly into any kitchen without the slightest idea of what she was expected to do there if she knew that water was wet and that fire was hot she felt amply primed to demand a salary Impelled by her craving for Swedish literature, Letitia struggled with Miss Lyberg. Compared with the Swede, my exquisitely ignorant wife was a culinary queen. She was an Epicurean caterer. Letitia's slate-pencil coffee was ambrosia for the gods. Sweet is nectar by the side of the dish-water that cook prepared. I began to feel quite proud of her. She grew to be an adept in the art of boiling water. If we could have lived on that fluid, everything would have moved clockworkily. 
i have discovered one thing said letitia on the evening of the third day the girl is just a peasant probably a worker in the fields that is why she is so ignorant i thought this reasoning foolish even peasants eat my dear i muttered she must have seen somebody cook something field workers have good appetites if this woman ever ate what did she eat and why can't we have the same we have asked her for no luxuries we have arrived at the stage my poor girl when all we need is prosaically to fill up you have given her opportunities to offer us samples of peasant food the result has been nil it is odd letitia declared a wrinkle of perplexity appearing in the smooth surface of her forehead of course she says she doesn't understand me and yet archie i have talked to her in pure swedish i suppose you said pray give me a piece of venison from the conversation book don't be ridiculous archie i know the swedish for cauliflower green peas spinach a leg of mutton mustard roast meat soup and if the wind be favorable we shall be at gothenburg in forty hours i interrupted she was silent and i went on it seems a pity to end your studies in swedish letitia but fascinating though they be they do not really necessitate our keeping this barbarian you can always pursue them and exercise on me i don't mind even with an american cook if such a being exist you could still continue to ask for venison steak in swedish and to look forward to arriving at gothenburg in forty hours letitia declined to argue my mood was that known as cranky we were in the drawing-room after what we were compelled to call dinner it had consisted of steak burned to cinders potatoes soaked to a pulp and a rice pudding that looked like a poultice the morning after and possibly tasted like one letitia had been shopping and was therefore unable to supervise our delicate repast was capped by black coffee of an indefinite straw color and with globules of grease on the surface people who can feel elated with the joy of living after a dinner of this description are assuredly both mentally and morally lacking men and women there are who will say oh give me anything i am not particular so long as it is plain and wholesome i have met many of these people my experience of them is that they are the greatest gluttons on earth with veritably voracious appetites and that the best isn't good enough for them to be sure at a pinch they will demolish a score of potatoes if there be nothing else but offer them caviar canvas back duck quail and nestle road pudding and they will look askance at food that is plain and wholesome the plain and wholesome liver is a snare and a delusion like the bluff and genial visitor whose geniality veils all sorts of satire and merciless comment letitia and i both felt weak and miserable we had made up our minds not to dine out we were resolved to keep the home up even if in return the home kept us down give in we wouldn't our fighting blood was up we firmly determined not to degenerate into that clammy american institution the boarding-house feeder and the restaurant diner we knew the type in the feminine it sits at table with its bonnet on and a sullen gnawing expression of animal hunger in the masculine it puts its own knife in the butter and uses a toothpick no cook no lack of cook should drive us to these abysmal depths letitia made no feint at ovid i simply declined to breathe the breath of the lives of great men she read a sweet little classic called the table how to buy food how to cook it and how to serve it by alessandro filippini a delightful table d'hote name i lay back in my chair and frowned waiting until letitia chose to break the silence as she was a most chattily inclined person on all occasions i reasoned that i should not have to wait long i was right archie said she according to this book there is no place in the civilized world that contains so large a number of so-called high livers as new york city 
which was educated by the famous Delmonico and his able lieutenants. Great heaven! I exclaimed with a groan. Why rub it in, Letitia? I should also say that no city in the world contains so large a number of low livers. Westward the course of empire sways, she read, and the great glory of the past has departed from those centers where the culinary art at one time defied all rivals. The scepter of supremacy has passed into the hands of the metropolis of the new world. What sickening can't, I cried what fiendishly exaggerated restaurant talk there are perhaps fifty fine restaurants in new york in paris there are five hundred finer here we have places to eat in there they have artistic resorts to dine in one can dine anywhere in paris in new york save for those fifty fine restaurants one feeds don't read any more of your cookbook to me my girl it is written to catch the American trade with a subtile pen of flattery. Try to be patriotic, dear, she said soothingly. Of course I know you wouldn't allow a Frenchman to say all that, and that you are just talking cussedly with your own wife. Her ring at the bell caused a diversion. We hailed it. We were in the humor to hail anything. The domestic hearth was most trying. We were bored to death. I sprang up and ran to the door, a little pastime to which I was growing accustomed. Three tittering young women, each wearing a hat in which roses, violets, poppies, cornflowers, forget-me-nots, feathers and ribbons ran riot, confronted me. "'Miss Jada Libay said the foremost, who wore a bright red gown, and from whose hat six spiteful poppies lurched forward and almost hit me in the face. For a moment, dazed from the cookbook, I was nonplussed. All I could say was, No, meaning that I wasn't Miss Yada Libay. I felt so sure that I wasn't, that I was about to close the door. She lives here, I believe, asserted the damsel again, shooting forth the poppies. I came to myself with an effort. She is the, the cook, I muttered weakly. We are her friends quoth the damsel, an indignant inflection in her voice. Kindly let us in. We've come to the Thursday sociable. The three bedizened ladies entered without further parley, and went toward the kitchen, instinctively recognizing its direction. I was amazed. I heard a noisy greeting, a peal of laughter, a confusion of tongues, and then I groped my way back to Letitia. They have come to the Thursday sociable, I cried. Who? she asked in astonishment, and I imparted to her the full extent of my knowledge. Letitia took it very nicely. She had always heard, she said, in fact Mrs. Archer had told her, that Thursday nights were festival occasions with the sweets. She thought it rather a pleasant and convivial notion. Servants must enjoy themselves after all better a happy gathering of girls than a rowdy collection of men letitia thought the idea felicitous she had no objections to giving privileges to a cook nor had i for the matter of that i ventured to remark however that jada didn't seem to be a cook then let us call her a girl said letitia jada is a girl only because she isn't a boy i remarked tauntingly if by girl you even mean servant, then Gerda isn't a girl. Goodness knows what she is. Hello, another ring. This time Miss Lee by herself went to the door, and we listened. More arrivals for the sociable. Four Swedish guests, all equally gaily attired in flower hats. Some of them wore bangles, the noise of which in the hall sounded like an infuriation of sleigh bells. They were Christina and Sophie and Sadie and Alexandra, as we soon learnt. It was wonderful how welcome Gerda made them, and how quickly they were at home. They rustled through the halls, chatting and laughing and humming. Such merry girls, such light-hearted little charmers. Letitia stood looking at them through the crack of the drawing-room door. Perhaps it was just as well that somebody should have a good time in our house. Just the same, Letitia, I observed, galled. 
i think i should say to-morrow that this invasion is most impertinent most uncalled for yes archie said letitia demurely you think you should say it but please don't think i shall for i assure you that i shan't i suppose that we must discharge her she can't do anything and she doesn't want to learn i don't blame her she can always get the wages she asks by doing nothing you would pursue a similar policy archie if it were possible everybody would but all other laborers must know how to labor i was glad to hear letitia echoing my sentiments she was quite unconsciously plagiarizing once again she took up the cookbook the sound of merrymaking in the kitchen drifted in upon us from what we could gather gerda seemed to be dressing up for the delectation of her guests shrieks of laughter and clapping of hands made us wince my nerves were on edge had any one at that moment dared to suggest that there was even a suspicion of humor in these proceedings i should have slain him without compunction letitia was less irate and tried to comfort me letitia sighed and shut up the cookbook eggs a la reine seemed as difficult as trigonometry or conic sections or differential calculus and much more expensive certainly the eight giggling cooks in the kitchen now at the very height of their exhilaration worried themselves little about such concoctions my nerves again began to play pranks the devilish pandemonium infuriated me letitia was tired and wanted to go to bed i was tired and hungry and disillusioned it was close upon midnight and the swedish thursday was about over i thought it unwise to allow them even an initial minute of friday when the clock struck twelve i marched majestically to the kitchen threw open the door revealed the octet in the enjoyment of a mound of ice cream and a mountain of cake that in my famished condition made my mouth water and announced in a severe yet subdued tone that the revel must cease you must go at once i said i am going to shut up the house then i withdrew and waited there was a delay during which a babel of tongues was let loose and then miss lieberg's seven guests were heard noisily leaving the house two minutes later there was a knock at our door and miss lieberg appeared her eyes blazing her face flushed and the expression of the hunted antelope defiantly asserting that it would never be brought to bay on her perspiring features you've insulted my guests she cried in english as good as my own i've had to turn them out of the house and i've had about enough of this place letitia's face was a psychological study amazement consternation humiliation all seemed determined to possess her here was the obtuse swede for whose dear sake she had dallied with the intricacies of the language of stockholm furiously familiar with the admirable english the dense dumb scandinavian the lady of the mino understand rejoined her apparently had the gift of tongues letitia trembled rarely have i seen her so thoroughly perturbed yet seemingly she was unwilling to credit the testimony of her own ears for with sudden energy she confronted miss lieberg and exclaimed imperiously in swedish that was either pure or impure tig god in veg ah come off cried the handmaiden insolently i understand english i haven't been in this country fifteen years for nothing it's just on account of folks like you that poor hard-working girls who ain't allowed to take no baths or entertain no lady friends have to protect themselves pretend not to understand them says i i found it work before this if they think you don't understand em they let you alone and stop worrying it is like your impidence to turn my lady friends out of this flat it's like your impidence i'll letitia's crestfallen look following upon her perturbation completely upset me a wave of indignation swamped me i advanced and in another minute miss jada lieberg would have found herself in the hall impelled there by a persuasive hand upon her shoulder however it was not to be 
you just lay a hand on me she said with cold deliberation and a smile and i'll have you arrested for assault oh i know the law i haven't been in this country fifteen years for nothing the law looks after poor weak swedish girls just push me out it's all i ask just you'd push me out she edged up to me defiantly my blood boiled i would have mortgaged the prospects of my lives of great men not that they were worth mortgaging for the exquisite satisfaction of confounding this abominable woman then i saw the peril of the situation i thought of horrid headliners in the papers author charged with abusing servant girl or arrest of archibald fairfax on serious charge and my mood changed i understood you all the time continued miss lieberg insultingly i listened to you i knew what you thought of me now i am telling you what i think of you the idea of turning out my lady friends on a thursday night too and me a slaving for them and a bathing for them and a treating them to ice cream and cake and in me own kitchen you ain't no lady as for you i seem to be her particular pet when i sees a man around the house all the time a molly coddling and a fussing i says to myself he ain't much good if he can't trust the women folk alone we stood there like dummies listening to the tirade what could we do to be sure there were two of us and we were in our own house the antagonist however was a servant not in her own house the situation for reasons that it is impossible to define was hers she knew it too we allowed her full sway because we couldn't help it the sympathy of the public in case of violent measures would not have been on our side the poor domestic oppressed and enslaved would have appealed to any jury of married men living luxuriously in cheap boarding-houses when she left us as she did when she was completely ready to do so letitia began to cry the sight of her tears unnerved me and i checked a most unfeeling remark that i intended to make to the effect that if the wind be favourable we shall be at gothenburg in forty hours it's not that i mind her insolence she sobbed we were going to send her off anyway weren't we but it's so humiliating to be done we've been done here have i been working hard at swedish writing exercises learning verbs studying proverbs just to talk to a woman who speaks english as well as i do it's it's so so more mortifying never mind dear i said drying her tears for her the swedish will come in handy some day no she declared vehemently don't say that you'll take me to sweden i wouldn't go to the hateful country it's a hideous language anyway isn't it archie it's a nasty laconic ugly tongue you heard me say tig to her just now tig means be silent could anything sound more repulsive tig tig ugh letitia stamped her foot she was exceeding wroth End of Wanted a Cook by Alan Dale Read by Lars Rolander Section 12 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenevere. Similar Cases by Charlotte Perkins Gilman There was once a little animal, no bigger than a fox, and on five toes he scampered over tertiary rocks. They called him Eohippus, and they called him very small, and they thought him of no value when they thought of him at all. For the lumpish old Dinoceros and Corypheidon so slow were the heavy aristocracy in days of long ago. Said the little Eohippus, 
I am going to be a horse, and on my middle finger-nails to run my earthly course. I'm going to have a flowing tail, I'm going to have a mane, I'm going to stand fourteen hands high on the psychozoic plain. The Corypheton was horrified, the Dinoceros was shocked, and they chased young Eohippus, but he skipped away and mocked. Then they laughed enormous laughter, and they groaned enormous groans, and they bade young Eohippus go view his father's bones, said they. You always were as small and mean as now we see, and that's conclusive evidence that you're always going to be. What? Be a great tall handsome beast with hoofs to gallop on? Why, you'd have to change your nature, said the Luxolophodon. They considered him disposed of, and retired with gait serene. That was the way they argued in the early Eocene. There was once an anthropoidal ape far smarter than the rest, and everything that they could do he always did the best. So they naturally disliked him, and they gave him shoulders cool, and when they had to mention him they said he was a fool. Cried this pretentious ape one day, I'm going to be a man, and stand upright and hunt and fight, and conquer all I can. I'm going to cut down forest trees to make my houses higher. I'm going to kill the mastodon. I'm going to make a fire." Loud screamed the anthropoidal apes, with laughter wild and gay. They tried to catch that boastful one, but he always got away. So they yelled at him in chorus, which he minded not a whit, and they pelted him with coconuts which didn't seem to hit. And then they gave him reasons, which they thought of much avail, to prove how his preposterous attempt was sure to fail. Said the sages, in the first place the thing cannot be done, and second, if it could be, it would not be any fun. And third, and most conclusive, and admitting no reply, you would have to change your nature. We should like to see you try. They chuckled then triumphantly, these lean and hairy shapes, for these things passed as arguments with the anthropoidal apes. There was once a Neolithic man, an enterprising white, who made his chopping implements unusually bright. Unusually clever he, unusually brave, and he drew delightful mammoths on the borders of his cave. To his Neolithic neighbors, who were startled and surprised, said he, My friends, in course of time we shall be civilized. We are going to live in cities, we are going to fight in wars, we are going to eat three times a day without the natural cause. We are going to turn life upside down about a thing called gold. We are going to want the earth and take as much as we can hold. We are going to wear great piles of stuff outside our proper skins. We are going to have diseases and accomplishments and sins. Then they all rose up in fury against their boastful friend, for prehistoric patience cometh quickly to an end, said one. This is chimeral, utopian, absurd, said another, what a stupid life, too dull upon a word, cried all, before such things can come, you idiotic child, you must alter human nature, and they all sat back and smiled, thought they, an answer to that last, it will be hard to find, it was a clinching argument to the Neolithic mind. End of Similar Cases Section 13 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. Read by Dennis Smith the Old Maid's House in Plan by Elizabeth Stuart Phelps Corona had five hundred dollars and some pluck for her enterprise. She also had at her command a trifle for furnishing, but that seemed very small capital. Her friends at large discouraged her generously. Even Tom said he didn't know about that and offered her three hundred more. This manly offer she declined in a womanly manner. It is to be my house, thank you, Tom, dear. 
I can live in yours at home. Corona's architectural library was small. She found on the top shelf one book on the construction of chicken roosts, a pamphlet in explanation of the kindergarten system, a cookbook that belonged to her grandmother, and a treatise on crochet. There her domestic literature came to an end. She accordingly bought a book entitled North American Homes. Then, having in addition begged or borrowed everything within two covers relating to architecture that was to be found in her immediate circle of acquaintance, she plunged into that unfamiliar science with hopeful zeal. The result of her studies was a mixed one. It was necessary, it seemed, to construct the North American home in so many contradictory methods, or else fail forever of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that Corona felt herself to be laboring under a chronic aberration of mind. Then the plans. Well, the plans, it must be confessed, Corona did find it difficult to understand. She always had found it difficult to understand such things. But then she had hoped several weeks of close architectural study would shed light upon the density of the subject. She grew quite morbid about it. She counted the steps when she went upstairs to bed at night. She estimated the bedroom post when she walked in the cold gray dawn. But the most perplexing thing about the plans was how one story ever got upon another. Corona's imagination never fully grappled with this fact, although her intellect accepted it. She took her books downstairs one night, and Susie came and looked them over. Why, these houses are all one story, said Susie. Besides, they're nothing but lines anyway. I shouldn't draw a house so. Corona laughed with some embarrassment and no effort at enlightenment. She was not used to finding herself and Susie so nearly on the same intellectual level as in this instance. She merely asked, How should you draw it? Why so, said Susie, after some severe thought. So she took her little blunt lead pencil that the baby had chewed and drew her plan as follows. Susie's plan. Roof, guest rooms, guest room, closet for bedding, our room, parlor, front door, dining room, kitchen L, nursery and your room behind. Corona made no comment upon this plan except to ask Susie if that were the way to spell L, and then to look in the dictionary and find it was not spelled at all. Tom came in and asked to see what they were doing. I'm helping Corona, said Susie with much complacency. These architect's things don't look any more like houses than they do like the first proposition in Euclid, and the poor girl is puzzled. I'll help you tomorrow, Co, said Tom, who was in too much of a hurry to glance at his wife's plan. But tomorrow Tom went into town by the early train, and when Corona emerged from her North American homes with wild eye and knotted brow at five o'clock p.m., she found Susie crying over a telegram which ran, called to California immediately. Those lost cargoes A number one hides turned up. Can't get home to say goodbye. Send overcoat and flannels by Simpson on Midnight Express. Gone four weeks. Love to all. Tom. This unexpected event threw Corona entirely upon her own resources, and after a few days more of patient research, she put on her hat and stole away at dusk to a builder she knew of downtown, a nice, fatherly man who had once built a piazza for Tom and had just been elected superintendent of the Sunday school. These combined facts gave Corona confidence to trust her case to his hands. She carried a neat little plan of her own with her, the result of several days' hard labor. Susie's plan she had taken the precaution to cut into paper dolls for the baby. Corona found the good man at home and in her most businesslike manner presented her points. "'Got any plan in your own head?' asked the builder, hearing her in silence. In silence Corona laid before him the paper which had cost her so much toil. "'Well,' said the builder, after a silence, "'well, I've seen worse.' "'Thank you,' said Corona faintly. "'How does she set?' asked the builder. "'Who set?' said Corona a little wildly. "'She could think of nothing that set but hens.' Why, the house, where's the points of compass? I hadn't thought of those, said Corona. And the chimney, suggested the builder. Where's your chimneys? 
I didn't put in any chimneys, said Corona. Where did you count on your stairs? pursued the builder. Stairs? I forgot the stairs. That's natural, said Mr. Timbers. Had a plan brought me once without an entry or a window to it. It wasn't a woman did it, neither. It was a widower in the newspaper line. What's your scale? Scale? asked Corona without animation. Scale of feet, proportions. Oh, I didn't have any scales, but I thought about forty feet front would do. I have but five hundred dollars. A small house must answer. The builder smiled. He said he would show her some plans. He took a book from his table and opened at a plate representing a small, snug cottage, not uncomely. It stood in a flourishing apple orchard, and a much larger house appeared dimly in the distance, upon a hill. The cottage was what is called a story and half, and contained six rooms. The plan was drawn with the beauty of science. There, said Mr. Timbers, I know a lady built one of those upon her brother-in-law's land. He give her the land, and she just put up the cottage, and they was all as pleasant as peas about it. That's about what I'd recommend to you, if you don't object to the name of it. What is the matter with the name? asked Corona. Why, said the builder, hesitating, it is called the old maid's house in the book. Mr. Timbers, said Corona, with decision, why should we seek further than the truth? I will have that house. Pray draw me the plan at once. End of The Old Maid's House in Plan by Elizabeth Stuart Phelps Section 14 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robin Distics by John Hay Number 1. Wisely, a woman prefers to a lover a man who neglects her. This one may love her some day. Some day the lover will not. Number 2. There are three species of creatures who, when they seem coming, are going, and when they seem going, they come. Diplomats, women, and crabs. Number three. Pleasures too hastily tasted grow sweeter in fond recollection, as the pomegranate plucked green ripens far over the sea. Number four. As the meek beasts in the garden came flocking for Adam to name them, men for a title today crawl to the feet of a king. Number five. What is a first love worth? except to prepare for a second. What does the second love bring? Only regret for the first. Number six. Health was wooed by the Romans in groves of the laurel and myrtle. Happy and long are the lives brightened by glory and love. Number seven. Wine is like rain. When it falls on the mire, it but makes it the fouler. But when it strikes the good soil, wakes it to beauty and bloom. Number eight. Break not the rose. Its fragrance and beauty are surely sufficient. Resting contented with these, never a thorn shall you feel. Number nine. When you break up housekeeping, you learn the extent of your treasures. Till he begins to reform, no one can number his sins. Number ten. Maidens, why should you worry in choosing whom you shall marry? Choose whom you may, you will find you have got somebody else. Number 11. Unto each man comes a day when his favorite sins all forsake him, and he complacently thinks he has forsaken his sins. Number 12. Be not too anxious to gain your next-door neighbor's approval. Live your own life, and let him strive your approval to gain. Number 13. Who would succeed in the world should be wise in the use of his pronouns. Utter the you twenty times where you once utter the I. Number 14. 
the best loved man or maid in the town would perish with anguish could they hear all that their friends say in the course of a day number fifteen true luck consists not in holding the best of the cards at the table luckiest he who knows just when to rise and go home number sixteen pleasant enough it is to hear the world speak of your virtues but in your secret heart tis of your faults you are proud number seventeen try not to beat back the current yet be not drowned in its waters speak with the speech of the world think with the thoughts of the few number eighteen make all good men your well-wishers and then in the years steady sifting some of them turn into friends friends are the sunshine of life end of distics recording by robin in Norman, Oklahoma. Section 15 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Therese. The Quarrel by S. E. Kaiser. There are quite as good fish in the sea as any one ever has caught, said he. But few of the fish in the sea will bite at such bait as you've got, said she. Today he is gray and his lines put away, but he often looks back with regret. She's still in the sea, and how happy she'd be if he were a fisherman yet. End of The Quarrel by S. E. Kaiser Recording by Maria Therese. Section 16 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Dennis Sayers. A Letter from Mr. Biggs by E. W. Howe My dear sir, occasionally a gem occurs to me which I am unable to favor you with because of late we are not much together. Appreciating the keen delight with which you have been kind enough to receive my philosophy, I take the liberty of sending herewith a number of ideas which may please and benefit you, and which I have divided into paragraphs with headings. Happiness. I have observed that happiness and brains seldom go together. The pin-headed woman, who regards her thin-witted husband as the greatest man in the world, is happy, and much good may it do her. In such cases, Ignorance is a positive blessing, for good sense would cause the woman to realize her distressed condition. A man who can think he is as good as anybody is happy. The fact may be notorious that the man is not so good as anybody until he is as industrious, as educated, and as refined as anybody but he has not brains enough to know this, and, content with conceit, is happy. A man with a brain large enough to understand mankind is always wretched and ashamed of himself. REPUTATION Reputation is not always desirable. The only thing I have ever heard said in Twin Mounds concerning Smoky Hill, is that good hired girls may be had there. Women 1. Most women seem to love for no other reason than that it is expected of them. 2. I know too much about women 
to honor them more than they deserve. In fact, I know all about them. I visited a place once where doctors are made, and saw them cut up one. 3. A woman loses her power when she allows a man to find out all there is to her. I mean by this that familiarity breeds contempt. I knew a young man once who worked beside a woman in an office, and he never married. 4. If men would only tell what they actually know about women, instead of what they believe or hear, they would receive more credit for chastity than is now the case, for they deserve more. Lack of Self-Confidence As a people, we lack self-confidence. The country is full of men that will readily talk you to death privately, who would run away in alarm if asked to preside at a public meeting. In my alliance movement, I often have trouble in getting out a crowd. Every farmer in the neighborhood feeling of so much importance as to fear that if he attends, he will be called upon to say something in dispute. In some communities where I have lived, the women were mean to their husbands. In others, the husbands were mean to their wives. It is usually the case that the friends of a wife believe her husband to be a brute, and the friends of the husband believe the wife to possess no other talent than to make him miserable. You can't tell how it is. The evidence is divided. Man. There is only one grade of men. They are all contemptible. The judge may seem to be a superior creature, so long as he keeps at a distance, for I have never known one who was not constantly trying to look wise and grave. But when you know him, you find there is nothing remarkable about him except a plug hat, a respectable coat, and a great deal of vanity, induced by the servility of those who expect favors. Opportunity. You hear a great many persons regretting lack of opportunity. If every man had opportunity for his desires, this would be a nation of murderers and disgraced women. Expectation Always be ready for that which you do not expect. Nothing that you expect ever happens. You have perhaps observed that when you are waiting for a visitor at the front door, he comes in at the back and surprises you. Women's work. A woman's work is never done, as the almanacs state, for the reason that she does not go about it in time to finish it. The greatest of these is charity. If you cannot resist the low impulse to talk about people, say only what you actually know, instead of what you have heard. And while you are about it, stop and consider whether you are not in need of charity yourself. Neighbors Every man overestimates his neighbors, because he does not know them so well as he knows himself. A sensible man despises himself, because he knows what a contemptible creature he is. I despite little bigs, but I happen to know that his neighbors are just as bad. Virtue Men are virtuous because the women are. Women are virtuous from necessity. Ashamed of the truth I believe I never knew anyone who was not ashamed of the truth. 
did you ever notice that a railroad company numbers its cars from one thousand instead of from one knowing only one of them we are sometimes unable to understand why a pretty little woman marries a fellow we know to be worthless uh, but the fellow who knows the woman better than we do considers that he has thrown himself away we know the fellow but we do not know the woman an apology i detest an apology the world is full of people who are always making trouble and apologizing for it if a man respects me he will not give himself occasion for apology an offense cannot be wiped out in that way if it could we would substitute apologies for hangings i hope you will never apologize to me i should regard it as evidence that you have wronged me oldest inhabitants the people of smoky hill are only fit for oldest inhabitants in thirty or forty years from now there will be a great demand for reminiscences of the pioneer days i recommend that they preserve extensive data for the only period in their lives when they can hope to attract attention be good enough sir to regard me as of old your friend l biggs to ned westlock twin mounds end of section 16 Section 17 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kenneth Sargent Gagan. Mrs. Johnson by William Deans Howell. It was on the morning of the lovely New England May that we left the horse car, and, spreading our umbrellas, walked down the street to our new home in Charlesbridge, through a storm of snow and rain so finely blent by the influences of this fortunate climate that no flake knew itself from its sister drop, or could be better identified by the people against whom they beat in unison. A vernal gale from the east fanned our cheeks and pierced our marrow and chilled our blood, while the raw, cold green of the adventurous grass on the borders of the sopping sidewalks gave, as it peered through its veil of melting snow and freezing rain, a peculiar cheerfulness to the landscape. Here and there in the vacant lots abandoned hoop skirts defied decay, and near the half-finished wooden houses, empty mortar beds, and bits of lath and slate strewn over the scarred and mutilated ground added their interest to the scene this heavenly weather which the pilgrim fathers with the idea of turning their thoughts effectively from earthly pleasures came so far to discover continued with slight amelioration throughout the month of may and far into june and it was a matter of constant amazement with one who had known less austere climates, to behold how vegetable life struggled with the hostile skies, and in an atmosphere of chill and damp, as that of a cellar, shot forth the buds and blossoms upon the pear trees, called out the sour Puritan courage of the currant bushes, taught a reckless native grapevine to wander and wanton over the southern side of the fence, and decked the banks with violets as fearless and as fragile as New England girls, so that about the end of June, when the heavens relented and the sun blazed out at last, there was little for him to do but to redden and darken the daring fruits that had attained almost their full growth without his countenance. Then, indeed, Charlesbridge appeared to us as a kind of paradise, the wind blew all day from the southwest, and 
and all day in the grove across the way the orioles sang to their nestlings. The house was almost new and in perfect repair, and, better than all, the kitchen has yet to give no signs of unrest in those volcanic agencies which are constantly at work there, and which, with sudden explosions, make Herculeums and Pompeys of so many smiling households. Breakfast, dinner, and tea came up with elusive regularity, and were all the most perfect of their kind. Oh, and we laughed and feasted in our vain security. We had out from the city to banquet with us the friends we loved, and we were expressly proud before them of the help, who first wrought miracles of cookery in our honor, and then appeared in a clean white apron and the glossiest black hair to wait upon the table. She was young, certainly very pretty. She was as gay as a lark, and and was courted by a young man whose clothes would have been a credit if they had not been a reproach to our lowly basement. She joyfully assented to the idea of staying with us until she married. In fact, there was much that was extremely pleasant about the little place when the warm weather came, and it was not wonderful to us that Jenny was willing to remain. It was very quiet. We called one another to the window if a large dog went by our door, and whole days passed without the movement of any wheels but the butchers upon our street, which flourished in ragweed and buttercups and daisies, and in the autumn burned, like the borders of nearly all the streets in Charlesbridge, with the pallid azure flame of the succory. The neighborhood was, in all things, a frontier between city and country. The horse cars, the type of civilization full of imposture, discomfort, and sublime possibility, as we yet possess, went by the head of our street, and might perhaps be available to one skilled in calculating the movements of comets, while two minutes' walk would take us into a wood so wild and thick that no roof was visible through the trees. We learned, like innocent pastoral people of the Golden Age, to know the several voices of the cows pastured in the vacant lots, and, like engine drivers of the Iron Age, to distinguish the different whistles of the locomotives passing on the neighboring railroad. We played a little at gardening, of course, and planted tomatoes, which the chickens seemed to like, for they ate them up as fast as they ripened, and we watched with pride the growth of our Lawton blackberries, which, after attaining the most stalwart proportions, were still as bitter as the scrubbiest of their savage brethren, and which, when by advice left on the vines for a week after they turned black, were silently gorged by secret and gluttonous flocks of robins and orioles. As for our grapes, the frost cut them off in their hour of triumph. So, as I have hinted, we were not surprised that Jenny should be willing to remain with us. We were as little prepared for her desertion as for any other change in our mortal state. But one day in September she came to her nominal mistress with tears in her beautiful eyes and protestations of unexampled devotion upon her tongue, and said that she was afraid she must leave us. She liked the place, and she never had work for anyone that was more of a lady. But she said she made up her mind to go into the city. All this, so far, was quite in the manner of domestics who, in ghost stories, give warning to the occupants of a haunted house. And Jenny's mistress listened in suspense for the motives of her desertion, expecting to hear no less than it was something which walked up and down stairs and dragged iron links after it, or something that came and groaned at the front door like populace dissatisfied with a political candidate. But it was, in fact, nothing of this kind. Simply, there were no lamps upon our street, and Jenny, after spending Sunday evening with her friends in East Charlesbridge, was always alarmed on her return in walking from the horse cart to our door. The case was hopeless, and Jenny and her household parted with respect and regret we had not before this thought it a grave disadvantage that our street was unlighted. 
Our street was not drained or graded, nor municipal cart ever came to carry away our ashes. There was not a water butt within half a mile to save us from fire, nor more than one ten-thousandth part of a policeman to protect us from theft. Yet, as I paid a heavy tax, I somehow felt that we enjoyed the benefits of city government, and never looked upon Charles Bridge as in any way undesirable for residence. But when it became necessary to find help in Jenny's place, the frosty welcome given to the application at the intelligence office renewed a painful doubt awakened by her departure. To be sure, the heads of the offices were polite enough, but when the young housekeeper stated her case at the first to which she applied, and the intelligentsier had called out to the invisible expectants in the adjoining room, "'Anyone wants to do general housework in Charles Bridge? There came from the maids, evoked so loud, so fierce, so full a uh, no, as shook the lady's heart with an indescribable shame and dread. The name that, with an innocent pride in its literary and historical associations, she had written at the heads of her letters, was suddenly becoming a matter of reproach to her, and she was almost tempted to conceal thereafter that she lived in Charlesbridge and to pretend that she dwelt upon some wretched little street in Boston. You see, said the head of the office, the gals don't like to live so far away from the city. Now, if it was only in the port, this pen is not graphic enough to give the remote reader an idea of the affront offered to an inhabitant of old Charlesbridge in these closing words. Neither am I of sufficient tragic mood to report here all the sufferings undergone by an unhappy family in finding servants, or to tell how the winter was passed with miserable makeshifts. Alas, it is not the history of a thousand experiences, and any one who looks upon this page could match it with a tale as full of heartbreak and disaster, while I conceived that, in hastening to speak of Mrs. Johnson. I approach a subject of unique interest, I say, our last Irish girl went with the last snow, and on one of those midsummer-like days that sometimes fall in early April, to our yet bleak and desolate zone, our hearts sang of Africa and golden joys. A Libyan longing took us, and would have chosen, if we could, to bear a strand of grotesque beads or a handful of brazen gouds, and traffic them for some stable made with crisp locks whom, uncoffling from the captive train beside the desert, we should make do with our own general housework forever, through the right of lawful purchase. But we knew that this was impossible, and that, if we desired colored help, we must seek it in the intelligence office, which is in one of those streets, cheerfully inhabited by the orphaned children and grandchildren of slavery. To tell the truth, these orphans do not seem to grieve much for their bereavement, but lead a life of joyous and rather indolent oblivion in their quarter of the city. They are often seen to be sauntering up and down the street by which the Charlesbridge cars arrive, the young with a harmless swagger and the old with a generic limp which our autocrat has already noted as attending advanced years in their race. How gaily are the young ladies of this race attired, as they trip up and down the sidewalks, and in and out through the pendant garments at the shop doors. They are the black pansies and marigold and dark-blooded dahlias among womankind. They try to assume something of our colder race's demeanor, but even the passer on the horse car can see that it is not native with them, and is better pleased when they forget us and ungenteelly laugh and accountering friends, letting their white teeth glitter through their generous lips that open to their ears. In the streets branching upward from this avenue, very little colored men and maids play with broken or enfeebled toys, or sport on the wooden pavement of the entrances to the inner courts. Now and then a colored soldier or a sailor looking strange in his uniform even after the custom of several years emerges from those passages, or, more rarely, a black gentleman, stricken in years and cased in shining broadcloth, 
walked solidly down the brick sidewalk, cane in hand, a vision of serene self-complacency, and so plainly the expression of virtuous public sentiment that the great colored louts, innocent enough till then in their idleness, are taken with a sudden sense of depravity, and loaf guilty up against the house walls. At the same moment, perhaps, a young damsel, amorously scuffling with an admirer, through one of the low open windows, suspends the strife and bids him, Go along now, do. More rarely yet than the gentleman described, one may see a white girl among the dark neighbors, whose frowsy head is uncovered and whose sleeves are rolled up to her elbows, and who, though no doubt quite at home, looks as strange there as that pale anomaly which may sometimes be seen among a crew of blackbirds, an air not so much of decay as of unthrift, and yet hardly of unthrift seems to prevail in the neighborhood, which has none of the aggressive and impudent squalor of an Irish quarter, and none of the surly wickedness of a low American street, a gaiety not born of things that bring a serious joy to the true New England heart, a ragged gaiety which comes of summer in the blood and not in the pocket or the conscience, and which affects the countenance and the whole demeanor, setting the feet to some inward music, and at times bursting into a line of song, or a childlike and irresponsible laugh, gives tones to the visible life, wakens a very friendly spirit in the passer, who sometimes thinks there of a milder climate, and is half persuaded that the orange peel on the sidewalks come from fruit grown in the soft atmosphere of those back courts. It was in this quarter, then, that we heard of Mrs. Johnson, and it was from a colored boarding house that she came out to Charlesbridge to look at us, bringing her daughter of twelve years with her. She was a matron of mature age and portly figure, with a complexion like coffee stewed with the finest rich cream. Her manners were so full of a certain tranquility and grace that she charmed away our will to ask for references. It was only her barbaric laughter and lawless eye that betrayed how slightly her New England birth and breeding covered her ancestral traits and bridged the gulf of a thousand years of civilization that lay between her race and ours. But in fact, she was doubly estranged by descent, for, as we learned later, a sylvan wildness mixed with that of the desert in her veins. Her grandfather was an Indian, and her ancestors on this side had probably sold their lands for the same value and trinkets that brought the original African pair on their other side. The first day that Mrs. Johnson descended into our kitchen, she conjured from the malicious disorder in which it had been left by the fleeting Irish cabal a dinner that revealed the inspirations of genius and was quite different from a dinner of mere routine and laborious talent. Something original and authentic mingled with the accustomed flavors, and though vague reminiscence of canal-boat travel and woodland camps arose from the relish of certain of the dishes, there was yet the assurance of such power in the preparation of the whole that we knew her to be merely running over the cords of our appetite with preliminary savors. As a musician acquaints his touch with the keys of an unfamiliar piano before breaking into brilliant and triumph execution. Within a week she had mastered her instrument, and thereafter there was no faulting in her performance, which she varied constantly, through inspiration or from suggestion. But after all, it was in puddings that Mrs. Johnson chiefly excelled. She was one of those cooks, rare as men of genius and literature who loved their own dishes, and she had, in her personally childlike simplicity of taste, and in the inherited appetites of her savage forefathers, a dominant passion for sweets. So far as we could learn, she subsisted principally upon pudding and tea. Through the same primitive instincts, no doubt, she loved praise. She openly exulted in our artless flatteries of her skill. She waited jealously at the head of the kitchen stairs to hear what we said of her work, especially if there were guests, and she was never too weary to attempt enterprises of cookery. While engaged in this, she wore a species of handkerchief-like turban upon her head, 
and about her person those mystical swathings which old ladies of the African race delight. But she most pleasured our sense of beauty and moral fitness when, after the last pan was washed and the last pot was scraped, she lighted a potent pipe and, taking her stand at the kitchen door, laden the soft evening air with its pungent odors. If we surprised her at these supreme moments, she took the pipe from her lips and put it behind her with a low, mellow chuckle and a look of half-defiant consciousness, never guessing that none of her merits took us half as so much as the cheerful vice which she only feigned to conceal. Some things she could not do so perfectly, as cooking because of her failing eyesight, and we persuaded her that spectacles would both become and befriend a lady of her age. And so we bought her a pair of steel-bowed glasses. She wore them in some great emergencies at first, but had clearly no pride in them. For she laid them aside altogether, and they had passed from our thoughts. When one day we heard her mellow note of laughter and her daughter's harsher crackle outside our door, and opening it, beheld Mrs. Johnson in gold-bowed spectacles of massive frame. We then learned that their purchase was in fulfillment of a vow made long ago in the lifetime of Mr. Johnson that if ever she wore glasses, they should be gold bow. And I hope the manes of the dead were as happy in these vaught of spectacles as the simple soul that offered them. She and her late partner were the parents of eleven children, some of whom were dead, and some of whom were wanderers in the unknown parts. During his lifetime she had kept a little shop in her native town, and it was only within a few years that she had gone into service. She cherished a natural haughtiness of spirit and resented control, although disposed to do all she could of her own notion. Being told to stay when she wanted an afternoon, she explained that when she wanted an afternoon she always took it without asking, but always planned so as not to discommode the ladies with whom she lived. There, she said, had number twenty-seven within three years, which made us doubt the success of her system in all cases, though she merely held out fact as an insurance of her faith in the future, and a proof of the ease with which places are to be found. She contended, moreover, that a lady who had for thirty years had a house of her own, was in no wise bound to ask permission to receive visits from friends where she might be living, but that they ought to freely come and go like other guests. In this spirit, she once invited her son-in-law, Professor Jones of Providence, to dine with her and her defied mistress. On entering the dining room, found the professor at pudding and tea. There, an impressively respectable figure in black clothes, with a black face rendered yet more effective by a pair of green goggles. It appeared that this dark professor was a light of phenology in Rhode Island, and that he was believed to have uncommon virtue in his science by reason of being blind as well as black. I am loath to confess that Mrs. Johnson had not a flattering opinion of the Caucasian race in all respects. In fact, she had very good philosophical and scriptural reasons for looking upon us as an upstart people of new blood, who had come into their whiteness by no credible or pleasant process. The late Mr. Johnson, who died in the West Indies, whether he voyaged for his health and quality of cook upon a downy schooner, was a man of letters, and had written a book to show the superiority of the black over the white branches of the human family. In this he held that, as all islands have been at their discovery, found people by blacks, we must believe that humanity was first created of that color. Mrs. Johnson could not show us her husband's work. A sole copy in the library of an English gentleman at port of prince is not to be bought for money. But she often developed its arguments to the lady of the house. And one day, with a great show of reluctance, and many protests that no personal sight was meant, 
let fall the fact that Mr. Johnson believed the white race descended from Giaz, the leper, upon whom the leprosy of Nanman fell when the latter returned by divine favor to his original blackness. And he went out from his presence a leper as white as snow, said Mrs. Johnson, quoting irrefutable scripture. Leprosy, leprosy, she added thoughtfully. Nothing but leprosy bleached you out. It seems to me much in her praise that she did not exalt in our taint and degradation, as some white philosophers used to do in the opposite idea, that a part of the human family were cursed to lasting blackness and slavery, but even told us of a remarkable approach to whiteness in many of her own offspring. In a kindred spirit of charity, no doubt, she refused ever to attend church with people of her elder and wholesome blood. When she went to church, she said, she always went to a white church. Though while with us, I am bound to say she never went to any. She professed to read her Bible in her bedroom on Sundays, but we suspect from certain sounds and odors which used to steal out of this sanctuary that her piety was more commonly found expression in dozing and smoking. I would not make a wanton jest here of Mrs. Johnson's anxiety to claim honor for the African color, while denying this color in many of her own family. It afforded a glimpse of the pain which all her people must endure. However proudly they hide it, or light heartily forget it, from the despised and contumely to which they are guiltlessly born. And when I thought how irreparable was this disgrace and calamity of a black skin, and how irreparable it must be for ages yet, in this world where every other shame and all manner of willful guilt and wickedness may hope for convert and pardon, I had little heart to laugh. Indeed, it was so pathetic to hear this poor old soul talk of her dead and lost ones, and try, in spite of all of Mr. Johnson's theories and her own arrogant generalizations, to establish their whiteness, that we must have been very cruel and silly people to turn her sacred fables even into matter of question. I have no doubt that her Antoinette Anastasia and her Thomas and Jefferson Wilberforce, it is impossible to give a full idea of the splendor and scope of the baptismal names in Mrs. Johnson's family, have as light skins and as golden hair in heaven as her reverend maternal fancy painted for them in our world. There, certainly, they would not be subject to tanning, which had ruined the delicate complexion and had knotted into black woolly tangles that once wavy blonde locks of our little maid servant Naomi. And I would fain believe that Washington Johnson, who ran away to sea so many years ago, has found some fortunate zone where his hair and skin kept the same sunny and rosy tints they wore to his mother's eyes in infancy. But I have no means of knowing this, or of telling whether he was the prodigy of intellect that he was declared to be. Naomi could no more be taken in proof of the one assertion than the other. When she came to us, it was agreed that she should go to school. But she overruled her mother in this in an evening else and never went except Sunday school lessons. She had no other instruction than that her mistress gave her in the evenings. When a heavy day's play and the natural influences of the hour conspired with original causes to render her powerless before words of one syllable, the first week of her services, she was obedient and faithful to her duties, but relaxing in the atmosphere of a house which seemed to demoralize all menials. She shortly fell into disorderly ways of lying and wait for callers out of doors, and when people rang, of running up the front steps and letting them in from the outside. As the season expanded and the fine weather became confirmed, she modified even this form of service and spent her time in the field, peering at the house only when nature importunately craved molasses. In her untamed disobedience, Naomi alone betrayed her sylvan blood, for she was in all other respects Negro, and not Indian, but it was of her aboriginal ancestry that Mrs. Johnson chiefly boasted. 
or not engaged in argument to maintain the superiority of the African race, she loved to descend upon it as the cause and explanation of her own arrogant habit of feeling, and she seemed to have indeed to have inherited something of the Indian's howder, along with the Ethiopic supple cunning and abundant amability. She gave many instances in which her pride had met and overcome the insolence of employers, and the kindly old creature was by no means singular in her pride of being proud. She could never have been a woman of strong logical faculty, but she had in some things a very surprising and awful astuteness. She seldom introduced any purpose directly, but bore all about it, and then suddenly sprung it upon her unprepared antagonist. At other times, she obscurely hinted at reason, and left a conclusion to be inferred, as when she warded off reproach for some delinquency by saying, in a general way, that she had lived with ladies who used to come scolding into the kitchen after they had taken their bitters. Quality ladies took their bitters regularly, she added, to remove any sting of personality from her remark, for many things she had let fall. We knew that she did not regard us as quality. On the contrary, she often tried to overbear us with the gentility of her former places, and would tell the lady over whom she reigned that she had lived with folks worth three or four hundred thousand dollars, who never complained as she did of the ironing. Yet she had a sufficient regard for the literary occupations of the family, Mr. Johnson having been an author. She even professed to have herself written a book which was still in manuscript and preserved somewhere among her best clothes. It was well, on many accounts, to be in contact with a mind so original and suggestive as Mrs. Johnson's. We loved to trace its intricate yet often transparent operations, and were perhaps too fond of explaining its peculiarities by facts of ancestry, of finding hints of the powwow or the grand custom in each grotesque development. We were conscious of something warmer in this old soul than in ourselves, and something wilder, and we chose to think it the tropic and the untracked forest she had scarcely been apart from her affection. She had no morality, but was good because she neither hated nor envied, and she might have been a saint for more easily than far more civilized persons. There was that also in her sinuous yet malleable nature, so full of guile and so full of goodness, that remind us pleasantly of a lowly folks in elder lands, where relaxing oppressions have lifted the restraints of fear between master and servant. Without disturbing the familiarity of their relation, she advised freely with us upon all household matters, and took a motherly interest in whatever concerned us. She could be flattered or caressed into almost any service, but no threat or command could move her. When she erred, she never acknowledged her wrong in words, but handsomely expressed her regrets in a pudding, or sent up her apologies in a favorite secretly prepared dish. We grew so well used to this form of exculpation that whatever Mrs. Johnson took an afternoon at an inconvenient season, we knew that for a week afterwards we should be feasted like princes. She owned frankly that she loved us, that she never had done half so much for people before, and that she had never been nearly so well suited in any other place. And for a brief and happy time, we thought that we never should part. One day, however... Our dividing destiny appeared in the basement, and was presented to us as Hippolito Thucydides, the son of Mrs. Johnson, who had just arrived on a visit to his mother from the state of New Hampshire. He was a heavy and loudish youth, standing upon the borders of boyhood, and looking forward to the future with a vacant and listless eye. I mean this was his figurative attitude, his actual manner, as he lolled upon a chair beside the kitchen window, was so eccentric that we felt a little uncertain how to regard him. 
and Mrs. Johnson openly described him as peculiar. He was so deeply tanned by the fervid suns of the New Hampshire winter, and his hair had so far suffered from the example of the sheep lately under his charge, that he could not be classed by any stretch of comparison with the blonde and straight-haired members of Mrs. Johnson's family. He remained with us all the first day until late in the afternoon, when his mother took him out to get him a boarding house. Then he departed in the van of her and Naomi, pausing at the gate to collect his spirits, and after he had sufficiently animated himself by clapping his palms together, starting off down the street at a hand gallop to the manifest terror of the cows in the pasture and the confusion of the less demonstrative people of our household, other characteristic trait appeared in Hippolito Thucydides within not very long period of time, and he ran away from his lodgings so often during the summer that he might be said to board among the outlying cornfields and turnip patches of Charlesbridge. As a check upon his habit, Mrs. Johnson seems to have invited him to spend his whole time in our basement, for wherever we went below we found him there, balanced perhaps in homage to us, and perhaps as a token of extreme sensibility in himself, upon the low window sill, the bottom of his boots touching the floor inside, and his face buried in the glass without we could formulate no very tenable objection to all this, and yet the presence of solicities in our kitchen unaccountably oppressed our imagination. We beheld him all over the house, a monstrous eidolon, balanced upon every window sill, and he certainly attracted unpleasant notice to our place, no less by his furtive and hang-dog manner of arrival then by the bold displays with which he celebrated his departures. We hinted this to Mrs. Johnson, but she could not enter into our feeling. Indeed, all the wild poetry of her material and primitive nature seemed to cast itself upon this hapless boy, and if we had listened to her, we should have believed there was no one so agreeable in society, or so quick-witted in affairs as Hippolito, when he chose. At last, when we said positively that Thucydides should come to us no more, then qualified the prohibition by allowing him to come every Sunday, she answered that she could never hurt the child's feelings by telling him not to come where his mother was, that people who did not love her children did not love her, and that if Hippy went, she went. We thought it was a master stroke of firmness to rejoin that Hippolito must go in any event, but I am sound to own that he did not go, and that his mother stayed and so fed us with every cunning propitiatory dainty that we must have been pagans to renew our threat. In fact, we begged Mrs. Johnson to go into the country with us, and she, after long relaxation on Hippie's account, consented, agreeing to send him away to friends during her absence. We made every preparation, and on the eve of our departure, Mrs. Johnson went into the city to engage her son's passage to Bancor, while we waited her return in untroubled security. But she did not appear till midnight, and then responded with a sad, Well, sir, the cheerful, Well, Mrs. Johnson, that greeted her, All right, Mrs. Johnson. Mrs. Johnson made a strange noise half chuckle and half death rattle in her throat. All wrong, sir. If he's off again, and I've been all over the city after him. Then you can't go with us in the morning? How can I, sir? Mrs. Johnson went sadly out of the room. Then she came back to the door again, and opening it, uttered, for the first time in our service, words of apology and regret. I hope I hadn't put you out any. I wanted to go with you, but I ought to knowed I couldn't. All is, I love you too much. The End Mrs. Johnson by William Dean Howells Recording by Kenneth Sargent Gagan
Section 18 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Rees. Pass by Iron Quill. A father said unto his hopeful son, Who was Leonidas, my cherished one? The boy replied with words of ardent nature. He was a member of the legislature. How? asked the parent. Then the youngster saith, He got a pass, and held her like grim death. Whose pass? What pass? the anxious father cried. Twas their monopoly, the boy replied. In deference to the public, we must state, that boy has been an orphan since that date. End of Pass Recording by Matthew Rees, Davenport, Iowa Section 19 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joe Mabry. Teaching by Example by John G. Sachs. What does the poet's license say? asked rose lipped Anna of a poet. Now give me an example, pray, that when I see one I may know it. Quick as a flash he plants a kiss where perfect kisses always fall. Nay, sir, what liberty is this? The poet's license, that is all. End of Teaching by Example Recording by Joe Mabry at www.ievoice.com Section 20 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times. Section 20. When Albany Sang by William Henry Drummond. Was working away on the farm there one morning not long ago, fixing defense for winter, cause that's where we got the snow. When Jeremy Pluff, my neighbor, Come over and speak with me. Antoine, you will come on the city. For here, Madame Albany. What you mean? I was saying right off me. Some woman was making the speech. Or girl on the hoorah circus. Doing high kick and screech. No, none he is speaking. Excuse me. That's be Madame Albany. Was living down here on the country. Two mile not aside at Chambly. She just coming over from England. On steamboat arrived Quebec, singing on Lana and Parry, as heaven, big Tom, I expect. But no matter the much she enjoy it, for travel all round the world, something on the heart bring her back here, for she was the Chambly girl. She never do nothing but singing and making the big grand tour, and travel on summer and winter, so must be the first class for sure. Everybody, I'm thinking, was know her and I also hear not a thing. She's friend on Lorraine, Victoria, and showed her the way to sing. Well, I say, you're sure she is Chambly, what you call Madame Albany? Don't know me that name on the canton. I hope you're not fool with me. And he say, La Jeunesse, they was call her, before she is come Marie. But she is taking the name of her husband, I suppose, that's the only way. C'est bon, mon ami, I was said to me, if I get through defense next day, and she don't want too much on the money, then maybe I see her play. So I finished that job on tomorrow. Jeremy, he was helping me too, and I say, lend me three dollars quickly for making the voyage with you. Correct. So we are starting next morning, and arrive Montreal all right. By dollar ticket on the bureau, and pass on the hall that night. Big crowd wall, 
I bet you was dare too, all dress on some fancy dress. Dear lady, I don't say nothing, but man's all white shirt and no vest. Don't matter, when bande be ready, de foreman struck out with his stick, and fiddle and everything else too began for play up de musique. It's funny thing, too, they was playing. Don't like it meself at all. I'd rather be listen some jig, me, or what you call after de ball. And I'm not feeling very surprised, then, when the crowd holler up, encore, for make all dem feller commencing and try little piece some more. Twas a better one, too, I be thinking, but slow like you're going to die. All the same, nobody say nothing. That mean day was satisfy. After that come de grand piano, like we got on Chambly Hotel. She's nice looking girl was played at, so of course she's go off pretty well. Den feller he's run out and sing some. It's all about some very fine moon, that shine on canal every night too. I'm sorry I don't know de tune. Next thing I commence get excite me for I don't see no great madame yet. Too bad I was lost all that money, and too late for the raffle take hat. One just as I feel very sorry, for come all the way from Chambly. Jeremy, he was whisper, tiens, tiens, prenez garde, she's coming, madame, Aubrey. Everybody seemed glad when they see her, come walking right down the platform, and way they make noise on the hand in why it's just like the big thunderstorm i'll never see nothin like that me no matter i travel the world and madam you think it was scare her none she laugh like de chambly girl there was young feller coming behind her walk nice come in cavalier and before albany she is ready and piano gets starting to play de feller commence with his singing more stronger than all the rest i think he's got very bad manner no nothing at all politesse madam i suppose she get madden and before anybody can speak she settled right down for mixing too and pretty soon catch him up quick then she skip it on gainin and gainin till the song it is to fini and when she is beaten that feller begosh I am proud Chambly. I'm not very sorry at all, me, when de feller was running away, and man he's coming out with de piccolo, and start him right off for play. For it's kin de music, I be fancy. Jeremy, he is like it also. And one de best thing on that evening is man with de piccolo. Then maybe ten minute is passing. Madame, she is coming encore. This time all alone on the platform, that feller don't show up no more. And when she start off on the singing, Jeremy say, Antoine das Francais. This give us more pleasure, I told you, cause we're pure Canadien. That song I will never forget me. Twas song of the little bird, when he's fly from his nest on the treetop, for the rest of the world get stirred. Madame, she was told us about it, then start off so quiet and low, and sing like the bird on the morning, the poor little small is so. I remember one time I be sleeping just under some big pine tree, and song of the robin wake me, but robin he don't see me. There's nothing for scaring that bird there. He's feel all alone in the world. Well, madame, she must listen like that too when she was the chambly girl cause how could she sing that nice chanson the same as the bird i was here till i see it the maple and pine tree and richelieu running near again i'm the little feller like young colt upon the spring that's just on the way i was feel me when madame albanis is sing and after the song it is finish and crowd is make noise with its hand i suppose they be thinking i'm crazy that maybe i don't understand cause i'm set on the chair very quiet meself and poor jeremy 
and I see that his eyes, it was cry too, just same way it go with me. There's a rose bush outside on our garden. Every spring it has got new nests. But only one bluebird is billed there. I know her from all the rest. And no matter de far she be flyin' away on de winter tom, back to her own little rose bush she's coming there just de same. We're not de big place on our canton, maybe coal on de winter too, but de heart's canayan on our body, and that's warm enough for true. And when Albany was got lonesome for travel all round de world, I hope she'll come home like de bluebird and again be de chambly girl. Footnote 1 from The Habitant and Other French-Canadian Poems by William Henry Drummond Copyright 1897 by G. P. Putnam's Sons End of Section 20《セクション21 of the Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joe Mabry。Colonel Sterrett's Panther Hunt by Alfred Henry Lewis。Panthers what we all calls mountain lions, observed the old cattleman, wearing meanwhile the sapient air of him who feels equipped of his subject, is plenty furtive, not to say mighty said youless to skulk. That's why a gent don't meet up with more of em while pirootin' about in the hills. Them cats hears em, or they sees em, and him still ignorant thereof, and with that they bashfully withdraws which it's to be urged in favor of mountain lions that they never forces themselves on no chint. They're sure considerate that away, and special of themselves. If one's ever hurt, you can bet it won't be a accident. However, it ain't for me to go around impugning the motives of no mountain lion, particular when the entire tribe is strangers to me complete. But still, a love of truth compels me to concede that if mountain lions ain't cowardly, they're sure cautious a lot. Cattle and calves they passes up as two bellicose, and none of em ever faces any animal more warlike than a baby colt or maybe a half-grown deer. I'm riding along the caliente once when I hears a crashin' in the bushes on the bluff above. Two hundred foot high she is, and as sheer as the walls of this year tavern. As I lifts my eyes, I fear frenzied mare and colt comes charging up and projects themselves over the precipice and lands in the valley below. They're dead as Julius Caesar when I rides onto em while a brace of mountain lions is skirting up and down the edge of the bluff they leaps from, mewing and lashing their long tails in hot enthusiasm. Sure, the cats has been chasing the mare and foal, and they locos em to that extent they don't know where they're heading, and makes the death jump I relates. I bangs away with my six shooter, but beyond giving the mountain lions a convulsive start, I can't say I does any execution. They turn and goes streaking it through the pine woods like a drunkard to a barn raisin. Timid? Sure. They're that timid, seminary girls compared to em is as sternly courageous as a passel of buccaneers. Out in Mitchell's Canyon, a couple of the Lee Scott riders cuts the trail of a mountain lion and her two kittens. Now, whatever do you all reckon this old tabby does? Basely deserts her offsprings without even bearing a tooth, and the cowpunchers take some gently by their tails and beats out their juvenile brains. That's straight. That mother lion goes swarming up the canyon like she ain't got a minute to live, and you can gamble the limit that where a animal sees its children perish without fronting up for war, it don't possess the commonest rudiments of sand. Such, son, is mountain lions. It's one evening in the red light when Colonel Sterrett, who's got through his day's toil on that coyote paper he's editor of, unfolds concerning a panther roundup which he pulls off in his youth. This panther hunt, says Colonel Sterrett, as he fills his third tumbler, 
occurs when mighty likely I'm going on seventeen winters. I'm a leader among my young companions at the time. In fact, I allers is. And I'm proud to say that my supremacy that away is due to the dominant character of my intellects. I'm ever bright and sparkling as a child, and I recalls how my aptitude for learning promotes me to be regarded as the smartest lad in my set. If thar's visitors to the school, or if the selectman invades that academy to sort of size us up, the teacher allers plays me on em. I'd go to the front for the outfit, which I am wont on such harrowing occasions to recite a ode, the teacher's done wrote it himself, and which is entitled Napoleon's Mad Career. Thar's twenty-four stanzas to it, and while these interloping selectmen sets thar looking owly and sagacious, I'd wallop loose with the twenty-four verses, stampin' up and down, and accompanying said recitations with such a multitude of reckless gestures, it comes plenty close to backin' everybody plumb out in the room. Here's the first verse. I drinkin', swarin', roarin', tarin', fallin' down in the mud, while the earth for forty miles about is kivered with my blood. You all can see from that specimen that our schoolmaster ain't simply flirtin' with the muses when he originates that epic. No, sir, he means business, and whenever I throws it into the select men, I does it justice. The trustees used to silently line out for home when I finishes, and never a yeep. It stuns em. It sure fills em to the brim. As I gaze his rar word, goes on the colonel, as by one rapt impulse he uplifts both his eyes and his nose paint. As I gaze his rarward, I says, on them sunfield days, and special if ever I gets betrayed into talking about him, I can hardly tire myself from the subject. I explains heretofore that not only by inclination but by birth I'm a sure enough aristocrat. This captaincy of local fashion I assumes at a tender age. I wears the record as the first child to don shoes throughout the entire summer in that neighborhood, and many a time and oft does my youthful but envy-eaten compeers lambaste me for the insultant innovation. But I sticks to my moccasins, and today shoes in the blue grass is almost as universal as the liquor habit. Thar dawns a hour, however, when my position in the van of Kentucky ton comes within a ace of being seriously shook. It's on my way to school one dewy morning when I gets involved all inadvertent in an unhappy rupture with a polecat. I never does know how the misunderstanding starts. After all, the seeds of said dispute is by no means important. It's enough to say that Polecat finally has me thoroughly convinced. Following the difference in my defeat, I'm witless enough to keep going on to school, whereas I should have returned homeward and cast myself upon my parents as a sacred trust. Of course, when I'm in school, I don't go imparting my troubles to the other chillin'. I emulates the heroism of the Spartan boy who stands to be eat by a fox and keeps him to myself. But the views of my late enemy is not to be smothered. They appeals to my young companions, who thereupon puts up a most unneedful riot of coffins and sneezins. But nobody knows me as the party who's so pungent. It's a trying moment. I can see that, once I'm located, I'm going to be as unpopular as a bar in a hog pen. I'll come tumbling from my pinnacle in that proud community as the glass of fashion and the mold of form. You can go your bottom peso. The thought causes me to feel plenty perturbed. At this peril I has an inspiration, as good, too, as I ever entertains without the aid of rum. I determines to cast the opprobrium on some other boy and send the hunt of general indignation sweeping along his trail. Thar's a innocent infant who's a student at this temple of childish learning, and his name is Riley Bark. This Riley is one of them giant children who's only twelve and weighs three hundred pounds. And in proportions as Riley is a son of Anak, physical, 
He's dwarfed mental. He ain't half as well upholstered with brains as a shepherd dog. That's right. Riley's intellects is like a fly in a saucer of syrup. They struggles round plumb slow. I decides to uplift Riley to the public eye as the felon who's disturbing that seminary's serenity. Coming to this decision, I pints at him where he's planted four seats ahead, all tangled up in a spelling book, and says in a loud whisper to a child who's sitting next, Throw him out! That's enough. No gent will ever realize how easy it is to direct a people's sentiment until he takes a whirl at the game. In two minutes by the teacher's bull's-eye copper watch, every soul knows it's poor Riley, and in three the teacher's done drug Riley outdoors by the horror of his head and chased him home. Gents, I look back on that youthful feat as a triumph of diplomacy. It sure saved my standing as the Beau Brummel of the bluegrass. Good old days, them, observes the colonel mournfully, and one's never to come again. My sternest studies is romances, and the perusals of old tales as I tells you all prior fills me full of moss and mockingbirds in equal parts. I read steep of Walter Scott and waxes to be a sharp on Moslem's special. I dreams of the siege of Acre and Richard the Lionheart, and I simply can't sleep nights for honin to hold a tournament and joust a whole lot for some fair lady's love. Once I commits the error of my career by joustin' with my brother Jeff. This year Jeff is sittin' on the bank of the branch fishin' for bull pouts at the time, and Jeff don't know I'm hoverin' near at all. Jeff's ridiculous fond of fishin', which he'd sooner fish than read Paradise Lost. I'm romancin' along, similarly bent, when I notes Jeff perched on the bank. To my boyish imagination, Jeff at once turns to be a pay -nim. I drops my bait box, couches my fish pole, and emitting the impromptu war cry, charges him. It's the work of a moment. Jeff's unhossed and falls into the branch. But thar's bitterness to follow victory. Jeff emerges like Diana from the bath and frails the wamus off me with a club. Talk of putting a crimp in, folks. Chance when Jeff's wrath is assuaged, I'm all on one side like the leaning tower of Pisa. Jeff actually confers a scoogee to my spinal column. A week later, my folks takes me to a doctor. That practitioner puts on his specs and looks me over with jealous care. Whatever's wrong with him, Doc, says my father. Nothing, says the physician. Only your son William's five inches out of plumb. Then he rigs a contraption made up of guy ropes and stay laths, and I has to wear it, and maybe in three or four weeks or so he's got me warped back into the perpendicular. But how about this cat hunt? asked Dan Boggs, which I don't aim to be intrusive none, but I'm camped year through the second drink waiting for it, and these procrastinations is making me kind of batty. That panther hunt is like this, says the colonel, turning to Dan. At the age of seventeen, me and eight or nine of my intimate brave comrades founds what we all denominates as the Chevy Chase Hunting Club. Each of us maintains a passel of odds and ends of dogs, and at stated intervals we convenes on hosses, and with these fourscore curs at our tails goes yelling and scallyhooting up and down the countryside, allowing we're sure a band of nimrods. The Chevy Chasers ain't been and been as an institution over long when chance opens a gate to serious work. The deep snows in the eastern mountains, it looks like, has done drove a panther into our neighborhood. You could hear of him on all sides. Folks glimpses him now and then. They allows he's about the size of a yearling calf, and the way he pulls down such feeble people as sheep or lays desolate some hapless hen roost don't bother him a bit. This panther spreads a horror over the county. Dances, prior meetings, and even poker parties is broken up, and the social life of that region begins to bog down. Even a wedding suffers, the bridemaid staying away lest this ferocious monster should show up in the road and chaw one of them while she's en route for the scene of trouble. That's gospel truth. The poor deserted bride has to heal and handle herself and never a friend to unite her sobs with hers during that wedding ordeal. 
the old ladies present shakes their heads a heap solemn it's a worse augury says one than the hoots of a score of squinch owls when this reign of terror is at its height the local eye is rolled appealingly toward us chevy chasers we rises to the opportunity day after day we're riding the hills and vales reading the milk-white snow for tracks and we has success one morning i comes up on two of the breckenridge boys and five more of the chevy chasers settin on their hosses at the skinner crossroads bob crittenton has gone to turn me out they says then they pinched down to a handful of close-wove brush and stunted timber and allows that this maraudin catamount is hidin thar they sees him go skulkin in gents i ain't above admittin that the news puts my heart to a canter i'm brave but conflicts with wild and savage beasts is to me a novelty and while i faces my fate without a flutter i'm yer to say i'd sooner be in, in pursuit of minks or raccoons or some varmint whose grievous capabilities i can more accurately stack up and in whose merry ways i'm better versed however the dauntless blood of my grandsire mounts in my cheek and as if the shade of that old trojan is thar personal to suggest it i searches forth a flask and renews my spirit thus qualified for perils come in what form they may i resolutely stands my hand thar's forty dogs if thar's one in our company as we pauses at the skinner crossroads and when the crittenden youth returns he brings with him the ricket boys and forty added dogs which it's worth a ten mile ride to get a glimpse of that outfit of canines thar's every sort under the canopy thar's the stolid hound the alert fice the sapient collie that is thar's individual beasts wherein the hound or fice or collie seems to predominate as a strain the truth is thar's not that dog a whining about our hosses fetlocks who ain't proudly descended from fifteen different tribes and they surely makes a motley mass meetin still they're good zealous dogs and as they're goin to go forward and take most of the risks of that panther it seems invidious to criticize em one of the twitty boys rides down and puts the eighty or more dogs into the brush the rest of us lays back and strains our eyes thar he is a shout goes up as we descries the panther stealing off by a far corner he's headin along a hollow that's full of brush and baby timber and runs parallel with the pike big and yaller he is we can tell from the slight flash we gets of him as he darts into a second clump of bushes with a cry what young crittenden calls a view halloo we go stampedin down the pike in pursuit our dogs is stanch they sure does themselves proud singin in twenty keys reachin from growls to yelps and from yelps to shrillest screams they pushes dauntlessly on the fresh trail of their terrified quarry now and then we gets a squint of the panther as he skulks from one copse to another just ahead which he's goin like a arrow no mistake as for us chevy chasers we parallels the hunt and continues poundin the skinner turnpike abreast of the pack ever and anon givin a encouragin shout as we briefly sights our game gents says colonel sterrett as he again refreshes himself it's needless to go over that hunt in detail we hustles the flyin demon full eighteen miles our faithful dogs crowdin close and breathless at his coward heels still they don't catch up with him he streaks it like some saffron meteor only once does we approach within striking distance that's when he crosses at old stafford's whiskey still as he glides into view crittenden shouts thar he goes for myself i'm prepared i've got one of these misguided cap and ball six shooters that's built during the war and i cuts that hardware loose this weapon seems a born profligate of lead for the six chambers goes off together which you should have seen the chevy chasers dodge and well they may that broadside ain't in vain my aim is so true that one of the rarmost dogs evolves a howl and rolls over then he sets up gnawing and licking his off hind leg in frantic alternations that hunt is done for him we leaves him doctoring himself and picks him up two hours later on our triumphant return 
as i states we harries that fugitive panther for eighteen miles and in our hot ardor founders two hosses fatigue and weariness begins to overpower us also our prey weakens along with the rest in the half glimpses we now and again gets of him it's plain that both pace and distance is tellin fast still he presses on and as thar's no spur like fear that panther holds his distance but the end comes we've done run em into a rough wild stretch of country where settlements is few and cabins rude of a sudden the panther emerges onto the road and goes rackin along the trail we pushes our spent steeds to the utmost thar's a log house ahead out in the stump field lot in front is a frowsy woman and five small children the panther leaps the rickety worm fence and heads straight as a bullet for the clarin horrors the sight freezes our marrows mad and savage he's due to bite a hunk out in that devoted household mutually callin to each other we goads our horses to the utmost we gain on the panther he may wound but he won't have time to slay that family gents it's a supreme moment the panther makes for the female squatter and her litter we pantin and pressin close behind the panther is among em the woman and the children seems transfixed by the awful spectacle and stands rooted with open eyes and mouths our emotions shore beggars descriptions now ensues a scene to smite the hardiest of us with dismay no sooner does the panther find himself in the midst of that helpless bevy of little ones than he stops turns round abrupt and sets down on his tail and then uplifting his muzzle he busts into shrieks and yells and howls and cries a complete case of dog hysterics that's what he is a great yeller dog his reason is now a rack because we harass him the eighteen miles thar's a ugly outcast of a squatter mattock in hand comes tumbling down the hillside from summers out back of the shanty where he has been grubbing what be you all idiots chasing my dog for demands his unkempt party then he menaces us with the implement we make no retort but stands passive the great orange brute whose nerves has been torn to rags creeps to the squatter and with mournful howls explains what we've made him suffer no thar's nothing further to do and less to be said that cavalcade erstwhile so gala and buoyant drags itself wearily homeward the exhausted dogs in the rar walkin stiff and sore like their legs is wood for more than a mile the complaining howls of the hysterical yeller dog is wafted to our ears then they ceases and we figures his sympathizing master has done took him into the shanty and shut the door no one comments on this adventure not a word is heard each is silent until we mount the big murray hill as we collect ourselves on this eminence one of the breckenridge boys holds up his hand for a halt gents he says as hosses hunters and dogs we all gathers round gents i moves you the chevy chase hunting club year by stands adjourned sine die thar's a moment's pause and then as by one impulse every gent hoss and dog says ay it's unanimous and from that hour till now the chevy chase hunting club ain't been nothing save tradition but that panther shore disappears it's the end of his vandalage and again does quadrilles priors and poker resume their wonted sway that's the end and now gents if black jack will caper to his duties we'll uplift our drooped energies with the usual forty drops end of colonel sterrett's panther hunt recording by joe mabry at www.ievoice.com section 22 of the wit and humor of america volume 1 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kenneth Sargent Gagan. Wouter Van Twiller by Washington Irving. It was in the year of our Lord, 1629, that Meyer, 
Walter von Twiller, was appointed governor of the province of New Netherlands. Under the commission and control of their high mightiness, the Lord States General of the United Netherlands, and the privileged West India Company. This renowned old gentleman arrived at New Amsterdam in the merry month of June, the sweetest month in all the year, when Dan Apollo seems to dance upon the transparent firmament, when the robin, the thrush, and a thousand other wanton songsters make the woods to resound with amorous ditties, and the luxurious little Bob Lincoln revels among the clover blossoms of the meadows, all of which, happy coincidence, persuaded the old dames of New Amsterdam, who were skilled in the art of foretelling events, that this was to be a happy and prosperous administration. The renowned Walter Van Twiller was descended from a long line of Dutch burgomasters, who had successfully dozed away their life and grown fat upon the bench of magistrates in Rotterdam, and who had comported themselves with such singular wisdom and propriety that they were never either heard or talked of, which, next to being universally applauded, should be the object of all magistrates and rulers. There are two opposite ways by which some men make a figure in the world, one by talking faster than they think, and the other by holding their tongues and not thinking at all. By the first, many a smattered acquires the reputation of a man of quick parts. By the other, many a dunderpat, like the owl, the stupidest of birds, comes to be considered the very type of wisdom. This, by the way, is a casual remark, which I would not, for the universe, have it thought I apply to Governor Van Twiller. It is true he was a man shut up within himself, like an oyster, and rarely spoke, except in monosyllables. But then it was allowed he seldom said a foolish thing. So invincible was his gravity that he was never known to laugh, or even to smile, through the whole course of a long and prosperous life. Nay, if a joke were uttered in his presence, that set light-minded hearers in a roar, it was observed to throw him in a state of perplexity. Sometimes he would inquire into the matter, and when, after much explanation, the joke was made as plain as a pike staff, he would continue to smoke his pipe in silence, and at length, knocking out the ashes, would exclaim, Well, I see nothing in all that to laugh about. With all his reflective habits, he never made up his mind on a subject. His adherents accounted for this by the astonishing magnitude of his ideas. He conceived every subject on so grand a scale that he had not room in his head to turn it over and examine both sides of it. Certainly it is that if any matter were propounded to him on which ordinary mortals would rashly determine at a first glance he would put on a vague, mysterious look, shake his capricious head, smoke some time in profound silence, and at length observe that he had his doubts about the matter, which gained him the reputation of a man slow of belief and not easily imposed upon. What is more, it gained him a lasting name, for to this habit of the mind has been attributed his surname of Twiller, which is said to be a corruption of the original twidge filler, or, in plain English, doubter. The person of this illustrious old gentleman was formed and proportioned as though it had been molded by the hands of some cunning Dutch statuary, as a model of majesty and lordly grandeur. He was exactly five feet six inches in height, and six feet five inches in circumference. His head was a perfect sphere, and of such stupendous dimensions that Dame Nature, with all her sex's ingenuity, would have been puzzled to construct a neck capable of supporting it. Wherefore, she wisely declined the attempt, and settled it firmly on top of his backbone, just between the shoulders. 
His body was oblong, and particularly capricious at bottom, which was wisely ordered by Province, seeing that he was a man of sedentary habit, and very adverse to the idle labor of walking. His legs were short, but sturdy in proportion to the weight they had to sustain, so that when erect he had the appearance of a beer barrel on skids. His face, that infallible index of the mind, presented a vast expanse, and furrowed by those lines and angles which disfigure the human countenance with what is termed expression. Two small gray eyes twinkled feebly in the mist like two stars of lesser magnitude in the hazy firmament, and his full-fed cheeks, which seemed to have taken toll on everything that went into his mouth, were curiously mottled and, and streaked with dusty red, like a Spitzenberg apple. His habits were as regular as his person. He daily took his four stated meals, exactly an hour to each he smoked and doubted eight hours, and he slept the remaining twelve of the four and twenty. Such was the renowned Wouter Van Twiller, a true philosopher. For his mind was either elevated above, settled below, the cares and perplexities of this world. He had lived in it for years, without feeling the least curious to know whether the sun revolved around it, or it around the sun. And he had watched for at least half a century, the smoke curling from his pipe to the ceiling, without once troubling his head with any of those numerous theories by which a philosopher would have perplexed his mind in according for its rising above the surrounding atmosphere. In his council he presided with great state and solemnity. He sat in a huge chair of solid oak, hewn in the celebrated forest of the Hague fabricated by an experienced timberman of Amsterdam, and curiously carved about the arms and feet into exact imitations of a gigantic eagle's claws. Instead of a scepter, he swayed a long Turkish pipe, wrought with jasmine and amber, which had been presented to the stateholder of Holland at the conclusion of a treaty with one of those petty Barbary powers. In this stately chair would he sit, and this magnificent pipe would he smoke, shaking his right knee with a constant motion, and fixing his eyes for hours together upon a little print of Amsterdam, which hung in a black frame against the opposite wall of the council chamber. <laughs> Nay, it has been said that with any deliberation of extraordinary length and intricacy was on the carpet, the renowned Walter would shut his eyes for a full two hours at a time, that he might not be disturbed by external objects, and at such times the internal commotion of his mind was evinced by certain regular guttural sounds which his admirers declared were merely the noise of conflict, made by his contending doubts and opinions. It is with infinite difficulty I have been able to collect these biographical anecdotes of the great man under consideration. The facts representing him were so scattered and vague, and divers of them so questionable in point of authenticity, that I had to give up the search after many, and declined the admission of still more, which would have tended to heighten the coloring of his portrait. I have been the more anxious to delineate fully the persons and habits of Walter Van Twiller, from the consideration that he was not only the first, but also the best governor that ever presided over this ancient and respectable province. And so tranquil, benevolent was his reign, that I did not find throughout the whole of it a single instance of any offender being brought to punishment, a most indisputable sign of a merciful governor, and a case unparalleled, excepting in the reign of the illustrious King Log from whom it is hinted the renowned Van Twiller was a lineal descendant. The very outset of the career of this excellent magistrate was distinguished by an example of legal acumen that gave flattering examples of a wise and equitable administration. 
The morning after he had been installed in office, and at the moment that he was making his breakfast from a prodigious earthen dish filled with milk and Indian pudding, he was interrupted by the appearance of Wandel Schoonover, a very important old burgher of New Amsterdam, who complained bitterly of one Barrett Bleeker, inasmuch as he refused to come to a settlement of accounts. Seeing that there was a heavy balance in favor of the said Wandel, Governor Van Twiller, as I have already observed, was a man of few words. He was likewise a mortal enemy to multiplying writings, or being disturbed at his breakfast. Having listened attentively to the statement of Wandel Schoonover, given an occasional grunt as he shoveled a spoonful of Indian pudding into his mouth, either as a sign that he relished the dish, or comprehended the story, and he called unto him his constable, and pulling out of his bridge's pants a huge jackknife, dispatched it at the defendant as a summons, accompanied by his tobacco-box as a warrant. This summary process was as effectual in those simple days, as was the seal-ring of the, of the great Harren Allrest, among the true believers. The two parties being confronted before him, each produced a book of accounts, written in a language and character that would have puzzled any but a high Dutch commentator or a learned decipherer of Egyptian obelisks. The sage Wouter took them one after the other, and having poised them in his hand and attentively counting over the number of leaves, fell straight away into a great doubt and smoked for half an hour without saying a word. At length, laying his finger beside his nose, and shutting his eyes for a moment, with an air of a man who just caught a subtle idea by the tail, he slowly took his pipe from his mouth, puffed forth a column of tobacco smoke, and with marvelous gravity and solemnity pronounced that having carefully counted over the leaves and weighed the book, it was found that one was just as thick and heavy as the other. Therefore, it was the final opinion of the court that the accounts were equally balanced. Therefore, Wandel should give Barrett a receipt, and Barrett should give Wandel a receipt, and the constable should pay the costs. Now this decision, being straightway made known, diffused general joy throughout New Amsterdam for the people immediately perceived that they had a wise and equitable magistrate to rule over them. But its happiest effect was that not another lawsuit took place throughout the whole of his administration, and the office of constable fell into such decay that there was not one of those losel scouts known in the province for many years. I am the more particular in dwelling on this transaction, not only because it deemed it one of the most sage and righteous judgments on record, and well worthy of the attention of modern magistrates, but because it was a miraculous event in the history of the renowned Wouter, being the only time he was ever known to come to a decision in the whole course of his life. End of Wouter Van Twiller by Washington Irving Recording by Kenneth Sargent Gagan Section 23 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kenneth Sargent Gagan. The Experiences of the A.C. By Bayard Taylor. Bridgeport. Change cars for the Naugatuck Railroad, shouted the conductor on the New York and Boston Express train on the evening of May 27, 1858. Mr. Johnson, carpet bag in hand, jumped upon the platform, entered the office, purchased a ticket for Waterbury, and was soon whirling in the Naugatuck train down toward his destination. On reaching Waterbury in the soft spring twilight, Mr. Johnson walked up and down in front of the station, 
curiously scanning the faces of the assembled crowd. Presently he noticed a gentleman who was performing the same operation upon the faces of the alighting passengers. Throwing himself directly in the way of the latter, the two exchanged a steady gaze. Is your name Billings? Is your name Johnson? were simultaneous questions, followed by the simultaneous exclamation, Ned, Enos! And there was a crushing grasp of hands, repeated after a pause, in testimony of ancient friendship. And Mr. Billingsley, returning to practical life, asked, Is that all your baggage? Come, I have a buggy here. Eunice has heard the whistle, and she'll be impatient to welcome you. The impatient of Eunice, Mrs. Billings, of course, was not of long duration. For five minutes thereafter, she stood at the door of her husband's chocolate-colored villa, receiving his friend. J. Edward Johnson was a tall, thin gentleman of forty-five. A year before, some letters signed Foster Kirkup and Company, for Enos Billings, had accidentally revealed to him the whereabouts of the old friend of his youth, with whom we now find him domiciled. Enos, said he, as he stretched out his hand for the third cup of tea, which he had taken only for the purpose of prolonging the pleasant table chat. I wonder which of us is most changed. Why, you, of course, said Mr. Billings, with your brown face and big mustache. Your own brother wouldn't have known you if he had seen you last, as I did, with smooth cheeks and hair of unmerciful length. Why, not even your voice is the same. Oh, that's easily accounted for, replied Mr. Johnson. But in your case, he knows, I am puzzled to find where the difference lies. Your features seem to be so but little changed, now that I can examine them at leisure. Not the same face, but really, I never looked at you for so long a time in those days. I, I beg your pardon, you used to be so, so remarkably shy. Mr. Billings blushed lightly and, and seemed at a loss what to answer. His wife, however, burst into merry laughter, exclaiming, Oh, that was before the days of the A.C. He, catching the infection, laughed also. In fact, Mr. Johnson laughed, but without knowing why. The A.C., said Mr. Billings. Bless me, Eunice. How long has it been since we talked of that summer? I had almost forgotten that there was an A.C. Well, well, the A.C. culminated in 45. You remember something of the Society of North Ridgeport? The last winter you were there, Abel Mallory, for instance. Oh, let me think a moment, said Mr. Johnson reflectively. Really, it seems like looking back a hundred years. Mallory, wasn't that the sentimental young man with wispy hair? tallow skin and the big sweaty hands who used to be bowing Carlyle on the reading evenings at Sheldrake's? Yes, to be sure. And there was Hollins with his clerical face and infidel talk. And Pauline Ringtop, who used to say, The beautiful is the good. Huh. I can still hear her shrill voice saying, What that I were beautiful, would that I be fair. There was a hearty chorus of laughter at poor Miss Ringtop's expense. Oh, it harmed no one, however, for the tarweed was already becoming thick over her Californian grave. Oh, I see, said Mr. Billings. You still remember the absurdities of those days? In fact, I think you partially saw through them, but I was younger and far from being so clear-headed, and I looked upon those evenings at Sheldrake's as being equal at least to the symposia of Plato. Something in Mallory always repelled me. I detested the sight of his thick nose with those flary nostrils and his coarse, half-formed lips of the bluish color of raw corned beef. But I looked upon those feelings as unreasonable prejudice and strove to conquer them, seeing the admiration which he received from others. He was an oracle on the subject of nature, having eaten nothing for two years except graham bread and vegetables without salt and fruits, fresh or dried. He considered himself to have attained an Andalusian purity of health. 
or that he would attain it so soon as two pimples on his left temple should have healed. These pimples he looked upon as a last feeble stand made by the pernicious juices left from the meat he had eaten and the coffee he had drunk. Well, his theory was that through a body so purged and purified, none but true and natural impulses could find access to the soul. Such indeed was the theory we all held. <laughs> Seldrake was a man of more pretense than real cultivation, as I afterwards discovered. He was in good circumstances, and always glad to receive us at his house, and this made him virtually the chief of our tribe, and the outlay for refreshments involved only apples from his own orchard and water from his well. Well, twas in the early part of forty-five, I think in April, when we were all gathered together discussing, as usual, the possibility of leading a life in accordance with nature. Abel Mallory was there, and Hollins, and Miss Ringtop, and Faith Levis with her knitting, and also Eunice Hazelton, a lady whom you have never seen, but you may take my wife as her representative. I wish I could recollect some of the speeches made on that occasion. Abel had but one pimple on his temple. There was a purple spot where the other one had been, and was estimating that in two or three months more he would be a true unspoiled man. <laughs> his complexion, nevertheless, was more clammy and way-like than ever. Yes, said he, I am also an Arcadanian. This false dual existence which I have been leading will soon be merged into the unity of nature. Our lives must conform to her sacred laws. Why can't we strip off those hollow shams? He made great use of that word. And be our true selves, pure, perfect, and divine. Zeldrake, however, turning to his wife, said, Elbury, how many upstairs rooms is there in that house down on the Sound? Four, besides three small ones under the roof. Why, what made you think of that, Jessie? she said. I got an idea. While Abel's been talking, he answered, we've taken a house for the summer down the other side of Bridgeport, right on the water, where there's good fishing and a, a fine view of the Sound. Now there's room enough for all of us, at least all that can make it. Abel, you and Enos and Pauline and Eunice might fix matters so that we could all take the place in partnership and pass summer together, living in a true, beautiful life in the bosom of nature. There we shall be perfectly free and untrampled by the chains which still hang around us in Norwich Port. You know how often we've wanted to be on some island in the Pacific Ocean where we could build up a true society right from the start. Now, here's a chance to try the experiment for a few months, anyhow. Eunice clapped her hands. Yes, you did. And cried out, Splendid, Arcadian. I'll give up my school for the summer. Abel Mallory, of course, did not need to have the proposal repeated. He was ready for anything which promised indolence and the indulgence of his sentimental tastes. I will do the fellow the justice to say that he was not a hypocrite. He firmly believed both in himself and his ideas, especially the former. He pushed both hands through the long wisp of his drab-colored hair and threw his head back until his wide nostrils resembled a double door to his brain. Oh, nature, he said, you have found your lost children. We shall obey your neglected laws. We shall hearken to your divine whispers. We shall bring you back from your ignominious exile and place you on your ancestral throne. The company was finally arranged to consist of the Seldrakes, Hollins, Malloy, Mallory, Eunice, Miss Ringtop, and myself. We did not give much thought either to the preparations in advance or to our mode of life when settled there. What shall we call the place? asked Eunice. Arcadia, said Abel Mallory, rolling up his large green eyes. Then, said Hollins, let us constitute ourselves the Arcadia Club. Aha! interrupted Mr. Johnson. I see the A.C. Yes, you see the A.C. Now, but to understand it fully, 
you should have had a share in those Arcadian experiences. It was a lovely afternoon in June when we first approached Arcadia. Perkins Brown, Sheldrake's boy of all work, awaited us at the door. He had been sent on two or three days in advance to take charge of the house, and seemed to have had enough of the hermit life, for he hailed us with a wild whoop, throwing his straw hat halfway up one of the poplars. Perkins was a boy of fifteen, the child of poor parents who were satisfied to get him off their hands. Regardless as to what humanitarian theories might be tested upon him, as the Arcadian Club recognized no such thing as caste, he was always admitted to our meetings, and understood just enough of our conversation to excite a silly ambition in his rather slow mind. Our board that evening was really tempting. The absence of meat was compensated to us by the crisp and racy onions, and I craved only a little salt, which had been interdicted in his most pernicious substance. I sat at one corner of the table, besides Perkins Brown, who took an opportunity while the others were engaged in conversation, to jog my elbow gently. As I turned towards him, he said nothing, but dropped his eyes significantly. Why, that little rascal had the lid of a blackening box filled with salt upon his knee, and was privately seasoning his onions and radishes. <laughs> I blushed at the thought of my hypocrisy, but the onions were so much better that I couldn't help dipping into the lid with him. Oh, said Eunice, we must send for some oil and vinegar. This lettuce is very nice. Oil and vinegar, exclaimed Abel. Why, yes, she said innocently. They are both vegetable substances. Abel at first looked rather foolish, but quickly recovered himself and said, All vegetable substances are not proper for food. He would not taste the poison oak or sit under the upas tree of Java. Abel, Eunice rejoined, how are we to distinguish what is best for us? How are we to know what vegetables to choose, or what animal and mineral substance to avoid? I will tell you, he answered, with a lofty air. See here, pointing to his temple, where the second pimple, either from the change of air, or because, in the excitement of the last few days, he had forgotten it was actually healed, my blood is at last pure. The struggle between the natural and the unnatural is over, and I am beyond depraved influences of my former tastes. My instincts are now, therefore, entirely pure also. What is good for man to eat? That I shall have a natural desire to eat. What is bad will be naturally repelled. How does the cow distinguish between the wholesome and the poisonous herbs of the meadow? And is man less than a cow? that he cannot cultivate his instincts to an equal point? Let me walk through the woods, and I can tell you every berry and root which God designed for food, though I don't know its name, and have never seen it before. I shall make use of my time during our sojourn here to test, by my purified instinct, every substance, animal, mineral, and vegetable, upon which the human race subsists, and to create a catalogue of true food of man. Our lazy life during the hot weather had become a little monotonous. The Arcadian plan had worked tolerably well, on the whole, for there was very little for anyone to do. Mrs. Seldrake and Perkin Browns accepted. Our conversation, however, lacked spirit and variety. We were, perhaps unconsciously, a little tired of hearing and assenting to the same sentiments, but one evening, about this time, Holland struck up a variation, the consequences of which he little foresaw. We had been reading one of Bulwer's books, while well, the weather was too hot for psychology, and came upon this paragraph, or something like it. And behind the veil we see the summer smile of the earth, enameled metal and limpid stream, but what hides she in her sunless heart? caravan of serpents, or grottoes of priceless gems, youth, whose soul sits on thy countenance, thyself wearing no mask, 
strive not to lift the mask of others. Be content with what thou seest, and waited time and experience shall teach thee to find jealousy behind the sweet smile and hatred under the honey word. This seems to us a dark and bitter reflection, but but one or another of us recalled some illustration of human hypocrisy, and the evidence by the simple fact of repetition gradually led to a division of opinion. Holland, Seldrake, and Miss Ringtop on the dark side, and the rest of us on the bright. The last, however, contented herself with quoting from her favorite poet, Gamaleo J. Gwathrop. I look beyond thy brow's concealment. I see thy spirit dark revelment. Thy inner self betrayed I see. Thy coward craven shivering me. We think we know one another, exclaimed Hollins. But do we? We see the faults of others, their weakness, their disagreeable qualities, and we keep silent. How much we should gain were candor as universal as concealment. Then each one, seeing himself as others see him, would truly know himself. How much misunderstanding might be avoided? How much hidden shame be removed? Hopeless because unspoken love made glad. Honest admiration cheered for its object. Utter sympathy mitigated misfortune. In short, how much brighter and happier the world would be if each one expressed everywhere and at all times his true and entire feeling. Why, even evil would lose half its power. There seemed to be so much practical wisdom in these views that we were all dazzled and had convinced at the start. So when Hollins, turning towards me, as he continued, exclaimed, Come, why should not this candor be adapted in our Arcadia? Will anyone, will you, Enos, commence at once by telling me now to my face my principal faults? I answered after a moment's reflection. You have a great deal of intellectual arrogance, and you are physically very indolent. He did not flinch from the self-invited test, though he looked a little surprised. Well put, said he, though I do not say that you are entirely correct. Now, what are my merits? Oh, you are clear-sighted, I answered, and earnest seeker after truth, and courageous in the avowal of your thoughts. This restored the balance, and we soon began to confess our private faults and weaknesses, though the confessions did not go very deep, no one betraying anything that we did not already know. Yet there were sufficient to strengthen Rollins in his new idea, and it was unanimously resolved that candor should thenceforth be the main charm of our Arcadian life. The next day Abel, who had resumed his researches after the true food, came home to supper with a healthier color than I had ever seen before on his face. Do you know, he said, looking shyly at Hollins, that I began to think beer must be a natural beverage. There was an auction in the village today, and I passed through, and I stopped at a cake stand to get a glass of water. It was very hot. There was no water, only beer, so I thought I would try a glass simply as an experiment. Really, the flavor was very agreeable, and it occurred to me on the way home that all the elements contained in beer are vegetable. Besides, fermentation is a natural process. I think the question has never been properly tested before. But the alcohol exclaimed Hollins. I could not distinguish any, either by taste or smell. I know that chemical analysis is said to show it, but may not the alcohol be created somehow during the analysis? The rest of us were much diverted. It was a pleasant relief to see our monotonous amiability. Abel, however, had a stubborn streak in his character. The next day he sent Perkins Brown to Bridgeport for a dozen bottles of beer. Perkins, either intentionally or by mistake, I always suspect the former, brought pint bottles of scotch ale which he placed in the coolest part of the cellar. The evening happened to be exceedingly hot and sultry. 
and as we were all fanning ourselves and talking languidly, Abel bethought him of his beer. In his thirst, he drank the contents of the first bottle, almost at a single draught. The effect of beer, said he, depends on, I think, on the commixture of the nourishing principles of the grain with the cooling properties of water. Perhaps hereafter a liquid food of the same character may be invented, which shall save us from mastication and all the diseases of the teeth. Hollins and Seldrake, at his invitation, divided a bottle between them, and he took a second. The potent beverage was not long in acting on a brain so unaccustomed to its influence. He grew unusually talkative and sentimental in a few minutes. Oh, sing somebody, he sighed in a hoarse rapture. The night was made for song. Miss Ringtop, nothing loath, immediately commence when stars in the quiet skies. But scarcely had she finished the first verse before Abel interrupted her. Candor is the order of the day, isn't it? he asked. Yes, yes, two or three answered. Well, then, said he, candidly, Pauline, you've got the darndest squeaky voice. Miss Ringtop gave a faint little scream of horror. Oh, never mind, he continued. We act according to impulse, don't we? And have the impulse to swear, and it's right. Let nature have her way. Listen, damn, 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 damn. I never knew it was so easy. Why, there's a pleasure in it. Try it, Polly. Try it on me. Oh, was all Miss Ringtop could utter. Abel, exclaimed Hollins, the beer has gotten into your head. No, it isn't beer. It's candor, said Abel. It's your own proposal, Hollins. Suppose it's evil to swear. Isn't it better I should express it and be done with it, then keep it bottled up to ferment in my mind. Oh, oh, you're a consistent old humbug, you are. And therewith he jumped off the stoop and went dancing awkwardly down toward the water, singing in a most unmelodious voice, "'Is home where the heart is.' We had an unusually silent breakfast the next morning. Abel scarcely spoke which the others attributed to a natural feeling of shame after his display of the previous evening. Hollins and Seldrake discussed temperance with a special view toward his edification, and Miss Ringtop favored us with several quotations about the maddening bowl, but he paid no attention to them. The forenoon was overcast with frequent showers. Each one occupied his or her room until dinner time when we met again with something of the old geniality. It was an evident effort to restore our former flow of good feeling, and Abel's experience with the beer was freely discussed. He insisted strongly that he had not been laboring under its effect, and proposed a mutual test. He, Sheldrake, and Rollins were to drink it in equal measures, and compare observations as to their physical sensations. The others agreed quite willingly, I thought, but I refused. There was a sound of loud voices as we approached the stoop. Rollins and Sheldrake and his wife, Abel Mallory, were sitting together near the door. Perkins Brown, as usual, was crouched on the lowest step with one leg over the other, and rubbing the top of his boot with a vigor which betrayed me to some secret mirth. He looked up at me from under his straw hat with the grin of a malicious puck, glanced toward the group and made a curious gesture with his thumb. There were several empty pint bottles on the stoop. Now, are you sure you can bear the test? we heard Hollins ask as we approached. Bear it? Why, to be sure, replied Sheldrake. If I couldn't bear it, or if you couldn't, your theory's done for. Try, I can stand it as long as you can. Well then, said Hollins, I think you are a very ordinary man. I derive no intellectual benefit from my intercourse with you. But your house is convenient to me. I'm under no obligation for your hospitality. However, because my company is an advantage to you, indeed, if I were treated according to my deserts, you couldn't do enough for me. Mrs. Seldrake was up in arms. Indeed, she exclaimed. I think you get as good as you deserve, and more, too. Elvira, said he, with a benevolent condescension, 
I have no doubt you think so, for your mind belongs to the lowest and most material sphere. You have your place in nature, and you fill it. But it is not for you to judge of intellects, which move only on the upper planes. Hollins, said Seldrake, Elvira's a good wife and a sensible woman, and I won't allow you to turn your nose at her. Oh, I'm not surprised, he answered, that you should fail to stand the test. I didn't expect it. Let me try it on you, cried Seldrake. You now have some intellect. I don't deny that, but not so much by a long shot as you think you have. Besides that, you're awfully selfish in your opinions. You won't admit that anybody can be right who differs from you. You sponged on me for a long time, but I suppose I've learned something from you, so we'll call it even, I think. However, that what you call acting according to impulse is simply an excuse to cover your own laziness. Gosh, that's it, interrupted Perkins, jumping up, then recollecting himself. He sank down on the stairs again and shook with a suppressed ho-ho-ho. Hollins, however, drew himself up with an exasperated air. Sheldrake, said he, I pity you. I always knew your ignorance, but I thought you honest in your human character, and never suspected of you of envy and malice. However, the true reformer must expect to be misunderstood and misrepresented by meaner minds. That love which I bear to all creatures teaches me to forgive you. Without such love, all plans of progress must fail. Is it not so, Abel? Sheldray could only ejaculate the word, pity, forgive, in his most contemptuous tone, while Mrs. Sheldrake, rocking violently in her chair, gave utterances to the peculiar clucking's tss, 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 whereby certain women express emotions too deep for words. Abel, roused by Holland's question, answered with a sudden energy. Love? There's no love in the world. Where will you find it? Tell me, and I'll go there. Love? <laughs> I'd like to see it. If all human hearts were like mine, we might have an Arcadia. But most men have no hearts. This world is a miserable, hollow, deceitful shell of vanity and hypocrisy. No, let us give up. We were born before our times. This age is not worthy of us. Holland stared at the speaker in utter amazement. Sheldrake gave a long whistle and finally grasped out, Well, what next? None of us were prepared for such a sudden and complete wreck of our Arcadian scheme. The foundations had been sapped before, it is true, but we have not perceived it, and now in two short days, the whole edifice tumbled about our ears. Though it was inevitable, felt a shock of sorrow. A silence fell upon us. Only that scamp of a Perkins Brown, chuckling and rubbing his boot, really rejoiced. I could have kicked him. We all went to bed, feeling that the charm of our Arcadian life was over. In the first revulsion of feelings, I was perhaps unjust to my associates. I see now more clearly the cause of those vagarities which originated in a genuine aspiration and failed from an ignorance of the true nature of man, quite as much as from the egotism of the individuals. You know, other attempts at reorganizing society were made about the same time by men of culture and experience, but in the A.C. we had neither. Our leaders had caught a few half-truths which, in their minds, were speedily warped into errors. End of the Experiences of the A.C. Recording by Kenneth Sargent Gagan Section 24 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Reese. What Mr. Robinson Thinks by James Russell Lowell. Governor B. is a sensible man. He stays to his home and looks at his folks. 
he draws his fur as straight as he can, and into nobody's tater patch pokes. But John P. Robinson, he says he won't vote for Governor B. My, ain't it terrible? What shall we do? We can't never choose him, of course, that's flat. Guess we shall have to come round, don't you? And go in for thunder and guns and all that. For John P. Robinson, he says he won't vote for Governor B. General C. is a dreadful smart man. He's been on all sides that give places or pelf. But consistency still was a part of his plan. He's been true to one party, and that is himself. So John P. Robinson, he says he shall vote for General C. General C. goes in for the war. He don't valley principle more than an old cud. What did God make us rational creatures for but glory and gunpowder, plunder and blood? So John P. Robinson, he says he shall vote for General C. We were getting on nicely up here to our village, with good old ideas of what's right and what ain't. We kind of thought Christ went again war and pillage, and that epaulets weren't the best mark of a saint. But John P. Robinson, he says this kind of thing's an exploded ID. The side of our country must allers be took, and President Polk, you know, he is our country, and the angel that writes all our sins in a book puts the debit to him, and to us the per country. And John P. Robinson, he says this is his view of the thing, to a T. Parson Wilbur, he calls all these arguments lies, says they're nothing on earth but just fee fa fum, and that all this big talk of our destinies is half on it ignorance, and t'other half rum. But John P. Robinson, he says it ain't no such thing, and, of course, so must we. Parson Wilbur says he never heerd in his life that the apostles rigged out in their swaller tail coats, and marched round in front of a drum and a fife, to get some on em office, and some on em votes. But John P. Robinson, he says they don't know everything down in Judee. Well, it's a mercy we got folks to tell us the rights and the wrongs of these matters, I vow. God sends country lawyers, and other wise fellers, to start the world's team when it gets in a slew. For John P. Robinson, he says the world'll go right if he hollers out G. End of what Mr. Robinson thinks. Recording by Matthew Rees, Davenport, Iowa. Section 25 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Phil Chenevere. The Day We Do Not Celebrate by Robert J. Burdett. One famous day in great July, John Adams said long years gone by, This day that makes a people free shall be the people's jubilee, with games, guns, sports, and shows displayed, with bells, pomped bonfires, and parade. Throughout this land, from shore to shore, from this time forth, for evermore. The years passed on, and by and by, Men's hearts grew cold in hot July, and Mayor Hawardin Chamaldele said, "Of rockets I am sore afraid, and if you send one up a blaze, I'll send you up for sixty days." Then said the Mayor O'Shea McQuaid, "There is no need for no parade," and Mayor Hans von Schwarzenmeyer proclaimed, "I'll have me no bonfire," said Mayor Baptiste Raphael. No make a ring a la belle. By gar, cried Mayor Jean Crapeau, this July games will has to go. And Mayor Knud Christofferson said, this to him who fires a gun. At last, cried Mayor Wan Long Lee, too muchy hoopala boobery. And so the Yankee holiday of proclamations passed away. End of The Day We Do Not Celebrate Section 26 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Reese. The Yankee Doodle Doo by S. E. Kaiser. When Charlie swung his golf sticks on the links, or knocked the tennis ball across the net, with his bangs done up in cunning little kinks, when he wore the tallest collar he could get, oh, it was the fashion then to impale him on the pen, to regard him as a being made of putty through and through. But his racket's laid away, he is roughing it today, and heroically proving that the Yankee doodle do. When Algy, as some knight of old arrayed, was the leading figure at the Fonsi Ball, we loathed him for the silly part he played. He was set down as a monkey, that was all. Oh, we looked upon him then as unfit to class with men, as one whose heart was putty and whose brains were made of glue. But he's thrown his cane away, and he grasps a gun today, while the world beholds him, knowing that the Yankee doodle do. When Clarence cruised about upon his yacht, or drove out with his footman through the park, his mamma, it was generally thought, ought to have him in her keeping after dark. Oh, we ridiculed him then, we impaled him on the pen. We thought he was effeminate. We dubbed him Sissy, too. But he nobly marched away. He is eating pork today, and heroically proving that the Yankee doodle do. How they hurled themselves against the angry foe, in the jungle and the trenches on the hill. When the word to charge was given, every dude was on the go. He was there to die, to capture, or to kill. Oh, he struck his level when men were called upon again, to preserve the ancient glory of the old red, white, and blue. He has thrown his spats away. He is wearing spurs today. And the world will please take notice that the Yankee doodle do. End of the Yankee Doodle Doo. Recording by Matthew Reese, Davenport, Iowa. Section 27 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times. Section 27. Spelling Down the Master by Edward Eggleston I allow, said Mrs. Means, as she stuffed the tobacco into her cob pipe after supper on that eventful Wednesday evening, I allow, they'll appoint the squire to get out the words tonight. They most always do, you see, case he's the pertest old man in this district, and I allow some of the young fellers would have to get up and dust off they would keep up to him and he uses such remarkable smart words he speaks so polite too but laws don't i remember when he was poor nor jobs turkey twenty year ago when he come to these here diggins that air squire hawkins was a poor yankee schoolmaster that said pail instead of bucket and that called a cow a cow and that couldn't tell to save his gizzard what we meant by low and by right smart but he's learnt our ways now, and he's just as civilized as the rest of us. You wouldn't know he'd ever been a Yankee. He didn't stay poor long, not he. He just married a right rich girl. He <laughs> he. And the old woman grinned at Ralph, and then at Mirandy, and then at the rest, until Ralph shuddered. Nothing was so frightful to him as to be fawned on by this grinning ogre whose few lonesome blackish teeth seemed ready to devour him he didn't stay poor ye bet a house and with this the coal was deposited on the pipe and the lips began to crack like parchment as each puff of smoke escaped he married rich ye see and here another significant look at the young master and another fond look at mirandy as she puffed away reflectively. His wife hadn't no book learnin'. She'd been through the spellin' book once, and had got as fur as asperity on it a second time. But she couldn't read a word when she was married, and never could. She warn't overly smart. 
she hadn't hardly got the sense the law allows but schools was scarce in them air days and besides book learnin don't do no good to a woman makes her stuck up i never knowed but one gal in my life as had suffered into fractions and she was so doggone stuck up that she turned up her nose one night at an apple peeling because i tuck a sheet off the bed to splice out the tablecloth which was ruther short and the sheet was most clean too hadn't been slept on more'n once or twice it but i was goin fur to say that when squire hawkins married virginny gray he got a heap o money or what's the same thing mostly a heap o good land and that's better in book learnin says i ef a gal had gone clean through all edication and got to the rule of three itself that wouldn't buy a feather bed squire hawkins jest put edication agin the gal's farm and traded even and if ary one of em got swindled i never heerd no complaints and here she looked at ralph in triumph her hard face splintering into the hideous semblance of a smile and mirandy cast a blushing gushing all imploring and all confiding look on the young master i say old woman broke in old jack i say what is all this here spoutin about the square fur and old jack having bit off an ounce of pigtail returned the plug to his pocket as for ralph he fell into a sort of terror he had a guilty feeling that this speech of the old lady's had somehow committed him beyond recall to mirandy he did not see visions of breach of promise suits but he trembled at the thought of an avenging big brother hanner you can come along too if you're a mind when you get the dishes washed said mrs means to the bound girl as she shut and latched the back door the means family had built a new house in front of the old one as a sort of advertisement of bettered circumstances an eruption of shoddy feeling but when the new building was completed they found themselves unable to occupy it for anything else than a lumber room and so except a parlor which mirandy had made an effort to furnish a little in hope of the blissful time when somebody should set up with her of evenings the new building was almost unoccupied and the family went in and out through the back door which indeed was the front door also for according to a curious custom the front of the house was placed toward the south though the big road hoosier for highway ran along the northwest side or rather past the northwest corner of it when the old woman had spoken thus to hannah and had latched the door she muttered that gal don't never show no gratitude for favors to which bud rejoined that he didn't think she had no great sight to be particular thankful fur to which mrs means made no reply thinking it best perhaps not to wake up her dutiful son on so interesting a theme as her treatment of hannah ralph felt glad that he was this evening to go to another boarding place he should not hear the rest of the controversy ralph walked to the schoolhouse with bill they were friends again for when hank banta's ducking and his dogged obstinacy in sitting in his wet clothes had brought on a serious fever ralph had called together the big boys and had said we must take care of one another boys who will volunteer to take turns setting up with henry he put his own name down and all the rest followed william means and myself will sit up to-night said ralph and poor bill had been from that moment the teacher's friend he was chosen to be ralph's companion he was puppy means no longer hank could not be conquered by kindness and the teacher was made to feel the bitterness of his resentment long after but bill means was for the time entirely placated and he and ralph went to spelling school together every family furnished a candle there were yellow dips and white dips burning smoking and flaring there was laughing and talking and giggling and simpering and ogling and flirting and courting what a full-dress party is to fifth avenue a spelling school is to hoople county it is an occasion which is metaphorically inscribed with this legend choose your partners 
Spelling is only a blind in Hoopole County, as is dancing on Fifth Avenue. But as there are some in society who love dancing for its own sake, so in Flat Creek District there were those who loved spelling for its own sake, and who, smelling the battle from afar, had come to try their skill in this tournament, hoping to freshen the laurels they had won in their school days. "'I allow,' said Mr. Means, speaking as the principal school trustee, "'I allow our friends the squire is just the man to boss this ere consarn to-night. If nobody objects, I'll appoint him. Come, squire, don't be bashful. Walk up to the trial, fodder or no fodder, as the man said to his donkey.' There was a general giggle at this, and many of the young swains took occasion to nudge the girls alongside them, ostensibly for the purpose of making them see the joke, but really for the pure pleasure of nudging. The Greeks figured Cupid as naked, probably because he wears so many disguises that they could not select a costume for him. The squire came to the front. Ralph made an inventory of the agglomeration which bore the name of Squire Hawkins, as follows. 1. A swallow-tail coat of indefinite age, worn only on state occasions, when its owner was called to figure in his public capacity. Either the squire had grown too large, or the coat too small. 2. A pair of black gloves, the most phenomenal, abnormal, and unexpected apparition conceivable in flat Creek District, where the preachers wore no coats in the summer, and where a black glove was never seen except on the hands of the squire. 3. A wig of that dirty, waxen color so common to wigs. This one showed a continual inclination to slip off the owner's smooth, bald pate, and the squire had frequently to adjust it. As his hair had been red, the wig did not accord with his face, and the hair ungrayed was doubly discordant with a countenance shriveled by age. 4. A semicircular row of whiskers hedging the edge of the jaw and chin. These were dyed a frightful dead black, such a color as belonged to no natural hair or beard that ever existed. At the roots there was a quarter of an inch of white, giving the whiskers the appearance of having been stuck on. 5. A pair of spectacles, with tortoise-shell rim, want to slip off. 6. A glass eye, purchased of a peddler, and differing in color from its natural mate, perpetually getting out of focus by turning in or out. 7. A set of false teeth, badly fitted, and given to bobbing up and down. 8. The squire proper, to whom these patches were loosely attached. It is an old story that a boy wrote home to his father, begging him to come west, because mighty mean men get into office out here. But Ralph concluded that some Yankees had taught school in Hoopole County, who would not have held a high place in the educational institutions of Massachusetts. Hawkins had some New England idioms, but they were well overlaid by a Western pronunciation. "'Ladies and gentlemen,' he began, shoving up his spectacles and sucking his lips over his white teeth to keep them in place. "'Ladies and gentlemen, young men and maidens, really I'm obliged to Mr. Means for this honor. And the squire took both hands and turned the top of his head round half an inch. Then he adjusted his spectacles. Whether he was obliged to Mr. Means for the honor of being compared to a donkey was not clear. I feel in the inmost compartments of my animal spirits a most happifying sense of the success and futility of all my endeavors to starve the people of Flat Creek District and the people of Tompkins Township in my weak way and manner. This burst of eloquence was delivered with a constrained air and an apparent sense of a danger that he, Squire Hawkins, might fall to pieces in his weak way and manner, and of the success and futility of all attempts at reconstruction. For by this time the ghastly pupil of the left eye, which was black, was looking away round to the left, while the little blue one on the right twinkled cheerfully toward the front. 
the front teeth would drop down so that the squire's mouth was kept nearly closed and his words whistled through i feel as if i could be grandiloquent on this interesting occasion twisting his scalp round but really i must forego any such exertions it is spelling you want spelling is a cornerstone the grand underlying subterfuge of a good education i put the spelling book prepared by the great daniel webster alongside the bible i do really i think i may put it ahead of the bible for if it weren't fur spelling books in such occasion as these where would the bible be i should like to know the man who got up who compounded this work of inextricable value was a benefactor to the whole human race or any other here the spectacles fell off the squire replaced them in some confusion gave the top of his head another twist and felt of his glass eye while poor shocky stared in wonder and betsy short rolled from side to side in the efforts to suppress her giggle mrs means and the other old ladies looked the applause they could not speak i pint larkin lanham and james buchanan for captains said the squire and the two young men thus named took a stick and tossed it from hand to hand to decide which should have the first choice one tossed the stick to the other who held it fast just where he happened to catch it then the first placed his hand above the second and so the hands were alternately changed to the top the one who held the stick last without room for the other to take hold had gained the lot this was tried three times as larkin held the stick twice out of three times he had the choice he hesitated a moment everybody looked toward tall jim phillips but larkin was fond of a venture of unknown seas and so he said i take the master while a buzz of surprise ran round the room and the captain of the other side as if afraid his opponent would withdraw the choice retorted quickly and with a little smack of exultation and defiance in his voice and i take james phillips and soon all present except a few of the old folks found themselves ranged in opposing hosts the poor spellers lagging in with what grace they could at the foot of the two divisions the squire opened his spelling book and began to give out the words to the two captains who stood up and spelled against each other it was not long until larkin spelled really with one l and had to sit down in confusion while a murmur of satisfaction ran through the ranks of the opposing forces his own side bit their lips the slender figure of the young teacher took the place of the fallen leader and the excitement made the house very quiet ralph dreaded the loss of prestige he would suffer if he should be easily spelled down and at the moment of rising he saw in the darkest corner the figure of a well-dressed young man sitting in the shadow why should his evil genius haunt him but by a strong effort he turned his attention away from dr small and listened carefully to the words which the squire did not pronounce very distinctly spelling them with extreme deliberation this gave him an air of hesitation which disappointed those on his own side they wanted him to spell with a dashing assurance but he did not begin a word until he had mentally felt his way through it after ten minutes of spelling hard words james buchanan the captain on the other side spelled atrocious with an s instead of a c and subsided his first choice james phillips coming up against the teacher this brought the excitement to fever heat for though ralph had chosen first it was entirely on trust and most of the company were disappointed the champion who now stood up against the schoolmaster was a famous speller jim phillips was a tall lank stoop-shouldered fellow who had never distinguished himself in any other pursuit than spelling except in this one art of spelling he was of no account he could not catch well or bat well in ball he could not throw well enough to make his mark in that famous western game of bullpen he did not succeed well in any study but that of webster's elementary but in that he was to use the usual flat creek locution in that he was a hoss this genius for spelling is in some people a sixth sense a matter of intuition 
Some spellers are born and not made, and their facility reminds one of the mathematical prodigies that crop out every now and then to bewilder the world. Bud Means, foreseeing that Ralph would be pitted against Jim Phillips, had warned his friend that Jim could spell like thunder and lightning, and that it took a powerful smart speller to beat him, for he knew a heap a spelling book. To have spelled down the master is next thing to having whipped the biggest bully in Hoopole County, and Jim had spelled down the last three masters. He divided the hero worship of the district with Bud Means. For half an hour the squire gave out hard words. What a blessed thing our crooked orthography is. Without it there could be no spelling schools. As Ralph discovered his opponent's mettle, he became more and more cautious. He was now satisfied that Jim would eventually beat him. The fellow evidently knew more about the spelling book than old Noah Webster himself. As he stood there, with his dull face and long, sharp nose, his hands behind his back, and his voice spelling infallibly, it seemed to Hartsook that his superiority must lie in his nose. Ralph's cautiousness answered a double purpose. It enabled him to tread surely, and it was mistaken by Jim for weakness. Phillips was now confident that he should carry off the scalp of the fourth schoolmaster before the evening was over. He spelled eagerly, confidently, brilliantly. Stoop-shouldered as he was, he began to straighten up. In the minds of all the company, the odds were in his favor. He saw this, and became ambitious to distinguish himself by spelling without giving the matter any thought. Ralph always believed that he would have been speedily defeated by Phillips had it not been for two thoughts which braced him. The sinister shadow of young Dr. Small sitting in the dark corner by the water bucket nerved him. A victory over Phillips was a defeat to one who wished only ill to the young schoolmaster. The other thought that kept his pluck alive was the recollection of Bull. He approached a word as Bull approached the raccoon. He did not take hold until he was sure of his game. When he took hold, it was with a quiet assurance of success. As Ralph spelled in this dogged way for half an hour the hardest words the squire could find, the excitement steadily rose in all parts of the house, and Ralph's friends even ventured to whisper that maybe Jim had cotched his match after all. But Phillips never doubted of his success. Theodolite, said the squire. T. H. E. The. O. D. Odd. T h e o d o t h e o d o l y t e t h e o d o l i t e spelled the champion. Next, said the squire, nearly losing his teeth in his excitement. Ralph spelled the word slowly and correctly, and the conquered champion sat down in confusion. The excitement was so great for some minutes that the spelling was suspended. Everybody in the house had shown sympathy with one or the other of the combatants, except the silent shadow in the corner. It had not moved during the contest, and did not show any interest now in the result. "'Gee willicky crickets! Thunder and lightning! Licked him all to smash!' said Bud, rubbing his hands on his knees. "'That beats my time all holler!' And Betsy Short giggled until her tuck-comb fell out, though she was not on the defeated side. Shocky got up and danced with pleasure. But one suffocating look from the aqueous eyes of Mirandy destroyed the last spark of Ralph's pleasure in his triumph, and sent that awful below-zero feeling all through him. "'He's powerful smart, is the master,' said old Jack to Mr. Pete Jones. "'He'll beat the whole kit, and tuck of him afore he's through. I knowed he was smart. That's the reason I tuck him,' proceeded Mr. Means. "'Yes, but he don't lick enough.' Not nigh, answered Pete Jones. No lickin', no larnin', says I. It was now not so hard. The other spellers on the opposite side went down quickly under the hard words which the squire gave out. The master had mowed down all but a few. His opponents had given up the battle, and all had lost their keen interest in a contest to which there could be but one conclusion, for there were only the poor spellers left. 
but Ralph Hartsook ran against a stump where he was least expecting it. It was the squire's custom, when one of the smaller scholars or poorer spellers rose to spell against the master, to give out eight or ten easy words, that they might have some breathing spell before being slaughtered, and then to give a poser or two, which soon settled them. He let them run a little, as a cat does a doomed mouse. There was now but one person left on the opposite side, and as she rose in her blue calico dress, Ralph recognized Hannah, the bound girl at old Jack Means's. She had not attended school in the district, and had never spelled in spelling school before, and was chosen last as an uncertain quantity. The squire began with easy words of two syllables, from that page of Webster, so well known to all who ever thumbed it, as Baker, from the word that stands at the top of the page. She spelled these words in an absent and uninterested manner, as everybody knew that she would have to go down as soon as this preliminary skirmishing was over, everybody began to get ready to go home, and already there was the buzz of preparation. Young men were timidly asking girls if they could see them safe home, which was the approved formula, and were trembling in mortal fear of the mitten. Presently the squire, thinking it time to close the contest, pulled his scalp forward, adjusted his glass eye, which had been examining his nose long enough, and turned over the leaves of the book to the great words at the place known to spellers as incomprehensibility, and began to give out those words of eight syllables with the accent on the sixth. Listless scholars now turned round and ceased to whisper, in order to be in at the master's final triumph. But to their surprise, old Miss Means's white nigger, as some of them called her in allusion to her slavish life, spelled these great words with as perfect ease as the master. Still, not doubting the result, the squire turned from place to place and selected all the hard words he could find. The school became utterly quiet. The excitement was too great for the ordinary buzz. Would Means's, Hanner, beat the master that had laid out Jim Phillips? Everybody's sympathy was now turned to Hannah. Ralph noticed that even Shockey had deserted him, and that his face grew brilliant every time Hannah spelled a word. In fact, Ralph deserted himself. As he saw the fine, timid face of the girl, so long oppressed, flush and shine with interest, as he looked at the rather low but broad and intelligent brow, and the fresh white complexion, and saw the rich, womanly nature, coming to the surface under the influence of applause and sympathy, he did not want to beat. If he had not felt that a victory would, given would insult her, he would have missed intentionally. The bulldog, the stern, relentless setting of the will, had gone. He knew not whither, and there had come in its place, as he looked in that face, a something which he did not understand. You did not, gentle reader, the first time it came to you. The squire was puzzled. He had given out all the hard words in the book. He again pulled the top of his head forward. Then he wiped his spectacles and put them on. Then, out of the depths of his pocket, he fished up a list of words just coming into use in those days, words not in the spelling book. He regarded the paper attentively with his blue right eye. His black left eye, meanwhile, fixed itself in such a stare on Mirandy Means that she shuddered and hid her eyes in her red silk handkerchief. Daguerreotype, sniffed the squire. It was Ralph's turn. D-A-U. D-A-U. Next. And Hannah spelled it right. Such a buzz followed that Betsy Short's giggle could not be heard, but Shocky shouted, Hannah beat! My Hannah spelled down the master! And Ralph went over and congratulated her. And Dr. Small sat perfectly still in the corner. And then the squire called them to order and said, As our friend Hannah Thompson is the only one left on her side, she will have to spell against nearly all on t'other side. I shall therefore take the liberty of procrastinating the completion of this interesting and exacting contest until tomorrow evening. I hope our friend Hanner 
may again carry off the cypress crown of glory there is nothing better for us than healthful and kindly simulation dr small who knew the road to practice escorted mirandy and bud went home with somebody else the others of the means family hurried on while hannah the champion stayed behind a minute to speak to shocky perhaps it was because ralph saw that hannah must go alone that he suddenly remembered having left something which was of no consequence and resolved to go round by mr means's and get it end of section twenty seven Section twenty eight of the Wit and Humor of America, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Reese. Myopia by Wallace Rice. As down the street he took his stroll, he cursed, for all he is a saint. He saw a sign atop a pole as down the street he took a stroll, and climbed it up, near-sighted soul, so he could read, and read, fresh paint. As down the street he took a stroll, he cursed, for all he is a saint. End of Myopia. Recording by Matthew Reese, Davenport, Iowa. Section 29 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenevere. Anatole Dubois et de Horshaw by Wallace Bruce Amsbury. My wife and me, we read so much in paper here of late about chicago horse show we remember day and date we make it up together that we go and see that show there's something there we find it out maybe we want to know we leave the little farm a while that's near the bobonne we're soon up to chicago town for spend the night and day i never lock that busy place it's most too swift for me we waste no time but got to place that we is come to see we pay the price for take us in they give me de ticket charlotte and me we come to see the horse show now you bet we soon got in it very much the push i think you call to inside of the big building we are going to see it all the Colosseum is the place they make the horse show dar, five times so big than any barn at Bobonet by Gar. I'm look around for place they have for them to pitch the hay. I guess it's out of sight, I think. There's one man to me say. And then we walk around and round some horses for to see. There's pretty women's lots of them. But for the life of me I cannot see the trotter nag, or what's called thoroughbred. I wonder if we make mistake, got in wrong place instead. But Charlotte is not disappoint. Her eyes they shine so bright. It's when she see them women's folks. They dance with much delight. I then was take a look myself on ladies with fine dress. There's nothing else in that whole place that is so interest. I say, Charlotte, say I to her, that lady in the box seat, across the way was one big swell, her beauty's hard to beat. They won got that funny eyeglass upon a little stick. I think she is most fine looking when she bow and speck. It's pretty dress that she's got on. I lack the polonaise. Where bodice is all mixed up with jabot all the ways. That's hang in front with pleats all round. It's one fine tableau. And then Charlotte she turned to me and asked me how I know so much about the big horse show which we are come for see. 
and then I up and told her there that I had come to be expert on information -y. Read paper, I find out, what all is in the horse's show, and what's it all about. I point to lady in next box. She's fix up mighty well. I wish I could have words enough what she had on to tell. The first part it was nothing much. From cloth it was quite free. Like floodily at Easter time, most beautiful to see. And then there is commence a line of fluffy cream souffle. My wife it make her very dears, she's not a word to say. And then come yard of crepe de chien, with omelette stripe beneath, and fill it up with fine grip jewels and concertina pleat. Mon Dieu, and who would ever think that horse show was like this? A horse show there without no horse, I think that strange business. But I suppose after the man, the dry goods bill the pay, there's nothing left to spend on horse until some other day. I tell you every hour you leave, you find out something new. And now I have some words to tell some good it might do you. It's mighty funny the advice I'm give to you, of course, but never go to a horse's show expecting to see horse. End of Anatole Dubois at the Horse Show. Recording by Phil Chenever. Section thirty of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Leeson. The Champion Checker Player of America by James Whitcomb Riley. Of course, as far as checker playin's concerned, you can't jest exactly claim it lots makes fortunes and lots gets busted at it. But still, it's only simple justice to acknowledge that there's absolute pints in the game that takes scientific principles to figure out, and a mighty level-headed feller to demonstrate, don't you understand? Checkers is a old enough game if age is any recommendation, and it's a evident fact, too, at the tooth of time, as the feller says, which for the last six thousand years has gained some reputation for eatin' up things in general, don't peer to a nod much of a hole in checkers, jettin' from the checker board of today and the ones that they're occasionally shovelin' out at Pompeii, or whatever its name is. Turned up a checker board there not long ago, I was readin' bout, at still had the spots on, as plain and fresh as the modern white pine board o' arn, squared off with pencil marks and pokeberry juice. This is facts that history herself has dug out, and of course it ain't for me nor you to turn up our nose at checkers, whether we ever tamper with the fool game or not. For as that's concerned, I don't pretend to be no checker player myself, but I knowed a feller once that could play, and sort of made a business of it, and that man, in my opinion, was a genius. Name was Wesley Cottrell, John Wesley Cottrell just plain Wes, as us fellers round the shoe shop used to call him, used to always make the shoe shop his headquarters like, and rain or shine, wet or dry, you'd always find Wes on hands, ready to banter some feller for a game, or just a settin' humped up there over the checkerboard all alone, a cipherin' out some new move or another, and whistlin' low and solemn to hisself, and a-payin' no attention to nobody. And I'll tell you, Wes Cottle was no man's fool, as sly as you keep it, he was a deep thinker, Wes was, and if he'd a just a turned that mind of his loose on preachin', for instance, and the interpretation of the Bible, don't you know, Wes had a work pints out there at no livin' expounderers ever got in gunshot of. But Wes, he didn't appear to be cut out for nothin' much but just checker playin'. Oh, of course, he could knock round his own woodpile some, and garden a little, more or less, and the neighbors used to find Wes pretty handy about trimming fruit trees, you understand, and working in among the worms and caterpillars in the vines and shrubbery and the like. And handling bees? They wasn't no man under the heavens that knowed more about handling bees and Wes Cotterell, settling the blame things when they was a swarmin' and a robbin' hives and all such foolish risks. 
why i've seen west cottle for now when a swarm of bees would settle in an orchard like they will sometimes you know i've saw west cottle just roll up his shirt sleeves and bend down a apple tree limb that was just kivered with the pesky things and scrape em back into the hive with his naked hands by the quart and gallon and never get a scratch you couldn't hire a bee to sting west cottle but lazy i think that man had really ought to have been an injun he was the first and only man that ever i laid eyes on that was too lazy to drop a checker man to pint out the right road for a fella that asked him once the way to burke's mill and wes without ever a lift in eye or finger just sort of crooked out that mouth of hisn in the direction the feller wanted and says hey yonder and went on with his whistlin but all this ain't checkers and that's what i started out to tell ye wes had a way of just naturally a cleanin out anybody and everybody at a hep hold up a checkerboard wes wasn't what you'd call a lively player at all ner a competitor at talked much across the board or made much first over a game while he was a playin he had his faults of course and would take back moves occasionally or inch up on you if you didn't watch him maybe but as a rule wes had the insight to grasp the idea of whoever was a playin against him and his style a game you understand and was on the lookout continual and under such circumstances could play as honest a game of checkers as the babe unborn one thing in wes's favor all as was the feller's temper nothin peered to aggravate wes and nothin on earth could break his slow and lazy way of takin his own time for everything you just couldn't crowd wes or get him rattled anyway just peered to have one fixed principle and that was to take plenty of time and never make no move without a cipher and a head on the probable consequences don't you understand be sure you're right wes'd say and lettin up for a second on that low and sorry like little wind through the keyhole whistle of his and a nosin out a place where he could swap one man for two be sure you're right and something after this style was wes's way be sure you're right whistlin a long lonesome bar of barbara allen and then another long retarded bar go ahead and by the time the feller ud get through with his whistlin and a stoppin and a startin in again he'd be about three men ahead to your one and then he'd just go on with his whistlin seff nothin had happened and maybe you a just a rearin and a callin him all the mean outlandish ornery names that you could lay tongue to but wes's good nature i reckon was the thing that helped him out as much as any other pints the feller had and wes it all as win in the long run i don't care who played against him it was only a question of time with wes a waxin it to the best of em lots of players has tackled wes and right at the start it maybe give him trouble but in the long run now mind ye in the long run no mortal man i reckon had any business or rubbin knees with wes cotterell under no earthly checkerboard in all this vale o tears I mind once there come along a high-toned feller from in around Indianapolis summers. Was a lawyer, or some professional kind of man. He had a big yaller leather kivered book under his arm, and a bunch of these ere big envelopes and a lot of subpoenas sticking out of his breast pocket. Mighty slick-looking feller he was, wore a stovepipe hat, sort of set way back on his head, so's to show off his General Jackson forehead, don't you know? well sir this feller struck the place on some business or other and then missed the hack at or to a took him out of here sooner it did take him out and whiles he was a loafin round sort of lonesome like a feller allus is in a strange place you know he kind of dropped in on our crowd at the shoe shop ostensibly to get a bootstrap stitched on but i knowed the minute he set foot in the door at that feller wanted company wasn't cobblin well as good luck would have it there set wes as usual with the checkerboard in his lap a playin all by hisself and a whistlin so low and solemn like and sad it really made the crowd seem like a religious gatherin of some kind or other we was all so quiet and still like as the man come in well the stranger stated his business set down took off his boot and set there nussin his foot and talkin weather for ten minutes i reckon for he ever peered to notice wes at all we was all backward anyhow bout talkin much besides we knowed long afore he come in all about how hot the weather was and the poor chance there was a rain and all that and so the subject had pretty well died out when just then the feller's eyes struck wes and the checkerboard and i'll never forget the warm salvation smile it flashed over him at the promisin discovery what says he a grinnin like an angel and a edgin his cheer towards wes have we a checkerboard and checkers here 
we have says i knowin at west wouldn't let go of that whistle long enough to answer more'n to mebby nod his head and who is your best player says the feller kind of pitiful like with another inquirin look at wes him says i a pokin wes with a peg float but wes only spit kind of absent like and went on with his whistlin much of a player is he says the feller with a sort of doubtful smile at wes again plays a pretty good hickory says i a pokin wes again wes says i here's a gentleman that'd maybe like to take a hand with you there and give you a few ideas says i yes says the stranger eager like a settin his plug hat careful up in the empty shelvin and a rubbin his hands and smilin as confident like as old hoyle hisself yes indeed i'd be glad to give the gentleman meanin wes an idea or two about checkers if he'd just as leaf cause i reckon if there are any one thing that i do know more about than another it's checkers says he and there are no game at delights me more providin of course i find a competitor at can make it anyways interestin got much of a record on checkers says i well says the feller i don't like to brag but i've never been beat in any legitimate contest says he and i've played more'n one of them he says here and there round the country of course your friend here he went on smilin sociable at wes he'll take it all in good part if i should happen to lead him a little just as i'd do he says if it was possible for him to lead me wes says i has warmed the wax in the ears of some mighty good checker players says i as he squared the board around still a whistlin to hisself like as the stranger took his place a smilin like and roachin back his hair move says wes no says the feller with a polite flourish of his hand the first move shall be yourn and by jucks for all he wouldn't take even the advantage of a starter he flaxed it to wes the first game in less than fifteen minutes right sure you've give me your best player he says smilin round at the crowd as wes set square in the board for another game and whistlin as unconcerned like as if nothin had happened more n ordinary it's your move says wes a squintin out into the game bout forty foot from shore and a whistlin pert nigh in a whisper well sir it peared like the feller really didn't try to play and you could see too at wes knowed he'd about met his match and played accordin he didn't make no move at all that he didn't give careful thought to whilst the feller well as i was sayin it just peered like checkers was child's play for him put in most of the time long through the game a sayin things calculated to kind of bore an ordinary man but wes held hisself purty level and didn't show no signs and kept up his whistlin mighty well considerin reckon you play the fiddle too as well as checkers says the feller laughin as wes come a whistlin out of the little end of the second game and went on a fixin for the next round it's my move says wes thout seemin to notice the feller's tantalizin words whatsomever well this time thinks i mr smarty from the metropolitan districts you're liable to get waxed sure but the feller didn't appear to think so at all and played right ahead as glib-like and careless as ever occasionally a throwin in them sarcastic remarks o hisn bout bein slow and sure bout things in general like to see that he said like to see fellers do things with plenty of deliberation and even if a feller wasn't much of a checker player like to see him die slow anyhow and then tend his own funeral he says and march in the possession to his own music says he and just then his remarks was brung to a close by wes a jumpin two men and a lightin square in the king row ground that says wes a droppin back into his old tune and for the rest of that game wes held the feller pretty level but had to finally knock under but by just the closest kind of shave a winnin they ain't much use says the feller a keepin this thing up less i could manage some way or other to get beat once in a while move says wes a drappin back into the same old whistle and a settlin there music has charms as the good book tells us says the feller kind of nervous like and a roachin his hair back as if some sort of protracted headache was a settin in never was skunked was ye says wes kind of student like with a fur off look in them big white eyes of his and then a whistlin right on s if he hadn't said nothin not much says the feller sort of surprised like as if such a idea as that had never struck him afore never was skunked myself but i've saw fellers in my time at was says he but from that time on i noticed the feller peered to play more careful and rarely launched into the game with something like interest wes he seemed to be just a limberin up like and sir blame me if he didn't walk the feller's log for him that time thout no peerant trouble at all 
and now says wes all quiet like a square in the board for another we're kind of getting that things right move and away went that little unconcerned whistle of his again, and Mr. City Man just gettin' white and sweaty, too. He was so nervous. Nary didn't appear to find much to laugh at in the next game, nor the next two games nother. Things was a-gettin' mighty interestin' about them times, and I guess the feller was serious-like about waking up to the solemn fact that it took about all his spare time to keep up his end of the row, and even that state of poor satisfaction was a-creepin' further and further away from him ever new turn he undertook, whilst West just appeared to get more deliberate and certain ever game, and that unendin' self-satisfied and comfortin' little whistle of his never dropped a stitch, but towed out ever game alike, towards the last and for the most part disasters to the fellow at had started it with such confidence and actual promise, don't you know? Well, sir, the feller stuck the whole forenoon out, and then the afternoon, and then knuckled down to it way into the night, yes, and plumb midnight, and he buckled into the thing bright and early next morning. And, sir, for two long days and nights, a hardly a stoppin' long enough to eat, the feller stuck it out, and Wes a just a warpin' it to him hand over fist, and leavin' him further behind ever game, till finally, towards the last, the feller got so blamed on worked up and excited like, he just peered actually pert nigh plumb crazy and hysterical as a woman. It was a gettin late into the shank of the second day, and the boys had just a little candle for em to fetch out one of the closest games the feller'd played Wes for some time. But Wes was just as cool and calm as ever, and still a whistlin consolin to hisself like, whilst the feller just peered wore out and ready to drop right in his tracks any minute. Durn you, he snarled out at Wes, ain't you never goin to move? And there set Wes a balancin' a checker man above the board, a studyin' where to set it, and a fillin' in the time with that air whistle. Flames and flashes, says the feller again, will you ever stop that death seducin' tune o' yourn long enough to move? And as Wes deliberately set his man down where the feller see he'd have to jump it and lose two men and a king, Wes was a singin' low and sad like as if all to hisself. Who oh, will move that man and leave him there for the love of Barbary Allen? Well, sir, the feller just jumped to his feet, upset the board, and tore out of the shop stark staring crazy. Blame if he wasn't, cause some of us put out after him and overtook him way beyond the pike bridge, and hollered to him, and he shook his fist at us and hollered back and says, says he, if you fellers over here, says he, will agree to muzzle that dern checker player o' yourn, I'll bet fifteen hundred dollars to fifteen cents that I can beat him eleven games out of every dozen, but there are no money he says, at can hire me to play him again, on this aboundin' earth, only on them conditions, cause that dern eternal infernal dad blasted whistle his would beat the oldest man in Ameriky. End of the Champion Checker Player of Ameriky Section 31 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenevere. Darby and Joan by St. John Honeywood. When Darby saw the setting sun, he swung his scythe and home he run, sat down, drank off his quart, and said, My work is done, I'll go to bed. My work is done, retorted Joan. My work is done, your constant tone. But hapless woman ne'er can say, My work is done till judgment day. You men can sleep all night, but we must toil. Whose fault is that? quoth he. I know your meaning, Joan replied. But, sir, my tongue shall not be tied. I will go on and let you know what work poor women have to do. First in the morning, though we feel as sick as drunkards when they reel, yes, feel such pains in back and head, as would confine you men to bed. We ply the brush, we wheel the broom, we air the beds and right the room. The cows must next be milked, and then we get the breakfast for the men. Ere this is done, with whimpering cries and bristly hair, the children rise. They must be dressed and dozed with rue and fed, and all because of you. We next here Darby scratched his head and stole off, grumbling to his bed, and only said, as on she run, Zounds, 
woman's clack is never done. At early dawn, ere Phoebus rose, old Joan resumed her tale of woes. When Darby thus, I'll end the strife, be you the man and I the wife. Take you the scythe and mow, while I will all your boasted care supply. Content, quoth Joan, give me my stent. This Darby did, and out she went. Old Darby rose and seized the broom, and whirled the dust about the room, which, having done, he scarce knew how, he hied to milk the brindled cow. The brindled cow whisked round her tail in Darby's eyes, and kicked the pail. The clown, perplexed with grief and pain, swore he'd ne'er try to milk again. When turning round, in sad amaze, he saw his cottage in a blaze. For as he chanced to brush the room in careless haste, he fired the broom. The fire at last subdued, he swore the broom and he would meet no more. Pressed by misfortune and perplexed, Darby prepared for breakfast next, but what to get he scarcely knew. The bread was spent, and butter too, his hands bedaubed with paste and flour, old Darby labored full an hour. But, luckless white, thou couldst not make the bread take form of loaf or cake, as every door wide open stood, in pushed a sow in quest of food and stumbling onward with her snout, or set the churn, the cream ran out. As Darby turned the sow to beat, the slippery cream betrayed his feet. He caught the bread trough in his fall, and down came Darby, trough and all. The children, wakened by the clatter, start up and cry, Oh, what's the matter? Old Jowler barked and Tabby meowed, and hapless Darby bawled aloud, Return, my Joan, as heretofore, I'll play the housewife's part no more. Since now by sad experience taught, compared to thine, my work is naught. Henceforth, as business calls, I'll take, content the plough, the scythe, the rake, and never more transgress the line our fates have marked while thou art mine. Then, Joan, return, as heretofore, I'll vex thy honest soul no more. Let's each our proper task attend, forgive the past, and strive to mend. End of Darby and Joan Section 32 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Leeson. When the Frost is on the Pumpkin by James Whitcomb Riley. When the frost is on the pumpkin and the fodder's in the shock, and you hear the cook and gobble of the struttin' turkey cock, and the clackin' of the guineas and the cluckin' of the hens, and the rooster's hallelujah as he tiptoes on the fence. Oh, it's then's the time a feller is a feelin' at his best, with the risin' sun to greet him from a night of gracious rest as he leaves the house bareheaded and goes out to feed the stock, when the frost is on the pumpkin and the fodder's in the shock. There's something kind of hearty-like about the atmosphere when the heat of summer's over and the coolin' fall is here. Of course we miss the flowers and the blossoms on the trees, and the mumble of the hummin' birds and the buzzin' of the bees, but the air's so appetizin', and the landscape through the haze of a crisp and sunny morning of the early autumn days is a picture that no painter has the color in to mock, when the frost is on the pumpkin and the fodder's in the shock. The husky, rusty rustle of the tassels of the corn, and the raspin of the tangled leaves as golden as the morn, the stubble in the furries, kind of lonesome-like, but still a preachin' sermons to us of the barns they growed to fill. The straw stack in the meadow, and the reaper in the shed, the hosses in their stalls below, the clover overhead, Oh, it sets my heart a clickin' like the tickin' of a clock, when the frost is on the pumpkin and the fodder's in the shock. End of When the Frost is on the Pumpkin. Section 33 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Laughing by Josh Billings Anatomically considered, laughing is the sensation of feeling good all over and showing it principally in one spot. Morally considered, it is the next best thing to the Ten Commandments. Theoretically considered, it can out-argue all the logic in existence. Pyrotechnically considered, it is the fireworks of the soul. But I don't intend this essay for laughing in the lump, but for laughing on the half shell. Laughing is just as natural to come to the surface as a rat is to come out of his hole when he wants to. You can't keep it back by swallowing any more than you can the hiccups. If a man can't laugh, there is some mistake made in putting him together. And if he won't laugh, he wants as much keeping away from as a bear trap when it is socked. I have seen people who laughed altogether too much for their own good or for anybody else's. They laughed like a barrel of new cider with the tap pulled out, a perfect stream. This is a great waste of natural juice. I have seen other people who didn't laugh enough to give themselves vent. They was like a barrel of new cider, too, that was bunged up tight, apt to start a hoop and leak all away on the sly. There ain't neither of these two ways right, and they never ought to be patented. Genuine laughing is the vent of the soul, the nostrils of the heart, and is just as necessary for health and happiness as spring water is for a trout. There is one kind of a laugh that I always did recommend. It looks out of the eye first with a merry twinkle. Then it creeps down on its hands and knees and plays around the mouth like a pretty moth around the blaze of a candle. Then it steals over into the dimples of the cheeks and rides around into those little whirlpools for a while. Then it lights up the whole face like the mellow bloom on a damask rose. Then it swims off on the air with a peal as clear and as happy as a dinner bell. Then it goes back again on golden tiptoes like an angel out for an airing. And lays down on its little bed of violets in the heart where it come from. There is another laugh that nobody can withstand. It is just as honest and noisy as a district school let out to play. It shakes a man up from his toes to his temples. It doubles and twists him like a whiskey fit. It lifts him off from his cheer like feathers and lets him back again like melted lead. It goes all through him like a pickpocket, and finally leaves him as weak and as crazy as though he had been soaking all day in a rushing bath and forgot to be took out. This kind of a laugh belongs to jolly good fellows who are as healthy as Quakers and who are as easy to please as a gal who is going to be married tomorrow. In conclusion, 
I say, laugh every good chance you can get. But don't laugh unless you feel like it, for there ain't nothing in this world more hearty than a good, honest laugh, nor nothing more hollow than a heartless one. When you do laugh, open your mouth wide enough for the noise to get out without squealing. Throw your head back as though you was going to be shaved. Hold on to your false hair with both hands, and then laugh till your soul gets thoroughly rested. But I shall tell you more about these things at some future time. End of Laughing by Josh Billings Read by Bill Mosley Frelsberg, Texas, USA Section 34 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Reese. Grizzly Grew by Iron Quill. O oh, thoughts of the past and present, O oh, whither and whence and where, demanded my soul as I scaled the height of the pine clad peak in the somber night, in the terebinthine air. While pondering on the frailty of happiness, hope, and mirth, the ascending sun, with derisive scoff, hurled its golden lances and smote me off from the bulge of the restless earth. Through the yellowish dawn of velvet, where stars were so thickly strewn, that quietly chuckled as I passed through, I fell in the gardens of grizzly grew on the mad, mysterious moon. I fell on the turquoise ether, low down in the wondrous west, and thence to the moon in whose yielding blue were hidden the gardens of grizzly grew in the monarchy of unrest. And there were the fairy gardens, where beautiful cherubs grew in daintiest way and on separate stalks in the listed rows by the jasper walks, near the palace of Grizzly Grew. While strolling around the garden, I noticed the rows were full of every conceivable size and type, some that were buds, and some nearly ripe, and some that were ready to pull. In gauzy and white corolla was one who had eyes of blue, a little excuse of a baby nose, little pink ears, and ten little toes, and a mouth that kept saying, Agu. Agooing as I came near her, she raised up her arms in glee, her little fat arms, and she seemed to say, I'm ready to go with you right away. Don't hunt any more. Take me. I picked her off quick and kissed her, and hugging her to my breast, I heard a loud yelling that pierced me through. Twas his terrible eminence, grisly grew, of the monarchy of unrest. He had on a blood-red turban, a picturesque lot of clothes, with big mustaches both fierce and black, and a ghastly saber to cut and hack, and shoes that turned up at the toes. Out of the gate of the garden the cherub and I took flight, and closely behind us the saber flew, and back of the saber came Grizzly Grew, and he chased us all day till night. I ran down the lunar crescent, and out on the silver horn, I kissed the baby and held her tight, and jumped down into the starry night, and I lit on the earth at morn. He fitfully threw his saber, it missed, and went round the sun. He followed no further, he was not rash, but the baby held on to my coarse mustache, and seemed to enjoy the fun. In saving that blue-eyed baby from the gardens of Grizzly Grew, I suffered a terrible shock and fright but the doctor believes it will be all right, and he thinks he can pull me through. End of Grizzly Grew Recording by Matthew Rees, Davenport, Iowa Section 35 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marty Chris. John Henry in a Streetcar by Hugh McHugh. Throw me in the cellar and batten down the hatches. I'm a wreck in the key of G flat. I sidestepped in among a bunch of language heavers yesterday, and ever since I've been sitting on the ragged edge with my feet hanging over. I was on my way down to Wall Street to help J. Pierpont Morgan buy a couple of railroads, and all the world seemed as blithe and gay as a love clinch from Laura Jean Libby's latest. When I climbed into the cable car, I felt like a man who had mailed money to himself the night before. I was aces. And then somebody blew out my gas. At the next corner, two society flashlights flopped in and sat next to me. They had a lot of words they wanted to use, and they started in. The car stopped, and two more of the 400's leading ladies jumped the hurdles and came down the aisle. They sat on the other side of me. In a minute, they began to bite the dictionary. Their efforts aroused the energies of three women who sat opposite of me, and they proceeded to beat the English language black and blue. In a minute, the air was so full of talk that the grip germs had to pull out on the platform and chew the conductor. The next one to me on my left started in. Oh, yes, we discharged our cook day before yesterday, but there's another coming this evening, and so... Her friend broke away and was up and back to the center with this. I was coming down Broadway this morning, and I saw Julia Marlowe's leading man. I'm sure it was him, because I saw the show once in Chicago, and he had the loveliest eyes I ever looked at. I knew that this was my cue to walk out, kick the motor man in the knuckles, upset the car, and send in a fire call. But I passed it up. I just sat there and bit my nails like the heavy villain in one of course Peyton's ten twin third dramas. That loveliest eyes speech had me groggy. Whenever I hear a woman turn on that loveliest eyes gag about an actor, I always feel that a swift slap from a wet dish rag would look well on her back hair. Then the bunch across the aisle got the flag. "'Well, you know,' says the broad lady, who paid for one seat and was compelled by nature to use three, "'you know there's only five in our family, and so I just take five slices of stale bread and have a bowl of water in which I've dropped a pinch of salt. Then I take a piece of butter about the size of a walnut and thoroughly grease the bottom of a frying pan. Then beat five eggs to a froth and... I'm hoping the conductor will come in and give us all a tip to take the timber because the cops are going to pinch the room, but there's nothing doing. One of the dames on my right finds her voice and passes it around. Oh, I think it's a perfect fright. I always did detest electric blue anyway. It is so uh, unbecoming. And then... I've just decided that this lady ought to make up as a Swede servant girl and play the part when her friend hooks in. Oh, yes, I think it will look perfectly sweet. It is a fullard with one of those new heliotrope tints made with a crepe de chien cabisset, with a second vest peeping out on either side of the front over an embroidered satin vest and cut in scallops on the edge, finished with a full rouge of white chiffon, and the sleeves are just too tight for any use, and the skirt is too long for any good, and I declare the lining is too sweet, and I just hate to wear it out on the street and get it soiled, and I was going to have it made with a tunic, and Mrs. Wigwag, that's my brother-in-law's first cousin, she had hers made to wear with grimps, and they're so economical, and... Think of a guy having to ride four miles and get his forehead fanned all the while with talk about follard and crepe de chem and guimps. Wouldn't it lead you to a padded cell? Say, I was down and out. No kidding. I wanted to get up and fight the door tender, but I couldn't. One of the conversationalists was sitting on my overcoat. I felt that if I got up and called my coat back to Papa, she might lose the thread of her story, and the jar would be something frightful. So I sat still and saved her life. The one on my right side must have been the lady president of the Hammer Club. She was talking about some other girl, and she didn't do a thing to the absent one. She said she was svelte. 
I suppose that's Dago for a shine. That's the way with some women. They can't come right out and call another woman a polish. They have to beat around the bush and chase their friends through the swamps by throwing things like svelte at them. <laughs> Tosh. I try to duck the foreign tattle on my right, and by doing so, I'm next to this one on my left. Oh, yes, I think politics is just too lovely. I don't know whether I'd rather be a Democrat or a Republican, but I think... Oh, just look at the hat that woman has on. Isn't that a fright? Wonder if she's trimmed it herself. Of course she did. You can tell by... I'm gasping for breath when the broad lady across the aisle gets the floor. No, indeed. I didn't have Eliza vaccinated. Why, she's too small yet. And don't you know my sister's husband's brother's child was vaccinated? And she is younger than our Eliza. But I don't just care. I don't want... Then the sweet girlish thing on my left gave me the corkscrew jab. It was the finish. Isn't that lovely? Well, as I was telling you, Charlie came last night and brought Mr. Storeclothes with him. Mr. Storeclothes is awfully nice. He plays the mandolin just too sweet for anything and... Me! To the oyster beds! No male impersonators garroting a mandolin. Not any in mine. When I want to take a course in music, I'll climb into a public library and read how Baldy Sloan wrote the Tiger Lily with one hand tied behind him and his feet on the piano. So I fell off the car and crawled home to mother. End of John Henry in a Streetcar Recording by Marty Chris. Section 36 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Neil Donnelly. The Mosquito by Josh Billings. Mosquitoes are a game bug, but they won't bite at a hook. There's millions of them caught every year, but not with a hook. This makes the market for them unsteady, the supply always exceeding the demand. The mosquito was born on the sly and comes to maturity quicker than any other of the domestic animals. A mosquito at three hours old is just as ready and anxious to go into business for himself as ever he is and bites the first time as sharp and natural as red pepper does. The mosquito has a good ear for music, and sings without notes. The song of the mosquito is monotonous to some folks, but in me it stirs up memories of other days. I have laid awake all night long many a time and listened to the sweet anthems of the mosquito. I am satisfied that there weren't nothing made in vain, but I can't help thinking how mighty close the mosquitoes come to it. The mosquito has inhabited this world since its creation and will probably hang around here until business closes. Where the mosquito goes to in the winter is a standing conundrum, which all the naturalists have give up. But we know we don't go far for he is on hand early each year with his probe fresh ground and polished. Mosquitoes must be one of the luxuries of life. They certainly ain't one of the necessaries, not if we know ourselves. End of the Mosquito by Josh Billings Section 37 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Turnings of a Bookworm by Carolyn Wells Love Levels All Plots Dead Men Sell No Tales A New Boom Sweeps Clean Circumstances Alter Bookcases The More Haste, The Less Read too many books spoil the trade. Many hands make light literature. Epigrams cover a multitude of sins. 
ye cannot serve art and mammon. A little sequel is a dangerous thing. It's a long page that has no turning. Don't look a gift book in the binding. A gilt-edged volume needs no accuser. In a multitude of characters there is safety. Incidents will happen even in the most regulated novels. One touch of nature makes the whole book sell. Where there's a will, there's a detective story. A book in the hand is worth two in the library. An ounce of invention is worth a pound of style. A good name is rather to be chosen than great characters. Where there's so much puff, there must be some buyer. End of The Turnings of a Bookworm Section 38 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Feast of the Monkeys by John Philip Sousa In days of old, so I've been told, the monkeys gave a feast. They sent out cards with kind regards to every bird and beast. The guests came dressed in fashion's best, unmindful of expense, except the whale, whose swallowtail was soaked for fifty cents. The guests checked wraps, canes, hats, and caps, and when that task was done, the footman, he, with dignity, announced them one by one. In Monkey Hall the host met all, and hoped they'd feel at ease. "'I scarcely can,' said the black and tan. "'I'm busy hunting fleas.' While waiting for a score or more of guests, the hostess said, "'We'll have the poodle sing Yankee Doodle a-standing on his head. "'And when this through, good parrot, you please show them how you swear.' "'Oh, dear, don't cuss,' cried the octopus, and he walked off on his ear. The orangutan a sea-song sang about a chimpanzee who went abroad in a drinking-gourd to the coast of Barbary.' where he heard one night when the moon shone bright a school of mermaids pick chromatic scales from off their tails, and did it mighty slick. "'All guests are here to eat the cheer, and dinner's served, my lord,' the butler bowed, and then the crowd rushed in with one accord. The fiddler crab came in a cab, and played a piece in sea, while on his horn the unicorn blew, "'You'll remember me.' To give a touch of early Dutch to this great feast of feasts, I'll drink ten drops of Holland's schnapps, spoke out the king of beasts. That must taste fine, said the porcupine. Did you see him smack his lip? I'd smack mine too, cried the kangaroo, if I didn't have the pip. The lion stood and said, Be good enough to look this way. Court etiquette do not forget, and mark well what I say. My royal wish is every dish be tasted first by me. Here's where I smile, said the crocodile, and he climbed an axle tree. The soup was brought, and quick as thought the lion ate it all. You can't beat that, exclaimed the cat, for monumental gall. The soup, all cried. Gone, Leo replied, t'was just a bit too thick. When we get through, remarked the new, I'll hit him with a brick. The tiger stepped, or rather crept, up where the lion sat. Oh, mighty boss, I'm at a loss to know where I am at. I came to-night with appetite to drink and also eat. As tiger grand, I now demand I get there with both feet. The lion got all fired hot, and in a passion flew. Get out, he cried, and save your hide, you most offensive you. "'I'm not afraid,' the tiger said. "'I know what I'm about.' But the lion's paw reached the tiger's jaw, and he was good and out. The salt sea smell of mackerel upon the air arose. Each hungry guest great joy expressed, and sniff went every nose. With glutton look the lion took the spiced and savoury dish. Without a pause he worked his jaws and gobbled all the fish.' Then ate the roast, the quail on toast, the pork both fat and lean, the jam and lamb, the potted ham, and drank the kerosene. He raised his voice, 
come, all rejoice, you've seen your monarch dine. Never again, clucked the hen, and all sang, Old Lang Syne. End of The Feast of the Monkeys Read by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org, in San Diego, California, in December 2010. Section 39 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenevere. The Billville Spirit Meeting by Frank L. Stanton. We had our spirit meeting. We'll never have no more. To call up all the spirits of them that's gone before. A fella called a medium, he was a medium size, took the contract for the fetching o' them spirits from the skies. The mayor, the town council, the parson and his wife, come to shake hands with them spirits what had left the other life. The colonel and the major, the coroner and all, was waiting and debating in the darkness of the hall. The medium roared, Silence! Amanda Jones appears. Is her husband present? No, sir, he's been resting twenty years. Here's the ghost of Sally Spilkins from the land where glories glow. Would her husband like to see her? And a feeble voice said, No. Here's the wife of Colonel Buster. She wears a heavenly smile. She wants to see the colonel, and she's coming down the aisle. Then all was wild confusion, it warn't a bit of fun. With Lord have mercy on me, the colonel broke and run. Then the coroner got skeery and scampered for his life. Stop, stop him, called the medium, here comes his second wife. But thar warn't a man could stop him in that whole blame settlement. He turned a double somersault and out the widder went. Then the whole town council followed and hollered all the way. The parson said uh, he had a call about ten miles off to pray. He didn't preach next Sunday, and they tell it round a bit. According to the best reports, the parson's running yet. End of the Billville Spirit Meeting Section 40 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Cry from the Consumer by Wilbur D. Nesbitt Grasshoppers roam the Kansas fields and eat the tender grass. A trivial affair indeed, but what then comes to pass? You go to buy a Panama or any other hat, you learn the price has been advanced a lot because of that. A glacier up in Canada has slipped a mile or two. A little thing like this can boost the selling price of glue. Occurrences so tragic always thrill me to the core. I hope and pray that nothing ever happens any more. Last week the peaceful Indians went a-searching after scalps, and then there was an avalanche way over in the Alps. These diametric happenings seem nothing much but look, we had to add a dollar to the wages of the cook. The bean crop down in Boston has grown measurably less, and so the dealer charges more for goods to make a dress. Each day there is some incident to make a man feel sore, I'm on my knees to ask that nothing happens any more. It didn't rain in Utah, and it did in old Vermont. Result, it costs you fifty more to take a summer's jaunt. Upon the plains of Tibet some tornadoes took a roll, therefore the barons have to charge a higher price for coal. A streetcar strike in Omaha has cumulative shocks, it boosted huckleberries up to twenty cents a box. No matter what is happening, it always finds your door. Give us a rest, let nothing ever happen any more. Mosquitoes in New Jersey bite a magnate on the wing, Result, the poor consumer feels that fierce mosquitoes sting. The skeeter's song is silenced, but in something like an hour, the grocers understand that it requires a raisin flour. 
a house burns down in texas and a stove blows up in maine ten minutes later breakfast foods in prices show a gain effects must follow causes which is what i most deplore i hope and pray that nothing ever happens any more end of a cry from the consumer recording by trisha g Section 41 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Disappointment by John Boyle O'Reilly. Her hair was a waving bronze, and her eyes deep wells that might cover a brooding soul and who till he weighed it could ever surmise that her heart was a cinder instead of a coal end of a disappointment recording by trisha g section forty two of the wit and humor of america volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by HearHis.com. The British Matron by Nathaniel Hawthorne. I have heard a good deal of the tenacity with which English ladies retain their personal beauty to a late period of life, but not to suggest that an American eye needs use and cultivation before it can quite appreciate the charm of English beauty at any age, it strikes me that an English lady of fifty is apt to become a creature less refined and delicate, so far as her physique goes, than anything that we Western people class under the name of woman. She has an awful ponderosity of frame, not pulpy, like the looser development of our few fat women, but massive, with solid beef and streaky tallow, so that, though struggling manfully against the idea, you inevitably think of her as made up of steaks and sirloins. When she walks, her advance is elephantine. When she sits down, it is on a great round space of her maker's footstool, where she looks as if nothing could ever move her. She imposes awe and respect by the muchness of her personality, to such a degree that you would probably credit her with far greater moral and intellectual force than she can fairly claim. Her visage is unusually grim and stern, seldom positively forbidding, yet calmly terrible not merely by its breadth and weight of feature, but because it seems to express so much well-defined self-reliance, such acquaintance with the world, its toils, troubles, and dangers, and such sturdy capacity for trampling down a foe. Without anything positively salient, or actively offensive, or indeed unjustly formidable to her neighbors, she has the effect of a seventy-four-gun ship in time of peace. For while you assure yourself that there is no real danger, you cannot help thinking how tremendous would be her onset, if pugnaciously inclined, and how futile the effort to inflict any counter-injury." She certainly looks tenfold, nay, a hundredfold better able to take care of herself than our slender-framed and haggard womankind. But I have not found reason to suppose that the English dowager of fifty has actually greater courage, fortitude, and strength of character than our women of similar age, or even a tougher physical endurance than they. Morally, she is strong, I suspect, only in society, and in the common routine of social affairs, and would be found powerless and timid in any exceptionally straight that 
might call for energy outside of the conventionalities amid which she has grown up. You can meet this figure in the street, and live, and even smile at the recollection, but conceive of her in a ballroom with the bare, brawny arms that she invariably displays there, and all the other corresponding development, such as is beautiful in the maiden blossom, but a spectacle to howl at in such an overblown cabbage rose as this. Yet somewhere in this enormous bulk there must be hidden the modest, slender, violet nature of a girl whom an alien mass of earthliness has unkindly overgrown. For an English maiden in her teens, though very seldom so pretty as our own damsels, possesses, to say the truth, a certain charm of half-blossom, and delicately folded leaves, and tender womanhood shielded by maidenly reserves, with which, somehow or the other, our American girls often fail to adorn themselves during an appreciable moment. It is a pity that the English violets should grow into such an outrageously developed peony as I have attempted to describe. I wonder whether a middle-aged husband ought to be considered as legally married to all the accretions that have overgrown the slenderness of his bride since he led her to the altar and which make her so much more than he ever bargained for. It is not a sounder view of the case that the matrimonial bond cannot be held to include the three-fourths of the wife that had no existence when the ceremony was performed, and, as a matter of conscience and good morals, ought not an English married pair to insist upon the celebration of a silver wedding at the end of twenty-five years in order to legalize and mutually appropriate that corporeal growth of which both parties have individually come into possession since they were pronounced one flesh? End of section 42 Recorded by hearhis.com Section 43 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Tragedy of It By Alden Charles Noble Alas for him, alas for it, alas for you and I. When this I think, I raise my mitt to dry my weeping eye. End of section 43. Recording by James O'Connor. January 2011. Section 44 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stage Whispers by Carolyn Wells Deadheads tell no tales. Stars are stubborn things. All's not bold that titters. Contracts make cowards of us all. One good turn deserves an encore. A little actress is a dangerous thing. It's a long skirt that has no turning. Stars rush in where angels fear to tread. Managers never hear any good of themselves. A manager is known by the company he keeps. A plot is not without honor save in comic opera. Take care of the dance and the songs will take care of themselves. End of Stage Whispers Section 45 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Bill Mosley. The Pettibone Lineage by James T. Fields. My name is Essek Pettibone, and I wish to affirm in the outset that it is a good thing to be well born in thus connecting the mention of my name with a positive statement i am not aware that a catastrophe lies coiled up in the juxtaposition but i cannot help writing plainly that i am still in favor of a distinguished family tree esto perpetua to have had somebody for a great-grandfather that was somebody is exciting to be able to look back on long lines of ancestry that were rich but respectable seems decorous and all right the present earl of warwick i think must have an idea that strict justice has been done him in the way of being launched properly into the world i saw the duke of newcastle once and as the farmer in conway described mount washington i thought the duke felt a propensity to hunch up some somehow it is pleasant to look down on the crowd and have a conscious right to do so left an orphan at the tender age of four years having no brothers or sisters to prop me round with young affections and sympathies i fell into three pairs of hands excellent in their way but peculiar patience eunice and mary ann pettibone were my aunts on my father's side all my mother's relations kept shady when the lonely orphan looked about for protection but patience pettibone in her stately way said the boy belongs to a good family and he shall never want while his three aunts can support him so i went to live with my plain but benignant protectors in the state of new hampshire during my boyhood the best drilled lesson that fell to my keeping was this respect yourself we come of more than ordinary parentage superior blood was probably concerned in getting up the petty bones hold your head erect and some day you shall have proof of your high lineage i remember once on being told that i must not share my juvenile sports with the butcher's three little beings i begged to know why not aunt eunice looked at patience and mary ann knew what she meant my child slowly murmured the oldest sister our family no doubt came of a very old stock perhaps we belong to the nobility our ancestors it is thought came over laden with honors and no doubt were embarrassed with riches though the latter importation has dwindled in the lapse of years respect yourself and when you grow up you will not regret that your old and careful aunt did not wish you to play with the butcher's offspring i felt mortified that i ever had a desire to knuckle up with any but king's sons or sultan's little boys i longed to be among my equals in the urchin line and fly my kite with only high-born youngsters thus i lived in a constant scene of self-enchantment on the part of the sisters who assumed all the port and feeling that properly belong to ladies of quality patrimonial splendor to come danced before their dim eyes and handsome settlements gay equipages and a general grandeur of some sort loomed up in the future for the american branch of the house of pettibone 
it was a life of opulent self-delusion which my aunts were never tired of nursing and i was too young to doubt the reality of it all the members of our little household held up their heads as if each said in so many words there is no original sin in our composition whatever of that commodity there may be mixed up with the common clay of snowborough aunt patience was a star and dwelt apart aunt eunice looked at her through a determined pair of spectacles and worshipped while she gazed the youngest sister lived in a dreamy state of honors to come and had constant zoological visions of lions griffins and unicorns drawn and quartered in every possible style known to the herald's college the reverend hebrew bullet who used to drop in quite often and drink several compulsory glasses of homemade wine encouraged his three parishioners in their aristocratic notions and extolled them for what he called their stooping down to everyday life he differed with the ladies of our house only on one point he contended that the unicorn of the bible and the rhinoceros of to-day were one and the same animal my aunts held a different opinion in the sleeping room of my aunt patience reposed a trunk often during my childish years i longed to lift the lid and spy among its contents the treasures my young fancy conjured up as lying there in state i dared not ask to have the cover raised for my gratification as i had often been told i was too little to estimate aright what that armorial box contained when you grow up you shall see the inside of it aunt mary used to say to me and so i wondered and wished but all in vain I must have the virtue of years before I could view the treasures of past magnificence so long entombed in that wooden sarcophagus. Once I saw the faded sisters bending over the trunk together, and, as I thought, embalming something in camphor. Curiosity impelled me to linger, but under some pretext i was nodded out of the room although my kinswomen's means were far from ample they determined that swiftmouth college should have the distinction of calling me one of her sons and accordingly i was in due time sent for preparation to a neighboring academy years of study and hard fare in country boarding-houses told upon my self-importance as the descendants of a great Englishman. Notwithstanding all my letters from the honored three came with counsel to respect myself and keep up the dignity of the family. Growing up man forgets good counsel. The Arcadia of respectability is apt to give place to the levity of football and other low-toned accomplishments the book of life at that period opens readily at fun and frolic and the insignia of greatness give the schoolboy no envious pangs i was nineteen when i entered the hoary halls of swiftmouth i call them hoary because they had been built more than fifty years to me they seemed uncommonly hoary and i snuffed antiquity in the dusty purlieus i now began to study in good earnest the wisdom of the past 
I saw clearly the value of dead men and moldy precepts, especially if the former had been entombed a thousand years, and if the latter were well done in sounding Greek and Latin. I began to reverence royal lines of deceased monarchs, long to connect my own name, now growing into college popularity, with some far-off mighty one, who had ruled in pomp and luxury his obsequious people. The trunk in Snowborough troubled my dreams. In that receptacle still slept the proof of our family distinction. I will go, quoth I, to the home of my aunt's next vacation, and there learn how we became mighty, and discover precisely why we don't practice today our inherited claims to glory. I went to Snowborough, and Patience was now anxious to lay before her impatient nephew the proof he burned to behold. But first she must explain. All the old family documents and letters were, no doubt, destroyed in the great fire of ninety-eight as nothing in the shape of parchment or paper implying nobility had ever been discovered in Snowborough or elsewhere. But there had been preserved for many years a suit of imperial clothes that had been worn by their great-grandfather in England, and no doubt in the New World also. These garments had been carefully watched and guarded, for were they not the proof that their owner belonged to a station in life second, if second at all, to the royal court of King George itself? Precious casket, into which I was soon to have the privilege of gazing. Through how many long years these fond, foolish virgins had lighted their unflickering lamps of expectation and hope at this cherished old shrine. I was now on my way to the family repository of all our greatness. I went upstairs on the jump. We all knelt down before the well-preserved box, and my proud Aunt Patience, in a somewhat reverent manner, turned the key. My heart, I am not ashamed to confess it now, although it is forty years since the quartet, in search of family honors, were on their knees that summer afternoon in Snowborough. My heart beat high. I was about to look on that which might be a duke's or an earl's regalia, and I was descended from the owner in a direct line. I had lately been reading Shakespeare's Titus Andronicus, and I remembered there before the trunk the lines, O sacred receptacle of my joys, sweet cell of virtue and nobility. The lid went up, and the sisters began to unroll the precious garments, which seemed all enshrined in aromatic gums and spices. The odor of that interior lives with me to this day and I grow faint with the memory of that hour. With pious precision, the clothes were uncovered, and at last the whole suit was laid before my expectant eyes. Reader, I am an old man now, and have not long to walk this planet. But whatever dreadful shock may be in reserve for my declining years, 
I am certain I can bear it, for I went through that scene at Snowborough and still live. When the garments were fully displayed, all the ants looked at me. I had been to college. I had studied Burke's peerage. I had been once to New York. Perhaps I could immediately name the exact station in noble British life to which that suit of clothes belonged. I could. I saw it all at a glance. I grew flustered and pale. I dared not look my poor deluded female relatives in the face. What rank in the peerage do these gold lace garments and big buttons betoken? cried all three. It is a suit of servant's livery, gasped I, and fell back with a shudder. That evening, after the sun had gone down, we buried those hateful garments in a ditch at the bottom of the garden. Rest there, perturbed body coat, yellow trousers, brown gaiters and all. Vain pomp and glory of this world, I hate ye. End of the Pettibone Lineage Recording by Bill Mosley, Frelsberg, Texas, USA Section 46 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenevere. Why Moles Have Hands by Anne Virginia Culbertson. One day the children came running to Aunt Nancy with a mole which one of the dogs had just killed. They had never seen one before, and were very curious as to what it might be. <laughs> well, before the king, said Nancy, where y'all been living that you never seen a mole before? Where you come from must be a mighty curious spot if it ain't had no Moses there. Must be something wrong with that place. I been most all over this here Sussex country and during my time, and I ain't never come across no place where they ain't have Moses. Moses is certainly curious little creatures, she continued. I've been taking tickle and notice him this long time, and they knows more'n you think for just to look at em. Though they lives down underneath the ground, with they is first class swimmers. I done seed one of em with my own eyes crossing the branch, and they can root long underneath the earth most as fast as a hoss can trot on top of it. Y'all needn't to look that away, cause it's the truth. Days just built for get long fast on the ground. Their hands is both pickaxes and shovels for em. They digs and scoops with the front ones and kicks the dirt out the way with the behind em ones. The strong snouts helps em too to push the way through the dirt. Their fur is just as soft and shiny as silk, said Janey. Yes, said Aunt Nancy. It's that soft and shiny that, though they live all time in the dirt, not a speck of dirt sticks to em. You says soft and shiny is silk, but I tell you it is silk, silk clothes, that's exactly what tis. Ned laughed. Who ever heard of an animal dressed in silk clothes, he said. Never mind, she answered. You talks mighty pert, but I knows what I knows. And this year I been telling you is the show enough truth. Just to see its paws, Janey went on. Why, they look exactly like hands. Look like hands. Look like hands. Huh. They is hands. All thumbered and fingered just like yo'n. And what's more, they once was human beings. Humans, they was so. How could they ever have been human hands and then put on a mole's body? Asked Ned. I believe most things you say, Aunt Nancy, but I can't swallow that. Dar's a little boy around these diggins where are talkin mighty sassy and rambunctious seems to me. I'm ax you to swallow nothin tall, but pears to me y'all been swallowin dem ere old tails right and left, 
faster than I can call him to mind, and I'm see none of you choke on him yet nor cry enough said. I's tickler sorry about this, cause I done had it in mind to tell you a tale about how come Moses have handses where I learned from an old man that come from Fauquier country. But now that Mars Ned pears to be so dubious about it, I ain't going to waste my time on folks where ain't one believe me no hows. Never mind. The children over on the Thompson place gwine beg me for that tale when I goes there again, and what's more, they gwine get it, for they believes every word that drops from my mouth, like was the law and the gospel. Of course the children protested that they were as ready to hang upon her words as the Thompson children could possibly be, and presented their prior claim to the tale in such a moving fashion that Aunt Nancy was finally prevailed upon to come down from her high horse and tell the story. I done told you, she said, that them our hands is human, and I means just what I says, cause the Moses used to be folks, show sure enough folks though they is all shrunk up to this size, and the hands is all that's left to tell the tale. Yah, sir, in the old days, so far back that you can't count it, the Moses was folks, and mighty proud and biggity folks at that. They wasn't gwine be catched wearing any old dish or caliker, uh, linsey woolsey or homespun or such as dat, nor even broadcloth nor bombazine, nah, sir. They just tricked themselves out in the finest and shiniest of silk, nothing more or less, and then they went a traipsin' up and down and hither and yon, for to other folks to look at em and make meration over em. More than that, they is so fine and fiddlin', they oon set foot on the ground lessen there was a carpet spread down for em to walk on. They tells me. It certainly was a sight in the world to see them folks walking up and down on the carpets, trailing and wrestling the silk clothes, and shirshying and bobbing to one another when they meet up, but never speaking to the common folk, where walking on the ground, they ain't so much as looking at em. What's mo, they was so uppish, they thought the earth was too low down for em even to run their eyes over, so they went long with the haids red and their eyes all time looking up stead of down. You can be sure them quines on ain't make em populous with the other folks, cause people just naturally can't stand it to have you throwin' up to them that you is better and what they is, when all the time they knows you're nothing but folks same as them. They keep gwine on so fashion and get more and more pompered and uppish, till at last they tracted the attention of the Lord. And he says to himself, he do, Who is these folks anyhow? We're getting so airish, walking up and down and back and forth on my earth, and spurning hit so's they spread carpets twixt hit and their footses, treating my earth what I done make, like twas the dirt underneath their footses, and spising the fellow creatures and excusing them as being common, and keeping their eyes turned up all the time. Is if they was too good to look at the things I done make and put on my earth. I must see about this. I must punish these sumptuous people and show em that one of my creatures is just as low down as tuttering in my sight. So the Lord, he passed judgment on the Moses. Fuss he took and made em lose their human shape, and then he swunk em up until they is no bigger than they is now. That is to show em how no count they was in his sight. Then, because they thought themselves too good to walk upon the bare ground, he sought em to live underneath it, where they had to dig and scratch their way long. Last of all, he took and took away their eyes and made em blind. That's cause they done spies to look at the feller creeters. But he feel kind of sorry for em when he get that fur, and he ain't want to punish em too heavy, so. He left them these silk clothes where I done told you about, and these handses where you can see for yourself is human. And I reckon both them things put em in mind of what they used to be, and rack em umble. Ever since then, the Moses been gwine long underneath the ground, according to the judgment of the Lord, and digging and scratching their way through the world in trial and tribulation, with them poor little human handses, 
and dat ought to learn you what comes er folks spies in de feller creatures and i want y'all to remember dat next time i year you call dem thompson chillin trash i'd like to know what you moles are said ned who was of rather an investigating turn of mind they just go round rooting through the ground spoiling people's gardens and i don't see what they're good for you can't eat them or use them anyway sho child said aunt nancy you dunno what you talkin bout the lord have some use for every creature he done mek dey tells me dat de moses eats up lots of de bugs and worms and such dat dey mought hurt de crops if dey was let to live sizin dat just give me one of de claws of dat mole and let me hang it round de neck of a baby while cuttin his toofs and i bound you every tooth in his jaw gwine come bustin true his gums without nary a ache or a pain to let him know days dire don't tell me about de moses bein worthless i done walk the flow too much with cryin babies not to know de use of moseses you don't really believe that do you asked ned believe it she answered indignantly i don't believe it i knows it i done told you all these things a hire's foot can do what's de reason a mole's foot ain't good for something too if folks only knowed mo about such cures as dat dar needn't be so much sickness and misery in de world i done cured myself of de rheumatism in my right arm just by tying a eel skin round it and everybody on dis plantation knows that if you wrap a child's hair with eel skin strings hit's bound to make it grow if you want the child hisself to grow and to walk soon you must brush his feet with the broom i won't tell you dis if i hadn't tried em myself you mustn't talk so biggity about what you don't know nothin tall about you come from up north yonder and maybe these things don't work the same dar as what they does down here where we been pendin on em so long End of why moles have hands Section 47 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sherlock 85. A Psalm of Life by Phoebe Carey. Tell me not an idle jingle, marriage is an empty dream. For the girl is dead that's single, and things are not what they seem married life is real earnest single blessedness a fib taken from man to man returnest has been spoken of the rib not enjoyment and not sorrow is our destined end or way but to act that each to-morrow nearer brings the wedding day life is long and youth is fleeting and our hearts if there we search still like steady drums are beating anxious marches to the church in the world's broad field of battle, in the bivouac of life, be not like dumb, driven cattle, be a woman, be a wife. Trust no future, however pleasant, let the dead past bury its dead. Act, act in the living present, heart within and man ahead. Lives of married folks remind us we can live our lives as well, and, departing, leave behind us such examples as will tell such examples that another sailing far from hymen's port forlorn unmarried brother seeing shall take heart and court let us then be up and doing with the heart and head begin still achieving still pursuing learn to labor and to win end of a psalm of life Section 48 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marty Chris. An Odyssey of K's by Wilbur D. Nesbitt. I've traveled up and down this land and crossed it in a hundred ways, but somehow cannot understand these towns with names chock full of K's. For instance, once it fell to me to pack my grip and quickly go, I thought at first to Kankakee, but then remembered Kokomo. Oh, Kankakee or Kokomo, I sighed, just which I do not know. Then to the ticket man I went. 
He was a snappy man and bald, behind an iron railing pent, and I confessed that I was stalled. A much caged town is booked for me, I said. I'm due tomorrow, so I wonder if it's Kankakee or if it can be Kokomo. There's quite a difference, growled he, twixt Kokomo and Kankakee. He spun a yard of tickets out the folded kind that makes a strip and leaves the passengers in doubt when the conductor takes a clip. He flipped the tickets out, I say, and asked, Now which one will it be? I'll sell you tickets either way to Kokomo or Kankakee. And still, I really do not know. I thought it might be Kokomo. At any rate, I took a chance. He struck his stamp machine a blow, and I, a toy of circumstance, was ticketed for Kokomo. Upon the train I wondered still if all was right as it should be. Some mystic warning seemed to fill my mind with thoughts of Kankakee. The car wheels clicked it out. Now he had better be for Kankakee. Until at last it grew so loud that at some big town I clambered out and elbowed madly through the crowd determined on the other route. The ticket agent saw my haste. Where do you wish to go? cried he. I yelled, I have no time to waste. Please fix me up for Kankakee. Again, the wheels, now fast, now slow, clicked. Ah, oh, to go, to go, come on. Well, anyhow, I did not heed the message that they sent to me. I went and landed wrong indeed, went all the way to Kankakee. Then in a rush, I doubled back, went wrong again. I'd have you know, there was no call for me, alack, within the town of Kokomo. And then I learned, confound the luck, I should have gone to Keokuk. End of An Odyssey of K's Recording by Marty Chris. Section 49 of The Wit and Humor of America Volume 1 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Mosley. The Deacon's Trout by Henry Ward Beecher. He was a curious trout. I believe he knew Sunday just as well as Deacon Marble did. At any rate, the deacon thought the trout meant to aggravate him. The deacon, you know, is a little waggish. He often tells about that trout. Says he, One Sunday morning, just as I got along by the willows, I heard an awful splash, and not ten feet from shore, I saw the trout, as long as my arm just curvin over like a bow and goin down with something for breakfast gracious says i and i almost jumped out of the wagon but my wife polly says she what on earth are you thinking of dinkin it's sabbath day and you're going to meetin it's a pretty business for a deacon that sort of cooled me off but i do say that for about a minute i wished i wasn't a deacon but twould not made any difference for i came down next day to mill on purpose and i came down once or twice more and nothing was to be seen though i tried him with the most tempting thing well, next Sunday, I came along again, and to save my life, I couldn't keep off worldly and wandering thoughts. I tried to be saying my catechism, but I couldn't keep my eyes off the pond as we came up to the willows. I'd got along in the catechism as smooth as the road to the fourth commandment, and was saying it out loud for Polly and just as i was saying what is required in the fourth commandment i heard a splash and there was the trout and afore i could think i said gracious polly i must have that trout 
she almost riz right up. I knew you want saying your catechism, Hardy. Is this the way you answer the question about keeping the Lord's day? I'm ashamed, Deacon Marvel, says she. You'd better change your road and go to meeting on the road over the hill. If I was a deacon, I wouldn't let a fish's tail whisk the whole catechism out of my head. And I had to go to meeting on the hill road all the rest of the summer. End of The Deacon's Trout by Henry Ward Beecher Recording by Bill Mosley, Frelsburg, Texas, USA Section 50 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marty Chris. Enough by Tom Masson I shot a rocket in the air. It fell to earth, I knew not where. Until next day, with rage profound, the man it fell on came around. In less time than it takes to tell, he showed me where the rocket fell. And now I do not greatly care to shoot more rockets in the air. End of Enough Recording by Marty Chris Section 51 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fighting Race by Joseph I. C. Clark. Read out the names, and Burke sat back, and Kelly drooped his head, while Shea, they call him Scholar Jack, went down the list of the dead. Officers, seamen, gunners, marines, the crews of the jig and yawl, the bearded man and the lad in his teens, carpenters, coal-passers, all. Then knocking the ashes from out his pipe, said Burke in an off-hand way, We're all in that dead man's list by cripe, Kelly and Burke and Shea. Well, here's to the main, and I'm sorry for Spain, said Kelly and Burke and Shea. Wherever there's Kelly's, there's trouble, said Burke. Wherever fighting's the game, or a spice of danger in grown man's work, said Kelly, you'll find my name. And do we fall short, said Burke, getting mad, when it's touch and go for life? Said Shea, it's thirty-odd years, be dad, since I charged to drum and fife. Up Mary's Heights and my old canteen stopped a rebel ball on its way. There were blossoms of blood on our sprigs of green, Kelly and Burke and Shea, and the dead didn't brag. Well, here's to the flag, said Kelly and Burke and Shea. I wish t'was in Ireland, for there's the place, said Burke, that we'd die by right, in the cradle of our soldier race, after one good stand-up fight. My grandfather fell on Vinegar Hill, and fighting was not his trade but his rusty pikes in the cabin still, with hessian blood on the blade. Ay, ay, said Kelly, the pikes were great when the word was clear the way. We were thick on the roll in ninety-eight, Kelly and Burke and Shea. Well, here's to the pike and the sword and the like, said Kelly and Burke and Shea. And Shea, the scholar, with rising joy, said, We were at Ramillies. We left our bones at Fontenoy, and up in the Pyrenees, before Dunkirk on Landon's plain, Cremona, Lille, and Ghent. We are all over Austria, France, and Spain, wherever they pitched a tent. We've died for England from Waterloo to Egypt and Dargay, and still there's enough for a corps or a crew, Kelly and Burke and Shea. Well, here is to good honest fighting blood, said Kelly and Burke and Shea. Oh, the fighting races don't die out, if they seldom die in bed, for love is first in their hearts, no doubt, said Burke. Then Kelly said, When Michael, the Irish archangel, stands, the angel with the sword, and the battle dead from a hundred lands are ranged in one big horde, 
our line that for Gabriel's trumpet waits will stretch tree deep that day, from Jehoshaphat to the Golden Gates, Kelly and Burke and Shea. Well, here's thank God for the race and the sod, said Kelly and Burke and Shea. End of The Fighting Race Section 52 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Rees. The Organ by Henry Ward Beecher. At one of his weeknight lectures, Beecher was speaking about the building and equipping of new churches. After a few satirical touches about church architects and their work, he went on to ridicule the usual style of pulpit, the sacred mahogany tub, plastered up against some pillar like a barn swallow's nest. Then he passed on to the erection of the organ, and to the opening recital. The organ long expected has arrived, been unpacked, set up, and gloried over. The great players of the region round about, or of distant celebrity, have had the grand organ exhibition and this magnificent instrument has been put through all its paces in a manner which has surprised every one, and, if it had had a conscious existence, must have surprised the organ itself most of all. It has piped, fluted, trumpeted, brayed, thundered. It has played so loud that everybody was deafened, and so soft that nobody could hear. The pedals played for thunder. The flutes languished and coquetted, and the swell died away in delicious suffocation like one singing a sweet song under the bedclothes. Now it leads down a stupendous waltz with full brass, sounding very much as if, in summer, a thunderstorm should play Come Haste to the Wedding, or Money Musk. Then come marches, gallops, and hornpipes. An organ playing hornpipes ought to have elephants as dancers. At length a fugue is rendered to show the whole scope and power of the instrument, the theme, like a cautious rat, peeps out to see if the coast is clear, and, after a few hesitations, comes forth and begins to frisk a little, and run up and down to see what it can find. It finds just what it did not want, a purring tenor, lying in ambush and waiting for a spring. And as the theme comes incautiously near, the savage cat of a tenor springs at it, misses its hold, and then takes after it with terrible earnestness but the tenor has miscalculated the agility of the theme. All that it could do, with the most desperate effort, was to keep the theme from running back into its hole again. And so they ran up and down, around and around, dodging, eluding, whipping in and out of every corner and nook, till the whole organ was aroused, and the bass began to take part. But unluckily slipped and rolled downstairs, and lay at the bottom raving and growling in the most awful manner, and nothing could appease it. Sometimes the theme was caught by one part, and dangled for a moment. Then, with a snatch, another part took it and ran off exultant, until, unawares, the same trick was played on it. And finally all the parts, being greatly exercised in mind, began to chase each other promiscuously in and out, up and down, now separating and now rushing in full tilt together, until everything in the organ loses patience and all the stops are drawn and, in spite of all that the brave organist could do, who bobbed up and down, feet, hands, head, and all, the tune broke up into a real row, and every part was clubbing every other one, until at length, patience being no longer a virtue, the organist, with two or three terrible crashes, put an end to the riot, and brought the great organ back to silence. End of the Organ Recording by Matthew Rees Section 53 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. My Grandmother's Turkey Tail Fan by Samuel Minturn Peck. It owned not the color that vanity dons or tender wits choose for display. Its beautiful tint was a delicate bronze a brown softly blended with gray. 
From her waist to her chin, spreading out without break, Twas built on a generous plan. The pride of the forest was slaughtered to make My grandmother's turkey-tail fan. For common occasions it never was meant, In a chest between two silken cloths, Twas kept safely hidden with careful intent In camphor to keep out the moths. Twas famed far and wide, through the whole countryside, from Beersheba e'en unto Dan, and often at meeting with envy twas eyed my grandmother's turkey tail fan. Camp meetings indeed were its chiefest delight, like a crook unto sheep gone astray, it beckoned backsliders to reseek the right, and exhorted the sinners to pray. It always beat time when the choir went wrong, its psalmody leading the van. Old Hundred, I know, was its favorite song, my grandmother's turkey-tail fan. A fig for the fans that are made nowadays, suited only to frivolous mirth. A different thing was the fan that I praise, yet it scorned not the good things of earth. At bees and at quiltings twas I to be seen, the best of the gossip began, when it at the doorway had entered serene, my grandmother's turkey-tail fan. Tradition relates of it wonderful tales, its handle of leather was buff. Though shorn of its glory, e'en now it exhales an odor of hymn-books and snuff. Its primeval grace, if you like, you can trace, t'was limbed for the future to scan, just under a smiling gold-spectacled face, my grandmother's turkey-tail fan. End of My Grandmother's Turkey-Tail Fan End of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 1, edited by Marshall Pickney Wilder.